America as great, as good as its promise. I'm excited to be here, and I want to thank the great Texas State Party Chair, the Ward Charles Hinojosa, and the Harris County Chair, Lane Lewis, for hosting us today. Wes Gill, Wes Lane, thank you so much, Texas Democrats, for hosting us here. I also want to recognize the DNC Southern Caucus, also Southern Caucus chairs, regional chairs, leaders, on behalf of Hilda Cobb Hunter, thank you all. Sophronia Thompson will be giving a report later today. As you may know, we are holding our four regional forums featuring our great candidates for national office. The first forum was held two weeks ago in the beautiful city of Phoenix, and we will be hosting two more Next weekend, we're going to Detroit Motown, get ready for the Democrats, and the following weekend, we will be in Baltimore. Then it all culminates at our full DNC meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, the week of February 23rd, when we elect our new party offices. We chose these cities for strategic reasons. They represent our commitment to expand in the map, to support our friends in the so-called red states, and to bring some energy some new vital energy into the Democratic Party. They also represent the fact that we are not taking anything for granted and that we will learn the lessons of the last election and we are going to begin to break new ground for 2017 and 2018. We know that we have a lot of work to do and today we're prepared to begin to pick up the pieces to rebuild our party here in my native South. So, remember, all of our forums are live streamed. Go to democrats.org slash live stream. We also ask that you use the hashtag DNC Future Forum to tweet about today's forum. So, let us start with the Pledge of Allegiance by Kate Ho. Kate was the youngest DNC member from Texas. She will lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance, followed uh, by the invocation by the Reverend Ernie Attorney. So Reverend Ernie Turney is the senior pastor of the Barron Memorial United Methodist Church here in Houston. Before joining Barron Memorial, Reverend Turney served as a member of the uh, congregations throughout Texas. And he also served on the board of the Texas Conference of Ordinary Ministry, the Group Health Benefits and Pension. So Kate and Reverend Turney will begin our program. Someone asked, are you going to pray over the autopsy? No, I did not bring my funeral book. I am a fifth generation Texas Democrat, and I am not Jesus. My faith, I believe in resurrections, restarts, and reconciliation. None of this is easy, and we cannot do it alone. Let us pray. We come seeking healing. Some of us are angry. Turn our anger into productive purpose. Some are fearful. Do not let us become paralyzed, for there is much work to do. We are Democrats, diverse, Remind us, Lord, it takes a lot of loving to turn diversity into unity. Grace from politics to public service. And give us the hope that we may not ever think that things won't change, for they will. Send us your spirit, renew our souls. 
make us one, that we may make this world of yours a better place. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Turney. I would now like to introduce the remarkable, fabulous, the great mayor of Houston, Texas, Mayor Sylvester Turner. <laughs> mayor Turner was raised in Northwest Houston, Texas. His ruler here. He is a strong Democrat but he is working hard to bring this entire city together to improve the infrastructure, to make our neighborhoods safer, and yes, to support our great public schools and give working families a, a good chance to get ahead. He is representing this great city in the Texas House of Representatives where he served as speaker pro temp for three years. And as I told Mayor Turner uh, backstage, I said, when I was a little girl, my parents would save up every year to bring their nine to this great city for our summer vacation. I learned how to not only play basketball, but I went to so many little training camps here in Texas. And once, once again, I reminded Mayor Turner that when people in my beloved Louisiana had to flee, not just Hurricane Katrina, but her deadly and catastrophic sister, Hurricane Rita, it was this great city of Houston, as well as the state of Texas, that took us in. Thank, thank you, Mayor Turner, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Let me thank Don, and let me thank you, uh, members of the DNC, for being here in Houston uh, this morning. And let me just say to you that the doors in Houston are always open, and the doors in the city will continue to be open. Uh, in this city, we don't build walls, we build relationships, and we value them. Look, I am I'm honored to be here to, to welcome you this morning uh, to the most diverse city in the United States of America. Um, and I know for many people, they say, no, you know, Mayor, that's not so, but let me tell you. This is the most diverse city in the country, more diverse than New York or L.A. or Philadelphia, D.C. There are 142 different languages spoken right here in this city. One of four Houstonian is foreign born. Uh, literally on any given day, you can travel the globe right here in the city of Houston. And trust me, I have done that many, many, many times. And before this day is over, you know, I will travel the globe right in this city. It's a city of hope and, optim and optimism and inspiration. And I say that not based on what someone told me. I say it based on what I know. Uh, I grew up in this city. Uh, neither one of my parents graduated from high school. Uh, they moved here in 1954. My daddy was a yard man and worked at Continental Imsco as a painter for 30 years. My mom was a maid at the Rice Hotel downtown. Uh, and raise nine kids. And when you come out of a family with no private health insurance, you know the value of the Affordable Care Act, okay? You know the value. And that same kid that took a, uh, that bus ride with my mom to come down to Ben Hobb Hospital, you get there in the morning, you stay there all day. You know, I, rem I, I remember those scenes very vividly. But when my dad was diagnosed with cancer, didn't have private health insurance, he continued to work until the good called him home. I was 13 at the time. That maid became the CEO of the Turner household. And when you went to her and asked her for something and she didn't have it, she would say, son, I don't have it, but tomorrow will be better than today. Stay in school, work hard. I know the value of education because if it were not for the public school system, I stand today. And so I want to welcome you to a city of inspiration. I want to welcome you in this state, not just in this city. When you look around at all of the major cities in this state, 
They are run by Democratic mayors. Austin, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, in this particular state. And regardless of what the color may be, you know, blue is a mighty good color to me. And so uh, welcome, enjoy yourselves. This morning I've been planting trees, so I'm kind of looking like this. In a few minutes, we shall go and open the doors for the Super Bowl right here in this city. This is the city that we're ready. Whether you're rooting for a new, the New England Patriots or whether you're rooting for the Atlanta Falcons, you are right here in the most diverse city, and Democrats are still making a difference right here in the state of Texas, right here in the city of Houston, and the best for us has yet to come. Thank you for being here, and welcome. Thank you, Mayor Turner. Thank you for your leadership. And he's planting trees, and we're breaking new ground in Texas for the future of the Democratic Party. My next uh, guest speaker is uh, someone who has an important job on this, this campus. Uh, Dr. Austin Lane had a conflict this morning, but he still welcomed the Democratic Party to the TSU campus. And uh, Mr. Calhoun may not say this, but as a proud graduate of LSU, I'm the LSU Tiger. I am proud to be on the campus of the TSU Tigers. I came to this campus uh, back in my 20s when I was organizing uh, the campaign to make Dr. King's birthday a national holiday. And this campus opened up many offices so that we could get petitions from all throughout the city of Houston. So I am proud to be back on the campus of TSU. I want to thank the faculty, the dean, and all, all of the great uh, administrators who opened this campus for us to be here this weekend. So I just want to proudly introduce uh, Mr. Dominique Calhoun, the Director of Government Relations. And again, thank you, TSU. Thank you, TSU students, the student body, the student body presidents, college Democrats, for hosting us yesterday. And thank you again for hosting us today. Uh, Mr. Calhoun, come up and bring greetings on behalf of TSU. Tigers. Good morning. Uh, Chairwoman, I'll tell you, it's kind of unfair that you had the mayor go before me because I, I can't do, obviously, what he could do. But um, on behalf of the Texas Southern University Board of Regents, the university's 12th president, Dr. Austin A. Lane, the administration, students, faculty, staff, and alumni, I want to thank, I want to welcome you uh, to the country's fourth largest historically black college and university. Uh, As the chairwoman said, my name is Dominic Calhoun. I serve as the director of government relations for the university. Uh, the president sends his warmest regards to all of you for being here. Uh, we had a board retreat, and he is with the Board of Regents currently doing some work. Uh, I know that this university over the years has been represented uh, by many Democrats as we uh, are in the heart of Third Ward of Houston. Uh, and they continue to fight for social justice and equality and the American promise. Uh, I'm not sure if they're here today, but I do want to acknowledge those that uh, currently represent Texas Southern University, uh, the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee, <laughs> Senator Boris Miles, State Representative Garnett Coleman, County Commissioner Rodney Ellis, you heard from our Mayor Sylvester Turner and Councilmember Dwight Boykin, if you can, give them a, a round of applause. In addition, the university actually has two uh, graduates from the Thurgood Marshall School of Law who are currently serving in Congress. Uh, they include the Honorable Al Green of Texas and the Honorable Hank Johnson of Georgia. And I do want to recognize both of them. <laughs> and finally, as the chairwoman stated, Barbara Jordan did famously state, uh, what the people want is very simple. They want an America as good as its promise. And today, as you deliberate, is our hope that you continue to keep our students, faculty, and staff in mind and strive to ensure that this nation lives up to its honorable creed, that we each are endowed by our creator to the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you again and welcome to Tiger Land.
you have an opportunity today, please go by the Barbara Gordon Archives. I guarantee you it will inspire you. Uh, before we hear from our next speaker, I would like to recognize the dedicated DNC members who are here today. We are joined by many of our great officers, my, my colleagues, Grace Main, Maria Elena DeRosso, Maria's here, uh, Ray Buckley, the, also the uh, president of the ASDC, the Association of Democratic State Party Chairs, and the, uh, also the president of New Hampshire a Democratic uh, Party, uh, the former mayor of Baltimore, Stephanie Rouse Blake, our distinguished secretary, uh, Henry Munoz, uh, is also a financial chair, resident of the great state of Texas. And I'll give a shout out to our caucus council chairs, Bell uh, Hung, uh, Virgil Rollins, Lottie Shackelf, Iris Martinez, Earl Fultz, uh, Ryan uh, Ramirez, Betty Ritchie from Texas, Jason Ray, and Andrew Lackner. So I know Safranya Thompson will be speaking later today. Uh, so at this time, it gives me uh, such a great honor uh, to not only introduce a remote American, a prophetic voice, uh, a man who has energized so many, uh, not just in the great Tar Heel State of North Carolina, but all throughout this country. It is my pleasure to introduce a great leader and the fight for justice and equality for all, the Reverend Dr. William Barber. <laughs> Reverend Barber is a president and senior lecturer of the Repairers of the Breach and the architect of the Moral Monday Movement. He has helped to lead the fight for voting rights for many, many years, redistricting, health care reform, labor and workers' rights, protection of immigration rights. He's been arrested multiple times for civil disobedience as he stood for education, economic, and equal justice. He has been a voice over the last few months of what we must do, not just as Democrats, but as Americans, in resisting the intolerance and standing up for peace and justice and equality for all our people. So join me in welcoming my friend, a great and distinguished American leader, the Honorable William Barber. Dr. Barber. Good morning. It is so good to be here with you today, and I want to thank everybody that's here that had a something to do with us coming. Since you invited a preacher this morning, I want to begin with a text. It comes from the second chapter of Acts of the Apostles. It says, when the Feast of the Pentecost came, they were all together on one accord. Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. And then fire sat on each head. The Holy Spirit spread through the ranks. And they started speaking in tongues in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. I want to suggest this morning that we need a political Pentecost in America. Christians, Christians remember this story every year as the beginning of our liberation movement in the way of Jesus. Prophetic liberationist Pentecostals recall it with special devotion because it is central to our understanding of how the spirit interrupts this world. The disciples had suffered a temporary defeat. Their leader and cause looked as though the brash bullies and the bad news had won over the good news. And then a new day, a new power, a new perspective arose. And I want to suggest that this text has application in this moment because America is in deep need of a political Pentecost. Pentecost is, not about, is about a new thing, not simply the next chapter in an ever-evolving story, but a radical new thing, an interruption of the way things are that brings about transformation for everyone involved. Pentecost is about reaching back to the past, pulling forth those the other moments of transformation. And Thomas Kahn called it a paradigm shift. Brother Malcolm Gladwell has written about it as a tipping point. The founders of this nation talked about this phenomenon as revolution. But whatever you call it, there are times when a deep moral crisis demands that the way we have framed things up until now is insufficient. 
Dr. King called it a zeitgeist moment. And the spirit of justice and truth grabs us and uses us right in the midst of difficult times. It is the moment like Fannie Lou Hamer spoke of when she said sometimes you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired and something happens. It's what Paul Tillich meant when he said in the midst of the threat of not on being, you find the courage to be. And I do not need to tell you that we are living in such a time. We need a political Pentecost and the text from Acts helps us to see three things. We need a new tongue. We need a new fire or illumination, and we need a new wind. First, getting our language right, learning to speak in new tongues is a must right now. We have inherited a language that is too puny for the crisis we face. Somewhere, somehow, you, many, learn to think of yourselves as a part of the so-called left. At some point around the time of the French Revolution, left and right may have described the political reality, but it no longer does. These terms were passed down to us, but the language left versus right, liberal versus conservative is too puny to challenge the extremism we're facing now. First, <laughs> first, why in the world would you call something right that you didn't then turn around and say it's wrong? That's linguistic trauma. No, we need a deeper moral language to name this crisis. We have to learn to speak in new tongues if we're going to challenge the lies. This is not time for a light conversation about alternative facts. No, we need some moral clarity. When we have come through a moment, Sister Brazil, when politicians can say this openly and avert overtly, elect me and I'll take your health care, I'll refuse living wages, I'll privatize public education, I'll spread hate against Muslims and the LGBT community. I'll take away a woman's right over her body. Just elect me, and I'll treat corporations like, like people and people like things. I'll give the, the National Rifle Association and its lust for guns unholy power over our government. And then after I do that, I'll make sure it's easier to get a gun than it is to vote. When you're in that kind of situation, and when people can say that, and call themselves right and get votes, we need a new tongue. Moral language, where we declare some things are not left versus right, they are just wrong. It's wrong to take health care away from 20 million Americans and allow thousands to die, and especially politicians who get free health care that did not allow them, that elect them to have the same thing. It's not left or right, it's just wrong. It's wrong to blame our economic challenges on poor people, people of color, while we give welfare to corporations in the form of dramatic tax cuts. It's not left or right, it's just wrong, and it's immoral. It's wrong to scapegoat Muslim immigrants for violence perpetrated by, it's just wrong. It's wrong to nominate a black man who knows nothing about having to lead an agency he doesn't even believe in. It's just wrong. It's wrong to put a man in charge of protecting voter rights who has fought voting rights and failed to upheld them as a member of Congress. Some things are not about left versus right. They are about right versus wrong. A violation of our deepest religious values that say how we treat the poor and the hurting and the vulnerable, those are our deepest moral values. How we stand for justice and the immigrant and the children, our constitutional values that say the establishment of justice, common defense, and the general welfare ought to be the focus of our politics. If we are going to have a political Pentecost in America, we have to reclaim moral and constitutional language that helps people see what's really going on. And then number two, we need a new fire that reveals how we got here and illuminates the way forward. We can't see a way forward without understanding how we got here. Princeton historian Nell Payne's sister has named the pattern we are witnessing in a way that makes sense to this preacher. It's called call and response. In, in an article entitled, Without Obama, there would be no Trump, she says, here is the iconography of a tragic, traditionally American call and response. The call, a challenge to the status quo of white people on top, the response, outbreaks of meanness, many 
came here by embracing rhetorical weapons and a desire to take things back. This call and response is as American as apple pie since we're in the South. Let us remember that in the 19th century, following the Civil War, fusion coalitions came together throughout the South to reconstruct the nation and the republic to guarantee liberty and justice for all. Blacks and progressive whites worked together in 1868. They controlled the South, controlled the Southern legislature. In my home state of North Carolina, a white minister and a black minister worked together to rewrite the Constitution, guaranteeing all persons the right to life, liberty, fruit of their own labor, the pursuit of happiness, guaranteed voting rights, public education, criminal justice reform, and raised taxes to fund progress. But this radically democratic call, black and whites working together in the South, evoked a violent backlash. The KKK arose in the South, attacked white people before they ever attacked black people. They were determined to destroy the fusion coalition. And the, they came up with a movement called the Redemption Movement. And their theme was, we got to make this country great again and take our country back. Read Eric Fonda's book on Reconstruction. Read the BBC books on, on, on Reconstruction. They put in place Jim Crow law. They had a candidate in 1877 who lost the popular vote, but cut a deal with the Electoral College as long as he promised to put extremists on the Supreme Court and roll back all of the gains. By 1883, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was overturned, 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. And then in 1916, Woodrow Wilson brought white supremacy in the White House through the birth of a nation which was there before all along was there today, 100 years ago. And, and the birth of a nation presented alternative facts about Reconstruction. Then there was the emergence of the second Reconstruction during what we sometimes call the Civil Rights Movement. It was really about a new fusion movement. Black, brown, white people, Jews, and Christians came together, fought for civil rights, labor, immigrants, and women, poor folks of every shade. Dr. King was killed. Remember by working for the poor people's campaign. But we, we, but this call evoked the same response. The Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act were fruits of decades of struggle. The war on poverty was fruits of decades of struggle. But then there was backlash against them. It wasn't limited to Southern segregationists, but it was born in the South. Richard Nixon called it law and order. His campaign of 1968 was an intentional effort to win the solid South by appealing to racial hate and fear without using racist language. His advisor, Jim Phillips, called it the Southern strategy. George Wallace tried to use it, but Richard Nixon perfected it, along with a host of other Southern politicians and some in the Rust and Wheat Belt. The Koch brothers latched onto it in 1973 and said that it no longer worked to produce Messiah King, but to build a ground up backlash as progressives ran from movement building to seeking Messiah candidates. Ronald Reagan teamed up with the moral majority and into the 1980s. And the goal was to use wedge issues to keep black and white and brown coalitions from forming in the South, thereby creating a solid South so that just with 13 Southern states, you could always deliver 171 electoral up front, 26 senators, 31% of the United States Congress if fully successful, along with 13 state houses and who even if elected Democrat would not openly support a progressive agenda. The painter says the election and re-election of President, who, of President Obama, who was black, or the wife who was black, and two daughters who were black, exposed a way to break the solid South. And so the responses to this challenge began early with the vow to make Obama a one-term president. They continued in congressional refusal to govern birtherism, you lie, and visual stereotypes that had lost currently a century ago, but they were brought back. So Nell Painter says when you understand this, you understand without Barack Obama, there is no Donald Trump. Trump is so obviously unsuited to have a president of the United States, but he was a nominee most suited to answer the call of reclamation. We need a little more fire to help us see this clearly. I've heard too many people say over the last month, we've never seen anything like this before. If you see it, it doesn't mean it wasn't happening. <laughs> Donald Trump is not the first candidate to play on our worst fears. 
that, and to use racism to garner votes, classism to divide and to conquer. As I said a hundred years ago, but Woodrow Wilson brought birth of a nation in the White House. Today, it's blackboard and banner. The package may be different, but the content is the same. We've seen this before, and because we have, we don't know what beats it. People coming together in fusion coalition, refusing to be divided, and discovering our common ground by linking arms and refusing to be divided. Listen to me. I come here today not as a Democrat, but as a preacher and as a moral leader. We have not suffered this blow in the justice and moral community because we're weak. No, we can see by the fire of a political Pentecost that we're under attack because we're strong. If they had to turn back to the playbook of the 1960s, it's because we're strong. If they had to lie and make up stories about widespread voter fraud, it's because you're strong. If they had to demand voting and fight tooth and nail in the court, it's because you're strong. If they need a far government to hack your emails, it's because you're strong. If they, ha if they had to pass Citizens United to funnel pornographic sums of money into campaign, it's because you're strong. And if we open our eyes in the light of a political pinnacle, we will see that we are stronger together and why we can't succumb to the forces that would divide us. Yeah. At the convention, at the convention in Philadelphia, I talked about a heart problem. And God knows we need some moral defibrillators to shock the heart of this nation. But any good doctor knows that even after the heart sometimes has been shot, back to life it still may require surgery. And they tell me you don't do surgery on the heart these days without doing an MRI because it shows you a three-dimensional picture. You know the x-ray gives you two-dimensional, but it takes three-dimensional to really work on the heart. And in this season of a political Pentecost, we need all three dimensions. We need to give America an MRI. That MRI means we need to examine morality and values, racial justice and, and discrimination, and income and economic justice. We can't let those so-called white evangelical, by the way, I'm an evangelical, claim that tax cut, private school, property rights, where you stand on LGBTQ, women's rights, and, and prayer in the schools are the moral issues. No, that is theological malpractice and a form of heresy. Love, justice, truth, and mercy, and helping the poor and the least of these are the moral issues of our day. We can't let Paul Ryan talk more about poverty than we do, while at the same time he and his party of extremists support the very policies that hurt the poor and divest from poor communities. We can't let Mr. Trump talk about voter fraud and we aren't shouting about voter suppression. And we can't just go around saying that Trump won this election because he appealed to the white working class. I'm not saying the economic pain white folks feel isn't real. I'm just saying they're not alone. Poor white people are hurting just like poor black people, poor brown people. And the wealthiest cabinet in this nation history is taking power as we speak because Trumpism temporarily got away with pitting poor whites against poor black and poor brown. We eight million more poor white people than poor black in this country. Ten out of the twelve poorest states in the South where people vote for candidates who promise to end health care, social safety nets for poor, defund public education, and deny living wages while these same politicians they support will give more tax cuts to the 400 families that make $97,000 an hour. When you know these facts, we have something more complex than just a class problem. And we need an MRI, our morality, values, racism, discrimination, income, and economic justice. When, when 22 states since 2010 passed voter suppression and race-driven unconstitutional apartheid-like congressional districts, according to the courts, in states that represent the highest growth in black and brown voters, states that have 57 percent of black voters and 234 electoral votes and 44 senators. At the same time, we have less voting rights protection than we had 1965. This 
is more than a white working class problem. And in 2016, when we saw 868 less voting places in the minority and African American communities, and not one serious hour was in either the Democratic primary, the Republican primary, or the general election primary debate on voter suppression. We have more than just a class problem. We have a class, a race, and a moral problem. When Ryan and McConnell and the Congress, long before the election of Donald Trump, have gotten their way and gotten away with not restoring the Voting Rights Act, more than three and a half years today represents Donald 1,313 days today which is 1,312 days longer than Strom Thurmond filibust the Civil Rights Act of 1957. We do not just have a class problem. We have a race problem, a class problem, and a moral values problem, and we must have a political pentacle. And so we have to put some light on it. We have to show America the faces of the people who are being hurt by the policy rooted in systemic racism, classism, and immorality. Right now, every member of Congress who is fighting to save the uh, Affordable Care Act should invite an impacted white person, an impacted black person, an impacted brown person from your district to stand on the floor with you and say, you are killing us. We've got to help America see. We need black and white and brown children to stand together and say, you're attacking our public education. We need Muslims and Christians and Jews to stand together. When you hurt Muslim, you are hurting all of us. We need voters and young voters and LGBTQ to stand together. We need some fresh fire, some fresh eyes. And then finally, we need fresh wind, a moral movement, a revolution. Language and vision are important, but we need a fresh movement. When extremists took over our state government in the home state of North Carolina four years ago, we challenged them with moral language of our deepest religious and constitutional tradition. We dug deep in our history. We found out when we looked at the voting records that the same folk who were attacking public schools were attacking health care. And the same people attacking health care were against the LGBT community. And the same people attacking the LGBT community were against labor rights and living wages. The same people against living wages were against immigrants and Muslims. And the same people against Muslims were against the Latino. And we decided if they were cynical enough to be together, we ought to be smart enough to come together. And we linked up. We started fighting back with Marl Mondays. They fought harder. We lost some battles, spent some nights in jail, but we stayed together. 11% of the folk that went to jail were Republicans when we changed the language from left versus right. We, we organized in counties with 99% white, 89% Republican. We organized holding race and class together, not trying to find a way to get around race, but to find a way to dig into race and show the connection between immorality, racism, and classism. And when, when, the, when the dust cleared this election, Trumpism rolled across the South. But in North Carolina, we beat extremism in our governor's race, our attorney general's race, the race for auditor, the race for the secretary of state, and an African American in the Deep South won 76 counties and won by 350,000 votes for the Supreme Court the first time in the history of North Carolina as a Southern state. America needs more than a strategy to win back some seats for Democrats in 218. We need a long-term moral movement to win the heart and the soul of this democracy protecting and expanding voting rights and ending voter suppression and unconstitutional gerrymandering and, pursue, and, and pursuing uh, protecting the women's rights and immigrants' rights and LGBTQ rights and labor rights and religious freedom rights. These are moral issues, pro-labor, anti-poverty, anti-racist policy that build up economic democracy through employment, living wages, alleviation of the bad unemployment, a just transition from fossil fuels, labor rights, affordable housing, direct cash transfers and other support for families struggling in poverty, fair policies for immigrants, and by critiquing policies around warmongering that undermine our moral standing here and across the world. These are moral issues. Education for every child, moral issues. Health care and environmental protection and protecting women's health, moral issues. Fair 
criminal justice system and addressing the continuing inequality and fighting the prolifer proliferation of guns. Those are not Barber issues or Bernie issues or Clinton issues or Obama issues or even Democratic issues. Those are moral issues and we need a moral movement. And if we come together, as I go to my seat, around this moral agenda, Trump will lose its power. The Southern strategy will lose its power. If we expand the entire base, not just the working white class base, but the entire base. We go get African Americans that stayed home. We get the Latinos, we get the white, we get the red, we get the brown. Trumpism is extremism is bad. But I'm convinced, like they used to say in South Africa, only a dying mule kicks the hardest. And the question is not whether the lies and the attacks will last. They can't, not ultimately in history. The question is, will we stand together? And so at that Pentecost 2,000 years ago, they stood together. Tongues got the ears' attention. Fire caught the eyes' attention. The real miracle of that day was men that blew people together, and they changed the world. And I stopped by to say that in moral crisis we have, it demands a political Pentecost in America. It's time to come together. And I know about the power of coming together. I know it biblically, if I can close as a preacher. I know the power of getting together because Moses and his people and his rod got together. Pharaoh came down and the Red Sea opened up. When Esther and her uncle Mordecai came together, they were able to stop the plots of destruction against the Jewish people. When David and his rock and his slingshot and his faith came together on the battlefield, Goliath fell. And they tell me the next day, the headline in the Jerusalem morning hell was, the bigger they come, the harder they fall. <clears throat> when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got together, they turned back an egomaniac love to build towers and put gold on them and make people bow down to him. And when the disciples got together, they took on the greed and meanness of the Herod and Caesars in that day. I know what coming together can do biblically, but I also know what it can do historically. During slavery, it looked like justice had lost, but when Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, Quakers and white abolitionists got together, they formed a fusion movement and stood against slavery. Women didn't have the right to vote, but when that sister who said, I ain't our woman sojourner truth, hooked up with Elizabeth Cady State, they got together and won the right to vote. Plessy versus Ferguson looked like it had the victory, but when Thurgood Marshall got white lawyers and black lawyers and Jewish lawyers and all white Supreme Court with one member who had been a part of the KKK voted unanimously to tear down separate but equal. It looked like Jim Crow had beaten down justice and couldn't rise again, but when Rosa Parks and Martin King and a gay brother named Bayard Rustin got together with Rabbi Heschel and James Reed and Viola Wusa, they tore down Jim Crow. I know it biblically. I know historically what can happen when we come together. But let me close by saying I know it personally. Several years ago, some said I'd never walk again without, without help. They said I might never get out of a wheelchair. I was 30 years old. I had always depended on my legs. I woke up one morning and couldn't move. I spent weeks in the hospital bed at UNC. Went through depression. For 12 years, I was in a wheelchair and on a walker. But over those 12 years, somehow, my faith got together. And my mind got together. And my doctors got together. And the nurse got together and my swim coach and my therapist got together my church family got together and the prayer warriors got together and when they all got together I can jump now I can stand now I can muscle now I can come to Texas now I'm a witness together we can get up together we can fight for all of America together we can come out Together, we can fight back. Together, we may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Together, when we all get together, what a movement, what a pop, what a day, what an America, when we all get together. Preacher.
Rev. Barber, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for reminding us of our charge. Thank you of energizing us this morning, for waking us up, and reminding us that we must stay woke. Thank you for the political Pentecost, the scripture, and the vision of how we come together. Reverend Barbara, thank you for reminding us that we are strong and that we're under attack because we are mighty. And when we come together, we're even stronger. Reverend Barber told us that we need new tongues, new fire, and new wind, new wind. And today we will seek that out in the candidates who will be running for chair and vice chair, secretary, and national finance chair of the Democratic National Committee. So let's continue our program this morning. And joining me now on stage is the leader of our Texas Democrat Party, Mr. Gilberto and Hope. Gil has been a strong leader of this state party. He's been a fighter to turn this state blue. He has worked very hard with our county parties across this great, beloved, long star state. He's a dynamic leader, and ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to call him my friend and, and colleague. So Gil, please come up and bring greetings on behalf of the Texas Democratic Party. Buenos dias, good morning. You know, life's not fair. Life's not fair. It ain't fair that for the next four years we have to live with this minority president, and he's not a minority the way we're used to using that term. He's a minority. The majority of people in this country didn't vote for that SOB, you know. And life's not fair that I have to follow Reverend Barber to greet you, okay? That's not fair at all. But welcome to Texas. Welcome to Texas. Texas is not a red state. Texas is a non-voting state or was a non-voting state before 2016. We didn't do too well in this presidential election nationally. And that's why we're gathering again to choose new leaders for our party to take us into the 2018 elections and 2020 to take the White House back. But in Texas, we did a hell of a lot better than we've done in a long time. In Texas, in Texas, for the first time in two decades, we came within single digits in the presidential election. The first time in 20 years. In Texas, in this great county of Harris County, in 2012, the last time we had a presidential election, we won almost every countywide position, 2,000 votes. In 2016, you kicked ass big time. You won by 165,000 votes. And I was told last night that the margin 2020 will be 400,000 votes. It's all over for the Republican Party in Harris County. That's 25 percent of the people of the great state of Texas in this deep, deep blue county. We won big in, Har in Dallas County. We won big in Bear County by margin that we haven't seen in years. In the Rio Grande Valley, we increased our voter turnout higher than we've ever had in the history of Texas politics. We won the first African-American sheriff, female sheriff in Jefferson County. We, the voters hired a Hispanic, a Hispanic, uh, first African-American sheriff in the history of the United States, by the way, I think, woman sheriff in the history of the United States in, in Jefferson County. We won a Hispanic 
sheriff here in Harris County, a Hispanic sheriff in Bear County, a Hispanic female lesbian sheriff in Dallas County, and I can go on and on and on and on. Our numbers in El Paso were unsurpassed. We are moving in the right direction. But it's going to require a lot more work. It's going to require a lot more work, and we a change of philosophy in the National Democratic Party, a belief that Texas can turn blue, a belief that if you invest te in Texas, give us a little oven, okay, National Party, just a little bit of loving. A little, little bit of loving. And I will tell you right now, with a little bit of loving by the National Party, yes, Donald Trump will help us build a wall, but, but it's going to be a blue wall in Texas with 38 electoral votes, and the Republicans will never be able to elect a president again in the United States. Let's get it done. Thank you so much, Democrats. And God bless you, God bless the Democratic Party, and God bless America. I love that. Donald Trump will help us build a blue wall here in the beloved South. Gil has rebuilt this party. We're proud of him. He has built a, a strong bench. He has recruited new people to the party. He expanded how this party communicates democratic values down here in Texas, and it's paying off. And we're, we're going to continue to support the work of Texas Democrats and all of our Southern Democratic parties. I noticed just a minute ago when I was looking around the audience that I saw the former mayor of this great city, my good friend, East Park. Uh, <laughs> mayor, thank you for being here. Thank you for your tremendous support. And I also want to give a, a personal shout out to Annie's List, which recruited me years ago to come down here to Texas to help raise money. Former Governor Ann Richards and so many others who have been just wonderful leaders down here in the great state of Texas. It is my great honor now to welcome Maria Teresa Kumar, the founding president of CEO and CEO of Voto Latino. Under her leadership, Voto Latino has become a key factor in national election by uh, organizing major voter registration campaigns across the country, bringing new voters uh, and influencing millions of people throughout this country through viral, celebrity-driven, uh, grassroots campaigns. Uh, she has also served on the board of Planned Parenthood, and yes, we're going to stand with Planned Parenthood. And she has been a strong and important voice in the Latino Leader Network. So Maria, thank you for coming down here to Texas and please uh, come forward and show us the way uh, to the future. God bless. Good morning, Texas. I keep saying they fear the future because the future is here in Texas, isn't that right? So we have to recognize that they fear the future because the future is here in Texas. And it's the way to the White House because demographics, their issues are not on their side. We're on the side of the American people and on the future of this country. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I'm going to tone down the temperature a bit and walk you through a little slides. If there are questions at the end, welcome them. But I think that in this context, the energy that Robert brought, the energy that we have has to be focused on momentum and leveraging opportunity. And so with that, if you can go ahead and put up the first slide. Next slide. So when we talk about 27.3 million eligible voters, we oftentimes like to look at Latinos as a whole block. And I actually challenge you that we have to look at them intergenerationally for the issues that they care about. The average Latino voter is 27 years old. And we can't do a strategy of where we register them, we date them, but we don't call them in the next day. An integral part of Voto Latino strategy is to make sure that not only do we call you, but we nurture you, we get you excited about being part of the progressive movement, 
give you tools to engage other friends. Next slide. So generational breakdown, basically 60% of Latinos are under the age of 33. That's opportunity. They're much more, they, while they identify independent, they actually identify, well, as they actually identify more progressive than, the, than their generations before them. One in five millennials are Latino. The age of Latinos is 27 years old. The age of a native Latino in the U.S. is 18 years old. 60% of all U.S. Latinos are U.S. born. Opportunity. In 2012, 17 states had a kindergarten class of 20% of that made up the, the demographic fabric of K-12. Next slide. Now these are a little bit out of order. So basically, uh, the peer-to-peer -peer outreach basically is something that voter Latino deeply believe in. We learned in, 20, in 2008 that the way Latinos and in general gather information is by peer-to-peer. -peer. So we developed a voter power app where we basically took voter registration out of the belly of, a, of an organization into the hands of peers. There's a young person in Southern Texas that downloaded VoterPal and registered over 100 people on his or her own. When we start talking about building tools, we have to understand the audience that we're serving and how they communicate. We know that when we start talking to each other, we believe each other more than they do any Democratic Party or party in general or organization. So we developed VoterPal. We're hoping to put this on steroids because everybody's asking us, what do we do next? We don't stop registering to vote. Next slide. This is a little uh, a history of the electoral power of the Latino vote. For the very first time, Latinos broke the 50% mark this election. And it was because there was a candidate that came after us and came after our identity and questioning us whether we were American or not. And for the very first time, we not only participated, but we grew the electoral base. Right now we're waiting for files, but looking at basically between 51 to 53% of Latinos participated in this election. Next slide. There are unprecedented growth opportunities in, in looking at the Latino population. You'll look at the slide. We're talking about over 140% of Latino growth. Shelby County, that famous case that gutted Voting Rights Act, had over 200% of, of Latino growth in the last census. The states that followed basically tried to, tried to squash participation at the polls, had more than 100% Latino, uh, Latino growth. They're fearing the future, so they're turning off opportunity at the polls. Our job is to ensure that we don't turn off opportunity by continuously registering voters, but more importantly, talking about the issues that they care about. And I'll get, get into that a little bit more. Next slide. This is the change face of America. Here in Texas, by 2019, Texas is going to be a majority minority state. That means opportunity. How do we talk to individuals and meet them where they are? Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. Georgia alone, 4% of the electorate, by the time early voting finished, they had a 144% increase in Latino participation who early voted from 2012. And that was because people were talking to them directly, having conversations, telling them that it's not enough to have a narrative of a candidate that's going after them, that they have to pull the muscle and do something about it. Next slide. There's a generational evolution. I would venture to say that one of the big reasons that Latinos are primed for the taking is that they care about every single issue right now that we're talking about. Baby boomers were the largest, part, were the largest generation. Millennial generation was larger than the baby boomers. For the very first time, Generation Z voted. They are larger than the millennial. They're more diverse, more progressive, but we need to talk to them. We have right now a, a president in office who wants to divide Americans on issues of race. But if you look at the proclivities of new voters, they're incredibly progressive. There are opportunities to talk to them not on race issues, which I think that is it's a fault of, of what we've been doing historically, but along generational issues. The reason that Latinos care about education overwhelmingly is because it's a 27-year-old woman who's worrying about whether or not her kid has access to education. 
And I bet that 27-year-old Latina woman cares as much about a great education as a 27-year-old African-American woman with a child and a white woman with a child. It's a long generational issues. When you start talking about wage equity, one of the issues that translates generations is because now we have people that basically are pushing off retirement because they too have to have working wages. How do we talk to individuals, not along necessarily around ethnic, but around generations? What are those, how do we start clumping individuals and talking to them in ways that they are, we're meeting them with they are and the issues they care about, their life experience. Next, next slide. Building political power. Next slide. So this is, we don't have a full picture right now of what the Keynes investment team knows. Uh, this is basically TV ads, but I can tell you that historically, it's, it's underwhelming. In 2012, there was basically, of the $6 billion spent, 20 million of the $6 billion, 20 million of the $6 billion, I have said this several times, went into building infrastructure with the Latino community in 2012. The numbers we're getting back, it was even less this year. Next slide. But there's opportunities for, uh, for building political power. The fall of Pete Wilson was not accidental. And I, could, I would venture to say that we are living in a Wilson moment across the country. What is the Pete Wilson moment? In, two, in 19, uh, 1993, Pete Wilson decided that he was going to run a campaign that was aggressive against uh, American Latinos and immigrant communities. He basically decided that racial profiling was the way to go, that he would not only be one governor, but he eventually would win the White House. Proposition 187, while, while won, it was defeated in the courts and it galvanized the American Latino community. It cemented a California that was once a swing state. Since 1992, California has gone blue every single time in presidential elections. They now control, over the, the Republicans control less than 28% of state, le state legislator. That's an opportunity. What did can we learn from California? was at the moment that someone became aggressive against the Latino community, we started building infrastructure. We started building talent. We started building a bench. This was the very first time that California was basically two Democrats were running for the state, for the uh, US Senate, two Democrats. But it's because we've decided to capitalize on that moment. We are living a moment. And if we focus on building the future of the Democratic Party, of the progressive movement, in populations are new, whether it's North Carolina, Georgia, Texas, not new, but opportunity, then we are looking at a strategy that will make sure that, we're, that we are beating them not only in 2018 and 2030, but 2020, but cementing ourselves for 2030. Next slide. Very similarly, Joe, Joe Arpaio was part of uh, the enforcement officer in, yes. <laughs> and while in California, it took us 25 years, long and hard, 25 years to cement a legislative base we learned from those experiences, and in, 20, in less than six years, in 2016, we kicked him out, and we are building a stronger Arizona because we didn't waste any time. We were being strategic, identifying individuals that could not only run a bench, but that we were also building the machine that we did by building infrastructure. Next, next slide. These are basically different versions of the same thing. Sadly, one of us is the current president of the United States. The fact that they're sending criminals and prisoners into our country, and our people are stupid enough to put them in jails or let them, from, uh, let them on the streets, which is even worse, I have to respect them for it. That's what he's talking, that's what the new president of the United States is talking about when it comes to uh, looking at Latinos as less than Americans. That is me, but that translates to that Latinos are primed not only for political messaging, but they want to see a party that actually reflects them. Next slide. These are progressive political opportunities in 2017. We have Virginia, New Jersey, gubernatorial races. California, we have a seat to fill. But then we also have Georgia, Kansas, and South Carolina, where we have an electorate that's anywhere between 2% to 6.5% of the Latino base that could actually make a difference. Next slide. Here are 2018 Senate races. What's interesting, the 84 races in this, uh, 84 House races in 2018, of those 84, 45% of them have districts where the Latino vote is 4% or more. 
in tight elections, that's gonna make all the difference. Next slide. These are the gubernatorial races that are up for grabs. I actually think that Texas is prime, and I'll, ta I'll, I'll, uh, I'll dig in a little more into that. Next slide. The Latino glass ceiling, registered Latino voters. Next slide. So we he keep hearing from exit polls that 29% of Latinos voted Donald Trump. I could tell you that that is messy, lazy, unsophisticated, not modernized polling. 54% of Latinos had voted before election day. Those were not part of the exit polls that, that Edison, Ed, uh, Edison conducted. They were not. Also, the folks that, they, that Edison decided to poll were not in Latino-specific districts. So many of these polls actually that there was an underperformance, not statistically uh, effective significance of Latino representation. And lastly, Latinos' decisions, which found that 29% of Latinos voted for Hillary Clinton, 18% voted for Donald Trump, went a little deeper. Not only did they go into low heavy districts, but then they also checked those, those polling results, their polling results, with actual voter files. Our job, and we're wait everybody's anxiously waiting for March, our job is to make sure that not only are we having conversations, but also dispelling the myths of where Latinos lay. Next poll. And actually, I actually let's go back. I, just, I do want to pause there. What we do know that even among Cubans, Cubans uh, in Florida, we've been able to dig a little deeper. Cubans in Florida, for the first time, vo uh, voted more for Hillary Clinton than they did for the Republican Party. They basically voted for Marco Rubio, but at the top of the ticket, they voted for Hillary. Among Cubans, 31% of them voted for Donald Trump. That sounds like a large number, but considering that the majority of them, 50% or more, normally vote for, for the Republican Party, that also says that we're making inroads within the, community, the Cuban community. Next slide. These are some of the early voting state, states. As I mentioned, Georgia, which right now is 100, uh, they, registered, they early voted 144% for the very first time. It's astronomical. They represent 4% of the electorate. 13% of K through 12 of young kids in Georgia is Hispanic. Next slide. And these are some of the wins that we did for the very first time. For the very first time, we are sending a U.S. Latina, first woman, to the U.S. Senate, Catherine Mastos. And next to Catherine Mastos, we're sending the very first undocumented immigrant who, be, who was a dreamer, who became a U.S. citizen, uh, Mr. Espalat, who is Dominica, of Dominican descent. This, this slide is, is important, not so much because we, almost, we increase significantly the number of representation, but if 20% of, of, of America is Latina and we don't have leadership that looks like us, we are missing an opportunity to cultivate and actually bring, and not only cultivate voters, but also cultivate good solutions to the issues that are impacting the rest of America. Next slide. Community versus need. We keep hearing, uh, we keep hearing the president come. I have such a hard time saying the president. My apologies, but we keep hearing the president say. I'm being honest. <laughs> uh, we keep hearing the president basically say that it's us against them, us against them. When we start talking about the needs of of communities, when we start talking about food deserts, the lack of Wi-Fi, the lack of jobs, a drug a drug epidemic. When we start talking about the lack of access to health and good education, you actually sit back and realize that we're talking about a need in America that is strikingly both rural America, urban America. Those are the same issues. Next, next slide. Again, food deserts, lack of quality jobs, lack of connectivity, lack of quality education, access to health care, drug abuse. These are happening in two different epicenters of America that the Progressive Party can actually come and address. That doesn't divide us, but that recognizes the needs that are happening within these two areas that they seem like distinct populations, but in reality, when you align them, they are the same issues. Next slide. We also keep hearing from the, pr from the president that the, the reason that we don't have a strong agenda is because of what they come to immigration reform is because we have so many individuals taking away our jobs. It's 
when you start digging into the in, deeply into the studies, the majority of Americans, including Republicans, do not believe that we should round 11 million documented. But they voted for Donald Trump because they were hoping that he would either be able to bring jobs back or that they would stop competing with folks that would take their jobs away be, for, because they were willing to earn less. And I, and I propose that one of our big policies for the, for the Progressive Party is that we start talking about wage enforcement because that's really what the issue is. It's wage enforcement. Wage enforcement ensures that, it, that we're paying people fairly for the jobs that they're doing. The white working class is concerned because they feel that their jobs are being usurped by someone that will come and pay less. But wage enforcement ensures that we're protecting the worker. The onus goes back on the employer. Can you believe that right now uh, an employer at, actually does, action, does not pay properly? They only have to pay $1,000. That's being dishonest to the hard work of what it actually means to, uh, of, of hardworking blood and soil. And it's dishonest because all of a sudden we are also not protecting undocumented immigrants. Everybody wants to make sure that they are, they are being paid properly and fairly. And the onus comes out of the worker and goes back to the employer. So I encourage wage enforcement. Go ahead. Next slide. Some solutions. I, as I mentioned before, we need to invest in key states. I, incur, I think that we have to look at North Carolina, Georgia. We also have to look very closely at Texas. Florida is not lost, it just needs massaging. And we have to talk about building Latino infrastructure. Not just running candidates, but we have to make sure that the party looks like the people we serve. That has to have African American blood, Asian blood, young people, and it has to have Latinos. It has to be diversified. It's not enough. And people keep kind of scratching their heads. It's like, what do the polls miss? The polls miss talent of diversity to, so that they know what questions they should be asking. That's what the polls miss. So the Progressive Party has to ensure that it is reflective of this new, the, the uh, emerging America. And we also have to stop saying that the only way you can run as a candidate is if you have tons of money. That's an artificial barrier. If the only that this past election taught us, and we could put up the slide again, the president spent $19 million on TV ads. He spent very little on this race, but his ideas caught fire. We need candidates who are passionate, who believe in the progressive movement, who believe in the future of America, who reflect the future of America, and it can't be about pocketbooks alone. And finally, and, uh, and lastly, is diversifying our communication message. Right now, we have a whole generation among young Latinos, among young immigrants, among young people that want to figure out how do they participate. And just like we capitalized in California under Pete Wilson, we capitalized and built infrastructure under Carpio, we need to make sure we have a communication strategy that has soul that is authentic, that is real, that is descriptive, that provides people with an opportunity that they see themselves. Authenticity right now is what people are craving. They want truth. And for someone to be in the White House that speaks in double talk and does not have truth allows them an opportunity to make sure that we're capitalizing. And we should not be ashamed of that. And I will share with you, one of our biggest fightings at Voto Latino is that while everybody has basically balkanize the media, one place where we find that all Americans are still tuning in, and maybe it won't be for too long, but are still tuning in, is radio and the, and the evening news of their, local, of their local cities. So what's the strategy when we're talking to individuals for the six, six o'clock news, where we are making sure that we are touching Americans? Because I can tell you right now that the folks that, made, that voted for Donald Trump, a lot of them were voting because they wanted something different. They wanted to feel safer. They wanted to be sure that they're, they were seeing in the American fabric. But we lost on the message because not only did, I would say again, we didn't have people to, asking the right questions because they didn't have a sense of diversity, but also because they didn't, they didn't see themselves as, as part of the larger America. And the 6, 6 p.m. news actually allows us for that. So um, those are my, my three <laughs> slide. And lessons from the women's marches. I think that what made sense about the Women's March is that it spoke to the experience 
of Americans. In the last 10 years, we've seen Americans march for immigration reform, Occupy Wall Street, for wage equity, women's to choose, LGBT, voting rights, and Black Lives Matter, and most recently, the pipeline environment. Those were, ten, those were 10 years of marches that finally the woman's brought out. It was the intersectionality. It wasn't based on race, and you could actually argue that it wasn't based on gender. It was based on this issue of what Americans see the future. Next slide. These were the lessons from the women's marches is that every, all 50 states, including deeply red states, came and marched. So what's our message to them? What are our opportunities saying that we are Americans coming into the future, that we are not siloed. How many people here attended the Women's March? The beauty, the beauty of it, besides the fact that there was no violence, I think that's getting to the moment. Well, we're not surprised, but that's, well, that's my own. But it was testament to Americans that we want, that we're optimistic about where we want to go. And the way we go is making sure that we're organizing locally, that we're using these opportunities. We are basically identifying the bench. We're going back to locals. We're going back to basics and being authentic. Next slide. So I'm just going to just briefly give some highlights of the work that we did. A lot of folks are saying, well, you know, what happened to a digital strategy? Latino is digital first. We are now nearly after two years. We're uh, coming into this uh, out of this election with close to a million supporters. Next slide. I keep going like this, and I realize I wouldn't, I, it's because I keep saying next slide. Sorry. <laughs> We registered 177,792 voters in these key states. Florida and Texas were our largest, uh, our largest two states. 41% of, the, of those we registered early voted, and that's because we started engaging them in a conversation early and strong. The, av the national average for Latinos of early vote was 21%, so we almost doubled what uh, of, of those that turned out. We did register because, again, we were digital first. We registered roughly. Uh, our, uh, our average per voter was $12. We held 243 events, including 23 concerts with Live Nation. We had more than 2,000 volunteers. We launched 10 college campuses everywhere from Oregon to Tennessee. And we were able to, uh, and we basically were able to do this with over 500 partners. Next slide. Uh, with our digital strategy, we basically provided over 15,000 rides to the polls. There are opportunities to learn that we provide, again, peer-to-peer -peer opportunities, experiences. People come out, and they come out in, uh, in ways that you don't expect. So how do we make sure that we're creating volunteer opportunities where we're leaning on the strength of the volunteer of how they can participate? So are you a graphic designer? Fantastic. We need more cultural, uh, cultural information. Are you a photographer? Great. This is the next place that you can actually participate. We, we have to, what we do at Voto Latino is we basically emphasize what is your strength, how do you want to give, and then we actually make sure that we fit you into whether it's an event or whether it's a phone call or whether it's SMS. Next, next slide. I, I think this is a little repeat, but basically we said we did something different this year too. Most organizations were really hung up on doing phone calls. We recognize that our audience doesn't want to necessarily pick up a phone call, but they will answer a text message. We did over 952,000 text messages. Next one. Next social. So basically, right now we. Next slide, next slide, that's great. This is where I wanted to get to, actually. So in Texas, we registered 39,000 uh, and 36 voters in Texas. I would argue that one of the reasons that we lost was because we left voters on the table. There was a strong appetite here in Texas and even in Florida and North Carolina to register voters. Sadly, we, as a progressive movement, have been le leading a 50% 50, 50 plus one strategy, meaning that we only need 51% of voters to win. What we found was that here in Texas, towards the end, we were registering voters at $3.31. We were registering voters at $3.31, and there was no appetite to register more. That was a painful experience. And Florida extended the voter registration deadline by eight days. I keep saying that by seven days, I keep saying that the gods were with us, saying, hey, you guys, we're not done yet. Uh, we were registering them $12 and change. And the calls, when I, we were trying to raise more money, because we literally, we ran out of money. We were trying to put, get more, more of an appetite. We were saying, you know, we're good. We're not good. Because our job as a progressive movement is to register every single person to do outreach until the very end. That is our job. That is how we carry a progressive agenda. That's how we solidify a map. But this silliness of we didn't have enough, 
Not when it comes to enfranchisement. We should never say that we have enough. We have enough when we have perfect participation. This is our job. And that's next, next slide. I think that's a thank you. I want to, as we move forward, I want to say, I do believe that technology opportunity. For the very first time, Texas went from double digits to less than, uh, to less than single, to single digits, 9%. We know that we have roughly 3 million young Latinos here under the age of 35 that are eligible to vote. But we have to build the infrastructure. We have to be authentic. We have to be the people we serve. I mean, the Progressive Party has to reflect those individuals. The fact that more, more young Latinos right now are identifying as independent but progressive means that we haven't talked to them and given them a reason to join the Democratic Party. That's our job. But our job is also to make sure that we're building the inroads so that if they want to run for office, that they, they have access to it. That if they want to be polled, that we're giving them the access to it. We can't say that it's good enough to have a field organizer to come and have someone come in and say, oh, let's just talk about Latino issues. No, we're more complicated, more complex than that as humans, and as humans March has showed. So as we move forward, we can't let a, we can't let a president that's divisive, that is trying to basically create wedges among racial lines. Because the people that marched last week, you in the room, we hope better. And we know that's not who we are. And we know that our friends are not siloed based on race. And that our wants are not siloed based on race. We want a strong, energetic, visionary America. But we have make sure that we're not leaving those in most need behind. And we have to give them space to have conversations so that if they're feeling a little jittery about the changing America, that, that we're honest. We can't point fingers. It's absolutely natural all of a sudden in Georgia where your, your neighbor all of a sudden is changing, your neighborhood is changing, and no one is describing what that, what that means. That's up to us to have those conversations. And I want to thank you because I do think that, again, Taking back the Peterson moment, while he won office, California squashed political operations, uh, uh, aspirations to hit the White House. But we, we put our heads down, and we organized, and we built on that opportunity. And for the next two years and the next four years, we have to put our heads down and fund infrastructure and build for those opportunities and make sure that we're having those conversations and bringing more people in. Because what our job is, is to make sure that we are extending a lifetime of opportunity to our neighbors who right now feel unsafe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. That was a great presentation. <clears throat> Solid recommendations. And I just want to acknowledge all of the members of the Democratic National Committee who are here uh, with us this morning in Texas. Uh, we will make uh, Maria's presentation available to all of you, and of course it will be part of our comprehensive uh, document that we uh, present to the DNC in our, at our meeting in Atlanta. And that is my great honor to introduce two of my uh, great friends, Jim Alley Dillon and Larry Cohen, who serve as chair and vice chair, respectively, of the Unity Reform Commission. Many of you may not know that the Unity Reform Commission was created through a resolution that was approved at the 2016 Democratic National Convention, uh, Convention in Philadelphia with a goal of studying key elements of the party structure and the nominating process and to provide recommendations to the full Democratic National Committee. They have a lot of work to do. They will need your strong support and your voices throughout this process. So, Larry and Jim, please come up and talk to us today about the work Unity Commission. Hi, everyone. This is uh, the first of the Larry and Jen Roadshow, so we're going to test right. the material uh, on all of you. Um, but as Donna mentioned, we're here to talk a little bit about the Unity Reform Commission, something that I think is incredibly important for our party, uh, especially uh, as we're watching the news to be here and to go through a process with all of you and the grassroots of the party to think about ways that we can be more inclusive, more welcoming, and really honor the diversity of our party. And that's ultimately what the Unity Commission is about. Uh, as Donna mentioned, it was created over the course of the convention with the Sanders and the Clinton campaigns as well, the delegates coming together to tackle three big topics. One is the manner of voting, uh, two is delegates, three is party reform. 
And those are some really big, important topics about who we are as a party and how we want to move forward and how we make sure that uh, we're really thoughtful in that approach. So our role as part of the Unity Commission uh, is to look at what will be formed after the new chair is named. Uh, we will spend the rest of the year going through a very thoughtful process across the country, uh, engaging with, with all of you and, and uh, really talking about the issues that we have before us. And, and as I said, to start, it's really about how we can be more inclusive as a party. So we're going to be looking at things like increasing uh, participation in the nominating process, thinking about how we um, address unpledged delegates, redistricting, expanding the donor base of the DNC, uh, growing as a party and growing uh, to engage with young people. There's really no topic that we won't probably tackle, and we want to work together starting today to make sure, and, and we've been working very hard, Larry and I, and, and the, the amazing staff uh, under the leadership of, of Chairwoman Brazil, to go through the process to get organized. So as soon as there is a new chair elected, we'll, we'll hit the ground running. Um, I want to turn over to Larry to talk a lot more about the process and also how everyone can get involved. Okay, thanks, Jen. So, um, unity does not fall out of the sky. Uh, we have to work at it. And Jen and I, even though we came from Clinton and Sanders, we go forward as Democrats. We go forward with the spirit of unity, but also in the name of change. So, this effort is about opening us up even more. More transparency, more involvement, more inclusion, the kind of fusion we just heard from Reverend Barber. And so we have a website. Can we flash that up, uh, the URL? There you go. Democrats.org slash unity slash commission. A lot to remember, even for me, but anyway. So there's a table out there, and it's got forms you can fill out to give us stuff you want us to work on. We will also hang out there uh, instead of eating lunch. So come see us. Uh, we're doing this at each one of the forums and in Atlanta, and the idea here is that all people who want to be Democrats, they feel like this is their party. We have to work together at that, regardless of where we came from. And we have to say to young voters and to people who haven't even voted, this is where you come. This is where you get involved. This is where you resist the President of the United States. And this is where you stand up and fight back and make a difference as we work for economic and racial and social and environmental justice. That's what Democrats mean. This commission will open that up and make Americans feel like they have a party to go to, and Jen and I are committed to doing that, but only with your help. Thank you. Jen and Larry, and Jen and Larry will be participating at all of our regional forums, uh, so they welcome your input. Please take advantage of their time over lunch uh, to give them your input and your ideas. So um, this morning, as you all know, we heard from some really terrific uh, speakers, provided us with great thoughts on how we move our party forward. Now it's time to begin hearing from our great candidates who are running for DNC officers' positions. For many in this room, this next program is the main event. We have all been eager to hear from each of the candidates running for every office of the DNC. This will be an opportunity for our candidates to share with us their vision for the future of the Democratic Party and an opportunity for the DNC members to ask their questions of these candidates. Uh, this morning, we will hear from the candidates who are running for secretary of the Democratic National Committee. Then we will hear from the candidates for treasurer and finance chair in that order. We will hear from the candidates running for chair of the Democratic Party and vice chair uh, during today's afternoon session. So we'll break briefly for lunch. So before I introduce uh, our moderator, Evan Smith, uh, the staff would like to just reset the uh, uh, the, the dais up here and uh, give us about two or three minutes and then I'll bring Evan Smith to take over this portion of the program. You have to move. I guess they're telling me I have to move first.
Good morning. Happy to be with you. So let me tell you how this is going to go today. I have the, uh, the honor of moderating uh, and facilitating the forums that are going to take place this morning and this afternoon, culminating with the candidate for, for chair of the DNC. Uh, and these are going to work a little differently. The morning and the early afternoon forums will differ from the chair forums, and then I'm not going to ask any questions of the candidates for the races other than chair. DNC members will get the opportunity to ask questions of the candidates for the lower office. Um, we're going to give the morning forum candidates an opportunity once they are briefly introduced by name and by location, geography by me. They'll have two minutes to introduce themselves, say a few words about their candidacy, and then we'll immediately go to questions from DNC members. And we will take as many questions as time permit. And my apologies if we run out of time and there are still people who want to ask questions. We'll then switch to the next forum for treasurer, and then finally to the forum for finance chair. We'll have a break for lunch. We'll come back after lunch. We'll have two uh, forums for vice chair candidates, and then finally the, the forum for chair. But it's a very straightforward deal. They'll get to introduce themselves. We'll have questions from DNC members, and you'll get an opportunity to hear from them. We're very pleased to have three candidates for secretary of the Democratic National Committee with us here today. We're going to introduce them in order of their opening statements. They drew lots backstage to determine who goes first, second, and third. On my left is Roberta Lang of Nevada. Next to her is Anna Capril of Wyoming. And finally, Jason Ray of Wisconsin. Ms. Lang drew the lot that allows her to go first, so she gets two minutes to introduce herself. We'll then follow with Mr. Capril and M Ms. Capril and Mr. Ray. Lang. Good morning. My grandfather immigrated from Mexico to the United States looking for opportunity and a better life. On election night 2016, some of that hope and a sense of opportunity was realized when Nevada elected its first Latina senator. Unfortunately, that hope was dashed with the election of Donald Trump. We need to bring that hope back to life. Nevada also re-elected Dina Titus, flipped two congressional seats, Democrat or Republican to Democrat, and flipped our state house and our state senate, and Nevada did for Hillary. Did we work any harder than the rest of you? No, but we did some things well. We had an abundance of support at the national level, outside groups, and Senator Reid. We connected with working people from um, in the unions and talked about working families and everyday rights. We leveraged grassroots organizations and responded to their needs with staff, leaders, and resources. During my work as a county and a state chair, I've worked to encourage strong relationships of our grassroots elected leaders and emerging candidates. We've listened, gathered ideas, put those ideas into practice, and everyone has stake in the outcome. I will use my over 25 years in leadership as an educator, a leader in my union, a campaign manager, and as a leader in the Democratic Party to carry us forward to meet the challenges that we will face in the next four years. The DNC secretary provides for the integrity of the records, the roles, the results of the party. I will do that. In these times, it's going to have to be more. That's why I'm proposing that we create tools and opportunities to connect our DNC regions, caucuses, and councils so they can better communicate with each other. I also propose that we create an archive of best practices to build our collective knowledge and experience. The secretary is the practical job on the executive team, and I will have the opportunity to share ideas on how to change and build our party. I propose that the DNC provide and sponsor regional trainings, not only for DNC members, but state, county parties, and activists. As your secretary, I will be available to you and will engage vigorously as a member of the executive team and provide leadership whenever and whatever is needed. Roberta Lang, and I humbly ask for your vote. Thank you very much. And now, Ms. Capril. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Anna Capril, and I serve as the state chair of the Wyoming Democratic Party. I am running to be your next DNC secretary. We need to talk about reforming the DNC and transforming the secretary's office from one that only answers the chair to one that is responsive to the members. We cannot expect that things will go back to normal, and we cannot move forward business as usual. We must transform communication with the Secretary's Office to help rebuild the connections between the Executive Council and members, labor, religious organizations, and allies. Bringing people together will strengthen our party and create a more resilient organization. The Secretary's Office must respect and respond to our members as leaders and as volunteers in service for our common cause by giving them the real access to information they want 
and need to do the work of the party in their communities. Members should be empowered and encouraged to have a voice in planning and organizing. I understand there are challenges when organizing large groups of people, but these challenges can be overcome with open lines of communication and hard work. The Secretary's office should be working closely with the leadership, but always on behalf of the members. The office of the Secretary must be focused on reaching the members and must advocate for the members. In the same way the ASDP chair advocates for members of that group, the Secretary's office must work to ensure members' voices are heard and considered at the highest levels. The DNC is a membership organization, and it's a privilege for us who have been elected to help our party and be a voice for shared values. As volunteers, we've given of our talent, treasure, and lots of time to be here and work for our party. That has to mean something. And we should certainly have someone at the top looking out for us. I am running to be that someone. Our members expect demanding change, change in leadership, and change in strategy. I would be honored to have your support and your vote to work towards that change for the benefit of our organization. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gapriel. <coughs> Finally, Mr. Ray. Well, first, uh, thank all of you for being here, whether in person or uh, watching the live stream, and thanks for all you do for our party. Um, I'm running for secretary to ensure that we do more to engage members and to create a more transparent DNC. It's essential we become more open about how our committee chair of the UPSL and be your support to serve as secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. <laughs> now that we've had the self-introductions, we're going to go to questions for DNC members. We have a microphone here in the front. It'll be walked around if you put your hand up. Get over to ask to these candidates. We have remaining. So, question C members for these candidates. Good morning. Don't think you can hear. Them. How about that? Good morning, everyone. Selena Vasquez from the state of Texas. And my question to each of the candidates for secretary is, give us one that you do in the first 30 days if you are elected. Ms. Lang, why don't you go first? Let me go down the, uh, down the dais. We'll refer to the next one. Sure. Uh, one of the, I think one of my proposals, I'm Roberta Lang, um, was to, to, I think, the roles of the secretary to communicate, but also to allow our members. Uh, we don't location our regions, and I think I'll use the old-fashioned to serves. We create so that they can communicate with all the members of the region with anything and everything that's. But I also think we should do that. For our uh, caucuses and our councils, we can act around the first 30 days. Ms. Capri. My <coughs> first thing that I would do, and, and I know most of us as candidates have uh, taken a look at the DNC roster, which is highly lacking information. Um, so my activity would be to make sure that that DNC roster is full of information that everyone has access to it, that it's not just something that you have to request from the Secretary's office. Mr. Ray. Uh, thanks, Selena, for the question. Uh, one of the things that I would do in 30 days um, is really be the advocate for members with the chair and dates for the rest of the year so that members can participate. I know how it is to sometimes get 60-day notice, if not just a 30-day notice for a chair and foundation advocating right away with it to set meeting dates early so the members can plan around it and participate in the work of the party. All right. Other questions from DNC members? Looks like there's somebody turned up over there. Not a DNC member, okay. These questions are from DNC members specifically. Chris Reeves, Kansas, um, because I don't want you to sit up there with just no questions. Uh, uh, 
Um, I, I know that we have an, an audience here. Um, there are, of course, DNC members here who understand the role of a secretary. But I know probably for the, the people who are coming here wanting to get the Democratic Party or to where our party is going, they might not understand even what the role of the is. And, and so I want to say um, on behalf of so many of the people who want to be involved, if you would take just a minute and try to help explain um, to the members what, what you view this off. Well, why don't we this time since we started with Ms. Lang. So the, the role of the spelled out as the basic part of communication is our, our number one advocates for the DNC. They should be uh, soldiers uh, giving um, if our members don't know what we're doing, there's no way that we can let anybody else. Uh, um, so the, the biggest the would be to make sure that we're messaging we're on who's making decisions, what the strategy is, and, and then keeping the meeting that that there's a clear and transparent uh, uh, and uh, way that we are running our meeting, uh, and everybody has the information necessary. Um, record be uh, available for the National Archives uh, as part of what we do as a political and during national convention gets to all uh, so that we can have a convention is also part of the job. Mr. Ray. Well, Anna summarized it pretty well for all of us, uh, so we won't have to reiterate all of it, but it really is, I think, especially in the role of secretary, um, is really being that advocate for DNC members. They're the front, the, they're the person that interacts with the members on a regular basis that work to plan our DNC meetings, that work to make sure that the roster is kept up to date, that members are informed about what's happening and going on uh, on a regular basis. Um, and I think that's one of the most important pieces of this role is, and I think it's something that we all agree upon, that we need a secretary that's going to be responsive and engaging uh, with fellow members who wants to talk to them about what's happening, who wants to really be their advocate inside the building. Um, and I think know that's something that I'm committed to doing in addition to the role of, of planning our meetings, keeping the, the records, um, certifying the delegates, but I'm really focused on how we can make it a more transparent DNC that is really engaging party leaders in their states so that they can know what's happening. Uh, in my time in Wisconsin, I have issued a report after each DNC meeting for 12 years of what we voted on, what we discussed, what was talked about. Um, and I want to make sure that the Secretary's Office is preparing something like that for fellow members that we can send out, that they can share with their state central committees, with grassroots leaders and activists in their region, so that we can really build back the trust from folks who think that what the DNC does is done behind closed doors. Everything we do is done in an open meeting. Let's make sure we're sharing with people so people know exactly what the DNC is and does. Ms. Lang. Thank you. I'd like to echo everything that's been said. Uh, we know the role of the secretary because it's in our bylaws, but it is so much more about communication. And as I mentioned, look, in the Western region, I'm part of the Western region, we had to create our own group so we could communicate with each other so that we could talk about what resolutions we want to have passed, so we can talk about new business at the DNC. We have to have that kind of communication in every region, and I think it should come out of the secretary's office and I think the DNC should set up um, through the secretary's office those communication groups so that regions can talk to each other. And we, instead of having to pick up the phone call and talk to 50 people in your region, wouldn't it be great to send one message that gets to everybody and those that are interested or have the knowledge could respond? I also think um, having the uh, councils and the coxes on a listserv so they can communicate. If there's an issue that we need to deal with right away and take action, how great it is that we could communicate to all those caucus and council members all at once. Sir. <coughs> yeah. John Patrick, uh, DNC member from Texas. I would like uh, all three of you to uh, respond to how you plan on communicating uh, to, the, to the DNC members and uh, specifically uh, whether there, there might be some talking points uh, for us to uh, address some of the serious issues of the day. Thank All right, you. Mr. Ray, why don't we start with you on that one? Well, perfect. Well, thank you, Mr. Patrick, for your question, and thanks for your, your service to the party. Um, as far as communicating with members, I think, one, it's making sure that it's more than just a daily amplifier with news clips for members. It's about making sure we're sharing relevant information. Our DNC members are the front line. When people know you're a member, 
They expect answers from you. They expect that you know what's happening. And it's about making sure we're providing those resources, making sure that you know daily talking points, making sure you understand decisions that are being made so that you can report out to your constituents and those that support you. Um, so that's the communication you're going to get from me. But it's not just going to be communication around that. It's also going to be me talking to you. During this campaign, I picked up the phone and I've called through the roster of members several times. And I'm going to continue to do that. And I'll do that as elected secretary. It's about a two-way communication as well, though. That if you've got questions or if you need something, that you know you can pick up the phone and you'll get a personal response from me. And that's my commitment for communication, is really making it an open uh, office for uh, serving members. Ms. Lang. So as your secretary, I will ensure that you also get that same kind of communication. I am not sure what DNC members get as opposed to what a chair gets, but I know I must get 50 emails a day from DNC different departments. I'd like to, one of the things I hear from people is they're getting so many emails they don't know which one. So I think we have to figure out a way that we can get back actively to members of DNC. And, um, you know, I believe if you go to the DNC, uh, one situation that someone brought up to me, they did the DNC website, and, and they have to comment that they wanted to have That's really a great tool. I think that's awesome. The very next page, out of the they sent me information. Nobody ever got back to them. But one of the things I think that we need to do in the Secretary's Office and in the communication is make sure people are communicating us communicate Ms. Caprill. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's going to be an opportunity with communications from the Secretary's Office to uh, not just do emails. Uh, I know we're, we, we've all talked about it. Emails. What I'm in my state with is I have a weekly conversation that is going on. Send it on as an email uh, and I'm available for phone calls for everybody. Uh, that, that want to talk about what is going on. We do have a very big state, and we travel around. So, you know, there are opportunities, not just with technology, to be approachable um, and available to members uh, to make sure that the information uh, is uh, We've been looking for information that's on, on, you know, who are the members of the Southern Caucus. It's not posted anywhere in our web. That is not available to the not public at large, but uh, who these folks are in these groups, who the membership is, DNC um, is also uh, things that you have to do and for information instead of having So I, I would definitely to information available to the general um, of Democrats and, uh, and make sure any members that acts in an easy way, not just in to come and review the Secretary's office. Other questions for members? <laughs> Not a DNC member, okay. Sir. We get this is Sheikh Roman from Georgia. Uh, this is going to be a specific Georgia question. We heard this morning the uh, poll and everything else, and uh, we heard a lot about the Georgia. Uh, do we have specific, you know, we're going to 50 state strategy, 3,000 strategy. How we can help individual states such as Georgia or Texas, you know, we're going to be the whole country, 50 states, but I feel state needs some, how are we going to you know, address it? So, so, Ms. Lang, the question is really is to customize your communication strategy for individuals may be on the, becoming more friendly to Democrats. I'm hearing Georgia and as two members. As far as communication, um, the current communication of out to everyone all at once, I will certainly talk about the reason and to discuss what their specific needs are. As part of the executive team of DNC, we would have a conversation with the state and Skype, data, battleground state. We get lots of attention. 
Louisiana, which is a red state, gets no. And I understand we look at and specific give more communication to each of our so that, that there are about each state in win in our elections. Coming from a rural red state, um, this is this is definitely important, and, and one of the reasons we do get overlooked. I mean, we are state. Uh, most votes for that happen happen in my state. Um, so it is. Important me. Um, I do have a rural. I would the DNC as a member of the executive council if I am elected. One of the things I really like to see is to have field managers be trained from that state to work in that state. Uh, for us, we had a budget, we had folks that we wanted to hire for field ready who wanted to come and work. And we certainly did not have um, the members and the staff to be able to do that. Uh, 60 candidates out of 75 legislation love the field organization of them. Um, each county, that's not an opportunity that to have this year, but certainly something I would advocate for in the future. Sure that managers trained in each county from that I know how to talk to the, you know what the what the language is, the location they need to uh, be in, and and that would be a really strategy. Mr. Ray, thanks for your question. Um, you know, for me, the communication to those you know supporting. That I wanted as secretary get away from DC to visit the state party and visit and be there on the during my 12 years as a committee member in Wisconsin state I did 60 different county party a particular Wisconsin where I went to just listen provide an opportunity for to ask questions about to really open a, a two way but so I think I think it starts with that and actually engaging is really you know how and I think there's Two specific things that I think the Secretary's office is The first is around the budget selection process. I actually think the Secretary's office with the Office of <coughs> Partisan and Delegates should create a central clearing uh, for state deadlines to file to run for delegates to help conduct training as the chief of the DNC's youth uh, in both 2012 and 16. One of the things that I did was I actually worked and did specific youth training. We gathered information from state parties. I want to make the secretary's office know how involved. And then I think one secretary's office certifies those delegates, they, they participate in the communication afterwards. It shouldn't be just bringing people together one year and then at the beginning. I think using those lists and for specific Georgia, being able to the people, mobilizing those delegates to take action, mobilizing sharing information. Not just in the DNC members, but we're sharing with a wider group of people. Really understand what's happening. Please bring in in the journey. Okay, we'll take one more question for Secretary Mammon. Hi. Um, things that I notice as I see you all out in the states, um, um, and I think it's great. And obviously, two of you being. In the West, representing the West is good. How do you see your role, or how do you, how do you run your office to be able to be responsive, even not in where the staff would be, but how do you see sort of like that working office working together? Um, so that'd be great. Start with Ms. Caprill on that one, please. Sure. I'm already in a, in a big uh, six hours office. Uh, I'm from our staff and executive director. Um, the biggest thing that we can do for the secretary's office is have a good team. Of, um, I don't think you have to be in an office face to face with somebody all the time to make that, that um, communication is, is being had and that uh, the right message is going out, that, that things are done. Uh, you know, it's the, the higher uh, that that's happening. It happens in my state all the time. Uh, around, I, I don't have to be in right now when it's going on, because I know that they're they're capable, and uh, and it leaves me open to to 
in my different county. So I think that's an opportunity that, especially being out in the West, uh, to bring more of the DNC uh, to people to understand what we, we are volunteers. Uh, we are members of the librarian. I am uh, And when people tell us, it makes a huge who the what it is that we do. So I think being West and in an office in D.C. gives us an opportunity uh, to the party uh, where we are. Mr. Ray. Thanks for the, the question. And I think, you know, in this day and age, technology and communication, you can work anywhere. I'll give you an example. Professionally, I run the Wisconsin Teaching Commerce. It's about started five years ago. So just under 500 different is members, and they the entire state of Wisconsin. My job is to communicate with them on a regular basis, to be information with them. Uh, so it's nothing different than, than doing that. I think with staff that is really that of engaged members and it's responsive. Um, it doesn't matter the secretary. You can always pick. You can actually get a call back. That you'll get an email back. That you can tweet at me. No, knowing that you're going to is the biggest part in instilling uh, in the staff is, is a great making uh, and member centric. Thank you. Uh, great question. A huge state geographic. Not a full chair. Community though to go to different and visit with our technology thing and we can communicate. Technology rather by video. One student party is that members state party. We are attending our central committee meetings. We do two video a year, our best attended meetings of the year. Um, because then we get more input from more people. About right, we want more. In we want more people to be involved. We want more people to be engaged. And so I. I am um, really happy, and look, geographical areas should from anybody can get to the place to do the job. We have airplanes, we have technology, uh, telephone. Uh, as a communicator for the secretary's office, I would ensure we would have that communication all the time. But I'd be where whenever I needed to be there. Side with the chair and the finance chair to help grow our donor base and expand our reach. At the end of the day, this past election was about heart and drive, knocking on the last door in Kentucky or checking across the snowy Iowa cornfield to win the last vote or getting your taxi cab driver to give you $10 because you asked. These are the things I've done and I've been there with you shoulder to shoulder in the trenches, trenches knocking on the doors and making those hard asks. I would be honored to serve you as your treasurer. Strategy, heart, and drive. That's me. Thank you, Ms. Amico. Once again, we're going to take questions from DNC members for these two candidates, Mr. Darrow and Ms. Amico, candidates for treasurer of the DNC. Hands up, we have a microphone. Mr. Maxey, Representative Maxey. Uh, I think this is going to be a theme as we go through both this race, <coughs> race for finance. Um, the, the uh, finance person and then uh, talking about our chair's race. Uh, I hear y'all talking about not just the financial management piece of, of being the treasurer, but also fundraising kinds of things. I think we now have several officers who talk to me about doing financing. How do you see the different officers using the, and more specifically as we saw especially uh, in this last campaign, how much small donor money was raised by presidential campaigns, especially one of those campaigns. What can you do, what do you think we can do to diversify our fundraising so that we build a, a much uh, grander scale of small donor fundraising to support our party? Let's, let's start with Mr. Darrow for this one first. Go to Ms. Amico, we'll reverse order in the next one. Um, well, First of all, 
all, all of the national of the Demo Democratic Party, DNC, need to be closely coordinated in the fundraising effort. You don't want to be stepping on each other and calling the same person. And in, in my business, when we raise money for uh, organizations, we have a very uh, detailed call sheet so we know who's calling whom, who's doing what, to make sure that we're maximizing the relationships. And so that should be happening. Um, the, the officer roles, uh, the treasurer role doesn't call for fundraising per se. It's really Andy Tobias who turned it into a fundraising effort, and we all owe Andy a tremendous gratitude for all of the work he's done for the DNC over the past 18 years. Um, I would see the role of treasurer as three parts in, from my perspective. The first course is making sure that you oversee the money appropriately, the money that comes in, and we invest it well and we use it well so that we aren't wasting money, but we're also getting a good return at the appropriate risk. And I've done that for many, many, many organizations. The second thing, of course, is fundraising making sure that we are expanding our donor base uh, at the high end and at the lower end, the grassroots levels. I firmly believe that we can turn this organization into a membership base. If we had one million of the voters who voted for Hillary Clinton this year, uh, this past election, give $5 a month. So I think that's about 3% of the voters who voted for Clinton. That would be $60 million coming in every single year to fund the Democratic Party. If we got a thousand um, uh, major donors to max out, that would be about $35 million a year. So right there, you could have $100 million a year coming in on a regular basis, as opposed to kind of chasing the shiny object all the time that we have to do, you know, money each time. So if we can transition to a more um, regular, committed, membership-based structure, like the Nature Conservancy, most of the chair, big national charities we know and we see, um, we will ensure a financial stability for the DNC that will we can build upon um, in larger uh, in, in the campaign cycle years. Um, the last part I see of, of the job is really um, helping turn around the organization, and that's what I do for a living. I, I fix companies, nonprofits. Uh, I can tell you a lot of stories about the ones I, I've worked with. Uh, I think you need someone at the table who has done that, who's helped build plans. I think the Democratic Party needs to have a 20-year plan. A two-year plan, a short-term plan to stabilize, but a 20-year plan as to how we're going to go out and rebuild this party across the country. And it, Joyce said it, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. What's going to be needed in Arkansas is different from what's going to be needed in Alaska. We need to talk to the state party chairs and the people. It's obviously going to be money. It will be different kinds of resources. Maybe it's help with digital strategy. Maybe it's help with actual people out there. There were 3 million people who marched last weekend. Let's harness some of those people to get out there in the field in the various states, just like get out the vote day a year basis, just like Nevada. Yeah. Let's make every party a year-round effort in every state. Let's let Ms. Amico get in here. Ma'am. Very good. So empowerment is a really important word in all of this. And from the levels, the chairs of, of each of our parties know what their states need. Making them be part of this plan in being able to broaden our <coughs> horizons and expand our reach is the beginning to how we can uh, build our party financially. Of course, financial management of course financial planning, but that also includes recognizing the state party chairs and what each state needs. Because as much as I have heard around uh, the country from a lot of you, and I would like to protect that because I've been in the state level. I've been working on the state level. I've seen what we need and what doesn't come. And so that plan alone is inclusion. So if I include all of you in part of the process of fixing us and making us whole, that's the approach I'd like to take. Of, you know, overseeing the money, laying out a plan, working with the chair and the finance chair, and by all means, empower each and every member of the Democratic 
party, as a voting member, and as a, uh, as a voting member in this DNC, and as a voting Democrat out there, we all have to help fund. And helping fund, whether it's $2, whether it's $3, whether it's $5, as long as you give, as long as you get to give, it is an inclusive the approach. I'm willing to roll up my sleeves. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to bring us to the top again, because we're going to get there. Another question here in front. Sir. So I'm going to Ms. Amico first, and then Mr. So my name is Chris Reeves. I'm the people who are attending have, um, and I'm going to it a little bit differently. For those who are in, in Phoenix and, and uh, or have communicated with her, uh, we may be aware of Christine Pelosi's proposal that we wean the party away from outsider funding, lobby funding, especially in... in so the question that uh, they had proposed that we asked is, um, th because that's something that's very specific to the way that the position works in the party, is that something... Do you have a position on that issue? And, and where do you and on how the party interacts with those donors. Thank you. Ms. Amico. Outside money is tough. We don't have the White House, we don't have the Senate, and we don't have Congress right now to change Citizens United. We, I 100% with pulling out big money, but that's not the course right now. It takes money to fight the machine. And that what we have to do. So I'm, you know, I Citizens United. I, I love to take it right off the right off the table. But we lost, and now we have to win again, and we have to win by playing. We have let's, to win. Let's please, let's please let her answer. Please let her answer. We have to win. The idea is everybody. We're all Democrats here, right? And it is part of unity. And we need to be one party going forward. And that means recognizing each other's beliefs in all of this. In, we each have different beliefs, but we all come to the same table. And we all vote the same way. And that's what we need to do. So, yes, I would like to take big money out of this, but, but right now it's here because we are going to need Mr. Darrow, uh, we can't fight with arm two hands tied behind our back. We are in a fight for the life and future of this country. And until we get to a level or place in this party where we have recurring funding at the grassroots level on a membership basis that funds this party year in and year out, we're going to need to find more dollars and bigger dollars in the short term. And so um, I think we're going to need to uh, reach in lots of different places. We all have our core values. And the notion that, mm -hmm. that, that um, the members of the DNC or even the leadership is somehow selling out because of taking, uh, the accepting other dollars, I, 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 frankly, I'm, I'm offended at that. You know, I, I'm an Eagle Scout. Um, I was raised to believe in the Democratic Party and the goodness of the Democratic Party and what the Democratic Party stands for. And I think I believe that almost th that everybody here, um, we not, it is revolting to be living in a country where the big dollars do what they do in this country. But you know, they're mostly on the other side. They're mostly on the other side doing horrible things, and we will never win if we let them continue doing that, and we don't raise the money we need to raise. We can transition this party to a grassroots-funded party. It will take time. It's not going to happen overnight. If we don't raise the money, we're going to lose in 18. And we're going to lose in 2020. Yeah. You can't drive a car, unless it's an electric car, without gas in the tank. we got to have gas in the tank. Okay. Another question here in the front. Sir. AJ Durrani, Texas. <clears throat> For the longest period of time, uh, Texas has really been looked upon from the DNC level, the presidential years, as really an ATM. You come here, get the money, and take the money out. <coughs> okay. Now, I understand the difference between the finance chair and the treasurer's chair, but I'd like you to address how exactly are you going to strengthen the state parties, especially state parties like Texas, where you could really have an impact if Texas turns blue, 
definitely the, uh, the game is over for the Republicans. Thank you. Mr. Dara, you first, please. So um, part of my position in running Treasurer is that the finance operation should not be so separate from the operation operation. And actually inside the DNC, my understanding is it's kind of treated as a piggy bank to a, to a certain extent as well, an ATM. Uh, I think the finance operation needs to be integrated with the actual operations of the DNC so that when you're raising money, you're also working strategically with the overall efforts. That same um, approach should be taken to the state. There's, we're talking about Texas, Tennessee, Alaska, or Arizona. Um, we need to be going to the heads of the parties in every state, of the party in every state, and understanding what they need to reintegrate their party. As uh, we heard earlier today, Texas is moving in the right direction. And we need to, organizations are usually having operations across the country. And, you know, a good turnaround is based upon what is needed to fix the operations in various different places. You can't do the same thing for every factory, for every one needs a different uh, and some things might need capital investment, some might need um, to grow the employee base, some may need to get rid of the local management because they're terrible. Um, and th the same, I think, is the case for the parties in the various states. We have to understand what is needed and help. Some states will be a 20-year process. It's not going to be an overnight process. But we need to understand that and build towards that. The fact, when I read that we don't run candidates in elections at the local well, and state level in some states, we just let the Republicans run roughshod. It drives me bananas. What kind of national party is that? We can't let the other side get a free pass in any place at any time. So we need to figure out, in working with the state chairs and the members of the state party, what do you need to rebuild? How do you need to rebuild and bring resources? You know, um, I always, I, I'm Catholic, I was raised Catholic, and I always joke the pastor of a Catholic church has got to be a preacher, a pastor, a fundraiser, a CEO, a real estate manager. Uh, I mean, all these jobs, right? Yeah. And they're not all trained to do all of those jobs. Some are better at other things than other. Same thing is going to be the case. Uh, out in the states. Some state party chairs may be great at fundraising, may not, maybe not great at operations. So we need to help un them w with whatever they need to help make it a success. M Ms. Amigo, the t ATM problem here and elsewhere, what do you do about it? So the key word here is collaboration with the state parties. Okay? And my first thing I want to do is hit the ground running if I win this position, to meet with every state, whether I go to them or they come to me. But I want to facilitate making sure I have an individual personal contact with each and every state party, because that will make us whole again. And I emphasize it uh, in my, my uh, little introduction. The state parties know more about this than anybody at the DNC. We can't go based on the polls anymore. We need to hear what it is on the ground. And the ground needs your <coughs> help. And I'm willing to give that help. Okay. We have time maybe for one or two more from DNC members. Anybody else? Good morning. Good morning again, Selena Vasquez from Texas, and I have a question for both of our candidates. As a Fairview DNC member, I'm very interested in transparency and accountability. So we would love to hear a report on the state of our finances, um, some of you know the general categories of the amount of money raised and where we spent some of our money. Is that something that both of you would commit to? And if we should that with all of the DNC members who then go back and share it with our states. Ms. Amico. <coughs> Absolutely. Transparency in Phoenix at the first meeting. 
um, I was able to go to some uh, of the Western states had uh, their meetings. And uh, the biggest complaint that I heard from everyone there was that you don't know what the money is, where the money is, what the money pl plan is, and transparency is the key uh, for us together to make a plan to help each state on the ground. And so I, w again, I will pledge to you right now that uh, while I 100% believe in transparency, this from a state party level particularly, we also need to be able to protect this transparency so that the other side doesn't see the same things we're seeing. Because we need to be protected. We're at a disadvantage right now, and we all have to feel part of it. So transparency absolutely is the most important thing to you because where is the money? You raise all this money in Texas and then you don't see it because it's not down on the ground. And you don't, you, when you call in to get more help, uh, oh, we sent $43 million to Ohio. Well, wouldn't that have been great if we had spent that $43 million in Texas this last time around? And so uh, from that uh, I, I, I am 100% behind you on the transparency issues. Okay, Mr. Darrow, <coughs> um, if you get a chance to pick this up, uh, my, my second point, sure transparency and communication. So I'm going to have an open door policy. My phone number, my phone number is on my card. Anybody can call me with a question or suggestion. I'm a big believer in, um, in understanding and hearing from uh, out there grassroots ideas because there's often great ideas that come up. Um, I've also committed to have quarterly presentations to the membership on a more detailed basis as to what's going on with, with my materials here. Um, I do that uh, regularly in, in, in my daily job, still information into um, uh, uh, easily digestible uh, formats for people so that they can see what's going on and I have to you know, go through 1,400 pages of filings. Um, that's what, part of what I do every single day, and, and I've already, you know, in my papers here, or my, my materials committed to doing that on a quarterly basis. Uh, the format, figuring that out, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a, a webinar or a, you know, a dial-in uh, uh, electronic media thing, but I absolutely agree with Joyce, the point yep. that, um, you know, we want to get information to the membership on the one hand. The other hand, we don't want to give um, ammunition to the other side. So we have to be careful about, you know, showing them the secret sauce, ultimately, the other side, the Republicans. Got it. Well, I'm being told that we are going to move on to the finance chair uh, uh, forum with our finance chair candidate. Please thank Bill Darrow and Joyce Amico, candidates for treasurer of the DNC. We'll set and be back as quickly as possible. Thank you. Finance Chair of the Democratic National Committee, Henry Munoz III of San Antonio, Texas. Give you the same two minutes we've given everybody else to say a few words and then we'll take questions from DNC members. Ms. Munoz. 
Thank you, Evan, and thank you for doing this this morning. It's a little bit lonely up here, uh, but not so much looking into this audience. Um, I am, uh, it reminds me, actually, I had to tell you, it reminds me of a story, one of the very first places I went a couple of years ago after I was appointed finance chair. Um, I heard somebody talking over here, and they say, you know he's openly gay. And they said, it's worse than that, he's openly Texan. I decided to run for re-election as finance chairman because this is a very dangerous moment, not only for our party, but for our country. It is a time when there needs to be tremendous cultural change within the party. The way that people raise money has changed incredibly, even in the few short years that I've been in this position. When I became when I became finance chairman, I walked in the door of that office in Washington, D.C., and found out that we had over $23 million of debt. I'm proud to say that that doesn't exist anymore. In the four years that I've been in this office, we've raised over $500 million to elect Democrats. It's shameful to say that that still isn't enough. There are incredible challenges, both internal and external, to the guiding principles of electing Democrats to office, from the local office to the national office. And I'd like to just spend one minute talking about what that means. There does need to be greater transparency, a connection between the budget of the DNC that is approved by all, all DNC members and the way that the money is raised. There needs to be a change in culture in the finance department where major donor fundraising talks to digital fundraising, talks to direct mail fundraising, and that doesn't exist today. We need to have the creativity to allow ourselves to fund not only a 50-state strategy, but to allow ourselves to do special projects in expansion states that are on the verge of turning purple. In the stage of finance development and design, we're talking to people all over the country about what has worked in the past and what has not worked. And we need to come together, the state party directors, the state party chairs, in early spring, and have an agreement about the strategies for spending the money that we will raise over the course of the next four years. It is, um, this is a, this is a metaphor standing on the stage alone for the difficulty of this job going forward. This is not a period of time where we will have the glamour of the White House. This is not a period of time where we will be able to offer people a photo line. This is a period of time where we will have each other, where the people who make a difference in the investment of this party going forward to build a sustainable party that is not only dependent upon a presidential cycle, depends upon a conversation between you, the leadership of this party, and the design of a sustainable finance methodology going forward, and have just enough experience to be able to be one of those people who can help lead that. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll use the time that we have remaining between now and the break for lunch for DNC members to ask questions if they have them for Mr. Munoz. I want to answer questions. Gentleman right there. Sir. Uh, John Patrick from Texas. Um, I can tell by the last segment, there is quite a bit of frustration, uh, if you will, about um, the expenditures of money and that uh, as it relates to Texas. Um, huge 
funds were were uh, that did not come back to Texas. And I would like to hear you as a native person, and uh, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that. And um, let's see if we can have some doubt. Be an ATM. Um, that's why I say it, it is not that complicated. What I found over the course of the last couple of years is that there's many people who are willing to donate for specific projects that uh, make a difference. So, for example, I spent time to empower the Latino voice in the United States, and there are donors who would be willing to help raise money for that to continue, to develop leadership, right, to expand opportunities. Uh, we, the executive committee of the DNC needs to make a decision that, that we are will specific projects. That, and we've never been, we've, that is not our policy today. And I think that if we say, if you are willing, for example, to designate funds that will accrue to an expansion state, let's call Texas an expansion state, that will accrue to an expansion state, so that we can do the business of create uh, programs that will develop the next generation of leadership, help us to register voters, and really be on the ground to make a difference in a state like Texas, then um, we'll quit being. Other questions for Mr. Munoz? And by the way, what happens when we don't do that is that the money stops coming to the party and it starts going to super PACs. And, and then you really lose transparency. So I, am, I, I want to be very clear about this. I am a person who believes that we should have both a 50-state policy and funding available for those states that are turning blue, where we need to be involved in developing leadership. We need to be registering people to vote, and we need to be creating sustainability and growth for our party. Representative Maxey. A follow-up to the questions earlier talking about small dollar, donor fundraising. Um, I'm just curious because you used the number that we used, about $500 million, or, or that much money was raised. What, what is the breakdown? Just gross numbers of what percentage of that is what we would call major donor money and how much is percent of that figure is major dollar fundraising but uh, the, the the problem is a cultural problem and it's getting more complex let me explain one of the things I'd like to see I think we need to do a better job of encouraging digital fundraising. It's a relatively new territory, right? It just really, it was President Obama who began the design of that. We need to go through another design of that program. We, major dollar in the building right now, major dollar finance or fundraising is separated from digital finance and fundraising. They need to be connected. What happens when they're not connected is that uh, People who shouldn't be getting, getting certain emails get them. People who should be getting emails don't get them. Many of uh, the donors who give $50 or more are tired of getting an email that says, I'm in trouble, I'm in trouble, send me another $5 before midnight tonight. <laughs> when if we were smart, we would learn a lesson, for example, from Facebook where people are constantly on social media receiving content, right? And so you're looking at, you're seeing videos of our chair candidates, of President Obama, et cetera, so that we're not in the business of creating content in exchange for the encouragement of investment. We're not creating membership in exchange. One of the candidates, I think, who is up here, both of them were talking about this idea of membership, that people are willing to invest in your work and want to be a sustainable investor in your work. Uh, that's what happens when you separate those instead of bringing them 
culture together, working together. So I think we can, I think a party that can raise over a billion dollars during a presidential cycle can change its culture, can decide that it wants to be sustainable, doesn't have to depend on the cycle, efforts together and lead the way once again the way that we did in 2008. Okay, I have a question from some. Um, yes. So, uh, Chris Reeves, Kansas. Um, one of the things that was just brought up is something I cannot agree with more. I, I can't tell you how doomed, you know, somebody's throwing us into a volcano, we're all going to burn alive, you know, you know uh, something like that. And, and I've always been a big believer in positive reinforcement, you know, tell people things can be good, this is the good thing that we're going to do, versus the end of the world is nigh. Um, go is it actually effective to portray the psychological message that says we're all going to die, especially now with Trump in the White House? Or should we start turning to a much more positive, focused message on give to us because we're going to do things? I think we need to tell our story. I, I think we need to say this is who we are. And if you read the emails that we're sending out um, or that our colleagues at the other uh, portions of our democratic infrastructure are sending out, then we're always in crisis. And I'm a believer that if we create cultural content online, tell the story of what we're doing and encourage people to invest in our work, they will. And by um, and you saw it last weekend. I marched with my partner in Washington, D.C. You saw it informally online. And if we simply make that available to the people, people will continue to invest in the work of the DNC. The second part of that is investing. I'm being told we're at time. We have a lunch break. We come back at 1 o'clock with the afternoon forums. Please give Ms. Munoz, your candidate you. for finance, your hand. See you back here after lunch at 1 o'clock to continue the program. Thank you.
Democratic Party, the Harris County Democratic Party as well. Um, and I would also like to acknowledge all of the volunteers and everyone here at TCU, uh, including the uh, security forces that describe an America so dark, so sinister. It was an America that many of us don't know. And honestly, we don't care to know. But if President Trump has his way, barely a week later, on a day we set aside to remember the horrors of the Holocaust, President Trump introduced an official policy discriminating against people based on their religion. Can you believe that? In America, the home of the freedom of religion, on a day that we set aside for the Holocaust, this president has now put us in jeopardy of once again being divided. Day in, day out, from day one, President Trump has erased all discussion about climate change and LGBT rights from the White House website. He's imposed a bigger than ever global gag rule on women's health. And yes, he come after federal employees for just doing their jobs, started to build his wall. One weekend, and already any hope that our new president would show some respect for America's values, for, them, for America's people, for America's laws, that hope is gone. But there's a different hope, a different hope. And we all witnessed what happened a week ago, one day after his inauguration. It was beautiful. And I don't know how many of you participated last weekend. I marched in the streets in Amsterdam. But as I saw, yes, over a half a million Americans marching in Washington, three times more than showed up for the presidential inauguration. A peaceful assembly, a peaceful march, chanting songs of love and pride, determination, and hope. It wasn't about identity politics, it was about unity politics. They filled them all and spilled into the streets. They carried signs that sent a clear message. We will not back down. We will not turn back the clock. We will not remain silent. As Reverend Barber reminded us this morning, we need a new political Pentecost, new tongues, new fire, new wind that inspires a moral movement for justice and equality for all. So our next speaker is no stranger, but working people, a champion for poor people, a champion for ordinary men and women, not just in his beloved Kentucky, but all throughout this country. Governor Bashir and I served on the Victory Task Force for the DNC, and I can tell you he is, he is fighting to break new ground for the Democratic Party, and he will continue to work with the Democratic Party to help us in this rebuilding process. Governor, this is a new day for the Democratic Party. We've heard the media chatter that says that the Democratic Party has no bench, no up and down common talent. I don't believe that's true, Governor. I know that we have so many incredible leaders who are ready to step up, not just at the national level, but those of you who have access to how to run as precinct captains, county captains, state party leaders. We're going to build an unstoppable bench in the coming months and the coming years. And when we win, we're going to move this country forward, and we're going to make sure that our government and our economy work for every American, not just so that work starts today and it starts now. So it's my great honor to introduce a very a wonderful, good public servant, a very good friend, someone who, who I've mentioned 
Jackson has served with distinction and honor in the great state of Kentucky. And while Governor, Governor Bashir announced the expansion of Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act and launched the Kentucky Health Benefit Exchange, giving over a half a million Kentuckians access to health care. He's my friend, our leader, a great voice, a great champion for Democrats and all Americans, Governor Steve Bashir. Thank you very much, Donna. As she mentioned, my name is Steve Bashir. I was governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky from 2007 to 2015, and I'm a Democrat. Now, in case you're wondering, I'm not confessing. I'm a proud Democrat. But at the same time, I'm here to tell you something that you already know. The Democratic Party has lost its way. Let's face it. We've been getting our butts kicked in elections. We've been losing elections around the country that we should win. And as a result, Republicans now are running this country and running many of our states. So it's critical that we as a party understand why this happened, because once we understand it, we can fix it. The good news is that this country needs us. Boy, does it need us now more than ever. Many voters don't realize that yet, but believe me, in the coming months, they will. But the other good news is that our problem lies not with the core beliefs of the Democratic Party. Our core values, our core priorities are as relevant today as they've always been. How do I know that? Because I'm living proof of it. I'm a Democrat who enjoyed considerable election day success in a red rule state. I became an incumbent Republican in 2007 a, an incumbent Republican governor. And then in 2011, I was reelected by even a bigger margin. And as long as I held office, Kentucky Democrats were able to keep control of our state house, holding off the Republican tide despite people and groups like this. In fact, in 2014, the year that Republicans took control of the U.S. Senate, and increased their majority in the U.S. House, the largest since 1928, we came within 200 votes of increasing our margin in the Democratic House in Kentucky. When I left office a little over a year ago, depending upon the poll you look at, my approval rating was anywhere between 57 and 65 percent. That in a state where President Obama had a 30 percent approval rating. That in a state that keeps sitting in Washington, Mitch McConnell and Rand Paul. Look, I'm not an expert in all things political, and I'm not here to tell you that I have all the answers. But I do know how a Democrat can win in a red rural state. And as we come together as a party to select our new leaders and to write a strategy for how we move forward after this year. Our experience in Kentucky is worth looking at. So, what is that experience? How did I do it? How did a Democrat win and remain popular? Well, folks, the reason is really simple. Feelings are as important, if not more important, than just facts on page. Feelings. I proved to the people in Kentucky that I really cared about them and cared about their families, cared about their future. And we did that by spending almost all of our time talking about things that they cared about the most, the things that have kept this party together as a party for years, good jobs for our people, 
educating our kids so that they will have a better life than we have had, health care for everybody, safety in your home and on the streets. We did it by delivering that compelling message in a compelling way and demonstrated in clear terms why democratic leadership was going to make their lives better. Look, we all know the Democratic Party has always been the party that believed deepest in and fought the hardest to protect the economic and political well-being of all American families. That's why we're all in this room. That's the principle that pulls us together. And thanks to the courage and the vision and the efforts of Democrats throughout history has been both visible and reachable for workers, for families, for entrepreneurs, for new arrivals, no matter what their economic background, no matter what their origins. We are the party of growth and opportunity. We, we are the party that respects and fights for personal freedom. We are the party that led the fight for civil rights, for workers' rights, for women's rights, for LGBT rights. We are the party that fights for families. And folks, you look at any poll and it will tell you that the American people, by and large, support the issues that our Democratic Party fights for. So again, the problem does not lie with our beliefs and our core values. Rather, the fault lies in our inability to convey our principles and values to the American people in a concise, precise, and believable way. It lies with our inability to demonstrate the truth of how we are the party that puts people first and whose values and priorities best align with a brighter future for a vast majority of Americans. It lies in our inability to convince the people on a gut level. Let me say that again. On a gut level that we really do care about them. How many of our leaders, how many of us in this room can succinctly and quickly define who we are, what we stand for, what we envision, what we prioritize? Who can say in 10 seconds what it means to be a Democrat and do it in a way that energizes voters? Well, let me tell you something. You can do it. They're for free markets, smaller government, lower taxes, family values, strong defense. And folks, we all know what that really means, but those things sound good, and they appeal to people. Ask a Democrat that question. Five minutes later, we're still talking. <laughs> and voters have either fallen asleep or walked off. We have to consolidate our brand, and we have to message it in a way that convinces people that we're fighting for them. <laughs> fighting for them. Not for a plan, not fighting for a bunch of bullet points, fighting for them. You know, I was told that I was committing political suicide when I made the decision to embrace the Affordable Care Act in Kentucky in a very aggressive way. I did it anyway. I did it anyway. I did it. I did it because it was time to put people over politics. I did it because the ACA is such a powerful tool that would help me make affordable health care coverage available to every single Kentuckian for the first time in our history. I did it because Kentucky's collective health was poor, and both our families and our state were suffering because of it. So we expanded Medicaid and we created the most successful state exchange in the nation. In 18 months, in 18 months, our uninsured rate dropped from over 20% to 7%, the biggest drop in the country. In 18 months, the uncompensated care that providers had to provide for our people dropped from about 25% to less than 5%. Don't tell me this doesn't work. 
It works. About health care reform, and believe me, I talked about it a lot. I made sure that every person who heard me understood that the ACA was directly helping people they knew. You know, the critics talk about the folks that need health care like they're aliens from some distant planet. They're not. They're our friends. They're our neighbors. They're our families. They're people that we sit in the bleachers with on Friday night. We shop in the grocery with them on Saturday. We sit in the pews with them on Sunday. You have to talk about any issue, particularly the Affordable Care Act. I didn't talk about policy. I talked about people, and it worked. Look, I've been out of office a little over a year now. Everywhere I go, every day, somebody comes up to me and thanks me for getting them help. I hear it in the coffee shop, hear it in the bowling alley, the grocery. I was in an elevator going to go up and get in my car, and a young man got on and said, thank you. Sitting in my office late at night when the cleaning crew comes in, and they say thank you. Everywhere I go, strangers come up to me. Governor, let me tell you what you did for my family. Governor, without you, my family would be going bankrupt right now. Folks, that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Helping people. Making their lives better. And that's what people want from their government. So the strategy, as I see it, is that we Democrats at the national level have to get our message together, have to get it succinct and appealing directly to the people of this country about how we're going to make their lives better on every issue, in every speech, and in every political ad, helping people. Now, I realize that there are all sorts of things that the National Party is going to need to be doing, and we're going to be talking about a lot of those in the months ahead. For example, it's time to start winning mayor's races and council races and state races in every state in this country. We learned how to win a presidential race pretty well, but campaigning in 18 states doesn't make you a strong nationwide party that can deliver the goods to the American people. elect governors again and state houses again. It all starts on the local level and we've got to get back to that. Obviously we need to protect the right to vote and we need to build an even stronger farm team. But our biggest concern right now is selling ourselves to the American people. Folks are frustrated out there. Any of them no longer feel that if they work hard and play by the rules, that they're going to get ahead. For them, the American dream is sounding hollow. People don't feel that their needs are being met or that their voices are being heard. And so they feel helpless and they feel hopeless. And in that condition, they're vulnerable to the GOP message of bitterness and fear. We know that, and that's what they do. Donald Trump and the Republicans tap that frustration in what amounts to a change election. This election wasn't about a repudiation of democratic values. It was an expression of voters' discontent for the way that things are, and they wanted change. Americans want leaders who they feel are looking out for them and who will make their lives better in a personal way. And voters will soon realize that Donald Trump's not one of those leaders. <laughs> Nor are the Republicans in Congress who alter Trump's harsh proposals and then proposing even harsher ones, trying to continue to divide the country. And that's where Democrats will need to step in. But just remember this, we cannot step in if we as a party are fighting among ourselves. 
We cannot step in if we as a party are fighting among ourselves. Look, we've got our differences. We differ geographically. You know, Kentucky and West Virginia are nothing like Massachusetts and Vermont, and Arizona's different from Michigan. And we've got issues that we have different positions on. But there is more that unites us than divides us. And this party is going to have, in these dangerous times, we have got to concentrate on some core principles that we all believe in, that are central to the America being a better place to live, and are central to people who live here in America. Because if we can't agree on those basic principles, we don't stand a chance in 2018 or 2020. Folks, there's never been, never been a more important time in our history. We're fighting for the very heart and the very soul of this nation. And to win the hearts and souls of this nation, we've got to regain the confidence of the American people. And do that, we must not only grab their minds, we've got to go out there and grab their hearts. So let's get to it. Thank you. Thank you. Great message, Governor. Wow, thank you so much, Governor. Thank you for your leadership, your wisdom, your insights, and thank you for your contribution to rebuilding the Democratic Party here in my beloved South. I also want to bring greetings from my home state governor, John Bell Edwards, who could not be here, but he supports helping this party going forward. And like Governor Bashir, when he became governor in 2015, he expanded Medicaid for many families in my beloved state. So thank you, Governor John Bell Edwards. Thank you, Governor Terry McCullough of Virginia for your wonderful leadership. And thank you, incoming Governor of North Carolina, a really great American, Roy Cook as well. Looking forward to working with all of our Democratic governors to help us recruit candidates across the South in 2017, 2018. We look forward to working with the Democratic Governors Association as well. It's my great honor to bring forward one of my greatest friends, the congresswoman from this part of the world, Sheila Jackson. <laughs> congresswoman Lee is serving her 11th term as a member of the House of Representatives, where she represents the 18th Congressional District, which is centered here in downtown Houston considered by many of our colleagues and many of us as the voice of reason, Congresswoman Jackson Lee is dedicated to upholding the constitutional rights of all people. She is not just a friend, a mentor, but someone who carries her voice everywhere she goes. So it is a great honor to be here in her district, and thank you, Congresswoman, for helping us to organize this forum today. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. I know she's here. Congresswoman. Come on, sister. Come on, sister. Come on. anyone tell you that Democrats don't know how to raise the roof. Let me thank Governor Bashir as I um, hug him on the back and in the thank him for breathing life into the Affordable Care Act and saving lives in Kentucky. Let's give the governor another big hand. <laughs> Got to do a little personal moment. My child, my daughter is here, a democratically elected member of the Harris County School Board and a fighting standby workers, standby teachers. My daughter, trustee Erica Lee Carter, the mother of my babies. And I almost told her don't show up if she didn't have my twins. But, uh, 
she gets a pardon here today. Let me welcome the Democratic National Committee. We are so excited by your presence. We are honored by your presence. We've been begging for you to come and to see us. We want you to know that we are Ann Richards, we are Ralph Yarbrough. moment, thanking Texas Southern University, Dr. Austin Lane, the Regents, and all of the hospitality, the home of Barbara Jordan, and Mr. Lane, we are Texas Southern strong. And y'all come back now. Well, we look forward to you enjoying yourself. Let me for a moment acknowledge the Dean of the Texas House hear her soon, the Representative Symphonia Thompson. She is my sister and my friend, one of the first persons to support me, and I have been always grateful to her. To the precinct judges and guests that have come, we honor you. But we do so with a great deal of honor to our sister, Dr. Zill, her team, the fighting Donna, the Louisiana woman, who has always put her soul on the table. She has never shrunk away from a fight, and she has always been honest in her intentions. And when they have come after her, we have stood with her because we know that she is nothing but an honest broker, a person who believes in unity, freedom, and justice for all. Thank you, Donna Brazil. You are here for a debate. Just allow me for a few minutes, and I know that the clock is ticking. Let me first honor all of you who have sought election at this time. Let me honor my state chair, who can be counted as part of the visionary. What a peaceful man. What a wonderful man. And to all of you out there, to Chairman Hinojosa, we won Dallas and Antonio, Austin, Belmont, Harris County, the Valley. We took the state in I did not want this day to pass without me loving on Democrats. Please apologize or allow us for the slight inconvenience of the excitement of the Super Bowl, and I'm running in and out. Uh, we Southerners get real excited about things, and uh, we may have offenses, but I want to thank the NFL the Super Bowl host committee and all Houstonians for what they put into this. But Democrats, I call to order the serious business of the Democratic National Committee. I call to order the recognition that at JFK Airport, an Iraqi man who put his life on the line to interpret for our brave men and women, no matter what our position was on the war, I always loved my soldiers who was coming to get a liver treatment for his young child, left the airport in his country with all of the credentials and was up at JFK Airport because someone decided to alter the values of America and what we have done in Homeland Security. Someone's dead left another de destination with all of the credentials and the thing and is stuck in an airport because in the midst of their travel, something called an executive order was signed. A young woman who was sitting with Donna Brazil and myself, and I know that she won't mind me say this, saying this because we're going to have a love affair, a young woman by the name of Jordan said openly, as a student of Texas City University, she has no health insurance and no she cannot get on her mother's health insurance as good as the ACA was with that because the mother is a part-time worker. Unfortunately, she does not live in Kentucky, the state governor of Bershard, but took the expanded Medicaid allowing on everyone to have health insurance. Democrats are called to order the serious business of Democrats. Oh, yes, we adhere to the power of transition peacefully in government. I decided to maintain my peace 
in another capacity on January 20th, and I rejected the concept of boycotting. I was not boycotting. Boycotting is an offensive constructive. I was in an act of conscience. I was a conscientious objector. And I did it peacefully, along with my colleagues. And so here is my message to you as we welcome who is going to be part of the ultimate selection of officers. There will be no pathway in voice. There will be a singular voice that we as members of the House, the Senate, pour into than the Democratic National Committee. We recognize that we can be proud that the largest number of voters or the largest number of persons who voted for Democrats were millenniums. We have no shame. We just have to move them to the point of their rightful status of leadership. They voted for us. They knew what was right. We've got to recognize that the Democratic Party believes in young people. It believes in those of you who claim youth, those of you who are proud to say I'm a granny, those of you who are proud to say I made 100 or 110, like some of my constituents, Ms. Emma, who's 111 years old, took to meet Obama, President Obama, and she was in love. We are everything. We are Asian, we are African American, we are Hispanic, we are Anglo, as we say in Texas, we are cowboys, cowgirls, and we are urban fighters for justice. And we listen to the call that has been called out, the clarion call, that you all want change. I see some of our pioneers coming in, walking down the hall. You need to give them an applause. You don't know their name, but just shout out. They are pioneers. And I respect them and honor them. Do it better than they fight for justice and they are Democrats. So the message is, what are you? You are an answer. You are a social democratic engineer. And so you hear the call for health care, you engineer the success. You hear the call for criminal justice reform and understanding that it means that, yes, there is law and order, but there is justice for those who have been unfairly treated, such as the Central Park Five. That a man who sits in a high place still wants to deny the DNA evidence that frees them. You want to be the one that wants college education that is affordable, and if you're coming back at 65 or 95, you can go to college if you're 19 as well. So, my brothers and sisters, the key for all of us is that it's not them, it's us. It's not him, it's me. And we're going to count on you to be able to pour into what we as Democrats are doing. When Sessions had his hearing, we had a hearing room. The Hispanic Caucus sent their testimony. Cedric Rickman and Booker and John Lewis testified when they would not listen to us on guns, don't look at it frivolous. We sat on the floor of the house 24 hours in the same clothing, and we shall not be moved. Pour into us. As we go forth into these confirmation hearings, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, as led by a call that I made, we were on a conference call on Friday to discern how we will respond to the confirmations of Sessions. DeVos and many others, how we will respond before those confirmations. We call upon you, go back and call your senator to vote no. You're a social justice engineer. Ethers of the infrastructure of our very heart and soul, the DNC. You need to go back, organize your own press conference. Organize your own march. Organize your own tweet effort. Organize your own pouring in to all of what we are trying to do. Give us insight. Help us the next week to call your senators, Republicans and Democrats, to vote no on session. DeVos, Dr. Price. And so, my brothers and sisters, you inspire me, 
but I feel those crawling in the back. <laughs> I feel sounds coming in this direction. When I see you, I get so in love. I just want to be able to pour and continue. But my message is that social justice engineers of democracy cannot be silent, cannot look for who will tell them. They must raise their hand and say, send me. And so when you leave these halls, having been infused by the good words of those running for chair, when you go out to your respective locations, I have just designated you a powerful agent of change. You are going to go out as head or member of the DNC to organize and work with your state and hold everyone in your purview accountable. And I want you to be reminded of my good sister who had the privilege of working on her first statewide campaign. We were sisters to the end. Governor Ann Richards said this, and you should be inspired. We're living in a whole new social and economic order. Are we not in 2017? Oh, I can't hear you. With a whole new set of problems and challenges. Are we not? Old assumptions and old programs are to be torn up. We can't take them anymore. They don't work in a new society. And the more we try to stretch them to make it fit, the more we will be disappointed, and so will our constituents. The more we will be seen as running away from what is reality. My brothers and sisters, I came and I want to say that social justice engineers are beginning to move. They're moving with the mighty power of their faith, but they're moving with the mighty power of a just and fair nation. I call upon you to accept the challenge. Let me see your hands. I want you to say, send me. Send me. Send me. Send me. God bless all of you. Thank you. Yes, the United States of America. Thank you. God bless you all. I could not let our chairwoman not receive a congressional resolution because party politics sometimes is not viewed as service to the nation. You are worthy and you are deserving. This certificate of congressional recognition indicates she is deserving of the commendation, respect, and admiration of the United States Congress. Al Green and Jean Green Two great Democratic members are part of this Congress, and we celebrate Donna Brazil. Thank you, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, and thank, thank your staff and everyone for helping us uh, this weekend. Before I bring back Evan Smith, who will moderate this afternoon's session, I want to also announce Sophronia Thompson, the Congresswoman mentioned, Ross West, and many other remarkable Texas Democrats who have helped us. I would also like to recognize a number of our great candidates uh, who are running, uh, who, who plan to be here today, but have long-standing commitments or led many conflicts. We appreciate their participation in this process and look forward to hearing them in, at our next session uh, in Detroit. So Robert uh, Vincent Branham, who is a candidate for chair, uh, vice chair of candidates, vice chair for civic engagement and voter participation, Carrie Carter Peterson, Melissa Fali, uh, Yasin Taib, uh, as well as uh, our secretary candidate, the current secretary of DNC, Stephanie Rollins Blake. Now, as you all know, um, my final goodbye will come in just a few weeks. It has been a great honor of being chair of the party. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, I've been in a chair twice. So you won't have to see me around in a few weeks, and I'm on my way to go fishing. I have been an intern, I have been a staff person, I have been a campaign manager, and I am grateful to the Democratic Party and to the staff for the Democratic Party. I'm grateful to the donors and all 
of you grassroots leaders out there uh, who helped us throughout the country and heard the call to lead. So thank you so much. I want to say in closing, before I bring back Evan, who will moderate this afternoon's Candidates Forum, uh, we get to hear for candidates for vice chair for community uh, and civic engagement and voter participation. Uh, and then we will hear from candidates for vice chair at large. And our final group will be the candidates for DNC chair. As the first African American woman to serve, I owe a lot to this region. I'm a southerner. I grew up five hours east from here. I believe in this party. I believe in everything we have fought for. I'm emotional now because I had a chance to go and see Barbara Jordan. I had a chance to say thank you once again, this time not in person. But Barbara Jordan knows what our fight has been about. She believed that we could make America as good as his promise. And as Democrats, we have that opportunity to do that starting now. So I'll leave you with some of the best people I've ever worked with. Tough, tenacious, bright leaders who will help us win our future. Please give them your time and, their, and your attention. We will need them in the coming months and the coming years. There's no time in this party to start criticizing someone because of what they did two weeks ago, two years ago. We need every Democrat. We need everybody on the battlefield. We need everybody to come together. We need to stop planning as if we're going to relive a fight 10 years ago, five years ago. A fight is now. Our work is begin right now. You owe it to Barbara Jordan to stand up. You owe it to Fannie Lou Hamer to stand up. You owe it to Lyndon Johnson to stand up and start fighting now. God bless you, Democrats. I love you. Evan Smith, please come take this away. Bye-bye. Good afternoon, my name is Evan Smith. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Texas Tribune. Happy to be here from Austin today. I have the pleasure of moderating both this morning and this afternoon's forums with candidates for various offices at the Democratic National Committee. Pleased to have the opportunity to do it. This morning we had the candidates for secretary and treasurer. We only had one candidate for finance chair. And this afternoon, although there are multiple candidates for the vice chair for civic engagement and voter participation, we only have one of those candidates here with us today, Mr. Chris Reeves of Kansas. We're going to proceed. You're welcome to give him a hand. That's fine. We're going to proceed uh, for this, uh, what I would call a mini forum, as we have one candidate, in the same way that we did with, uh, with Henry Munoz, the candidate for finance chair. We'll give Mr. Reeves an opportunity for two minutes to do a self-introduction and to state the reasons why he's running for this office. We'll take a question from a Democratic National Committee member, and I actually have a question from a member of the audience who wrote it down on a card. And I'm told that we are going to be collecting questions from non nonc members on these papers for the balance of the day, and we will incorporate as well. Let's see if you clap for me at the end of the day. We're going to incorporate as many of them as time and the flow of the conversations for the balance of the day permit. So we'll ask a question of Mr. Reeves from the DNC members. We'll have a question from the page, then we'll move on to reset the stage for the vice chair at large candidates. 11 out of 11 are here today. So please welcome Mr. Chris Reeves of Kansas. Oh, let's make sure. Okay. Um, well, I admit I've had to prepare this three different times because I thought we'd have people up here. This would be a little bit different. So pardon the impromptu. My name is Chris Reeves. I am the DNC committee, one of the DNC committee members from the state of Kansas. I am also the county party chair of Scott County, a beautiful western Kansas county um, that is probably most famous for having far more cows than people. Um, we're population 5,000 county. I'm also a uh, state director for Daily Coast for Kansas and Missouri, or they call it a leader. Uh, that means I've spent most of my time in state houses. 
Um, and I want to tell you a little bit of story about what I see as the role of civic engagement and voter participation. You're going to hear a lot about um, what these jobs are for the party. And I'm going to tell you that for me, civic engagement and voter participation is a bridge between the party and all of you who are in the back. Because in the end, I'm one vote in a voting booth, and you're one vote in a voting booth. And I have to treat every single person as though they matter. Because they matter to us, no matter where they are. And to highlight that, I want to tell a little story while I've got short time. On election day, a lot of people could have chose great places to go. But four days before the election, in the small Kansas community, a bomb threat happened to try and prevent people from going to vote. The FBI arrested people who were trying a white nationalist kind of purge in Garden City, and I went. And that has to be the message of the party. You go where you are needed. You show up when people ask you to show up, no matter where it is. There wasn't a race there. There wasn't a chance we would win there, but there were voters there. When I hear Republicans talk about lesbian farmers, I've met them. I know. Uh, when they talk about how we exist in the country, I tell them that in three years, I put 182,000 miles on three cars traveling between Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. And uh, as some of the people here can tell you, I've come to Texas more than once to try and help candidate recruitment here. We have to be the party that shows up and makes that connection. And I'm hoping that we take this seriously and we start to look at the way that we interact with all of you. The reason why I'm running is simple. I, the most important job I have in my life is to be a good father to my two boys. And my oldest son is a son with mental disabilities. And I can't tell you how painful the election was for some of us. The fear that a parent has for their child is sometimes that they will go for us, but the fear that a parent has for a child with disability is that we will go before them and who will care for them in a world that sometimes doesn't look out for them. We don't address that enough. We don't reach out to those people and tell those stories. So I'm here to try to help tell that story and to work with you and remind you that the role in the party is how hard we work for you and I'm hoping to earn your vote. Thank you. All right. So if you are not with us this morning, let me tell you that we have a section for DNC members. DNC members are asked to uh, ask questions during uh, these forums, and we've got a microphone in the room. And so if a DNC member would like to ask, we'll take one question for Mr. Reeves before we move on to the question from the public. And if nobody has a question, I'm going to very quickly jump to the question from the public. Uh, this question is from Charles Paul of Houston, who asks, what efforts and actions will you take to fight gerrymandering, voter suppression, and other threats to our democracy? So I come from Kansas. Um, and for everyone in America, I would like to welcome you to Kansas 2.0 with uh, Trump in the White House. Um, Kansas is, of course, famous for Chris Kobach, um, who is home of cross-check, voter, flagrant voter suppression methods, and, of course, gerrymanders. But I'm going to tell you something, and this is a story that we don't often hear out of the election. In Kansas, on election day, we had the best night we have had in more than a decade. We picked up more than 13 seats. We won seats districts that hadn't been a Democrat in a very, very long time. And how did we do it? Well, we reached out to our members to make sure that we ran a candidate in every single district. We fought for every piece of ground in Kansas. And we did that because people cannot control where they are born. A Democrat can be in the reddest area of Texas, the reddest area of Kansas, the reddest area of Utah, and they deserve for us to know and for us to say to them that we will fight for them there. So how do we deal with gerrymanders? Well, we force the Republicans to fight everywhere so that the gerrymanders aren't as effective. We make sure that they know that we're going to contest them at every turn 
we're going to pilot the story, and we're going to tell them that they're wrong, and there's someone out there worth fighting for. You know, I, since this is the only question, I'm going to wrap up because I know we're trying to move on. But two years ago, I sat in a room in North Carolina um, with Reverend Barber, who you saw this morning, and I've got to tell you, I'm grateful I'm not following him. Um, but Reverend Barber and Al McShirley and, and Bob Zellner, who are people I consider heroes, um, turned to a few of us in that room and said, if you want to get on the stage, if you want to try and do something, you've got to be willing to put yourself out there. Well, I'm going to tell you that this job within the party has to be the job that puts itself out there. That means that if I hear from Texas or Kentucky or Utah or Alabama, and they say to me, we have an issue in a state house, we have an issue with a race, all we can supply you is a cot and a bowl of ramen, I better be on the road. Because that's what it's going to take. If some of us are willing to fight for this, because there's nothing left for us. I think about my kid every day, and I think, what, what's going to be left if we don't fight for this? And in the end, that's what this is all about. Thank you. My name is Chris Reeves. I'm asking for your vote. Thank you, Mr. Reeves. All right, so that's it for Vice Chair for Civic Engagement and Voter Participation. We're going to take a moment or two and reset the tables out here for the Vice Chair at Large Forum. Please sit tight.
Welcome back. We have 10 candidates for vice chair at large of the Democratic National Committee. Here's how we're going to handle the mechanics of this forum. I'm going to introduce each of them by name and uh, by where they're from. We are then going to go, rather than a minute of self-introduction, we're going to go to questions from the DNC members, and I've got a couple of questions from the public. Instead of having an introduction at one minute per, we're going to have a closing statement for each candidate at one minute per. Let me introduce them to you from my immediate left all the way down the dais. We have Latoya Jones of Washington, D.C. We have Mitch Caesar of Florida. We have Maria Elena Durazo of California. We have Michael Blake of New York. We have Melissa Byrne of Pennsylvania. We have Lorna Johnson of California. Grace Meng of New York. Rick Lasio of, of Colorado, Liz Jaff of Washington, D.C., and finally, Adam Parkamenko of Virginia. Welcome to the candidates. Microphone in front, DNC members here in the first few rows. We're going to go immediately to questions. Hands up, please. Questions for these candidates. Ma'am. So. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> um, my question really is, as a former staffer of the DNC and now DNC member, sometimes it gets a little confusing of what the role of the vice chair are. I mean, technically, it's to be supportive of the actual chair and be there when, when he or she is not available. But what exactly, specifically for you, how will you increase your engagement as a vice chair? Uh, Mr. Blake, why don't we just go to you first on that one. How would you increase your engagement as vice chair? Good to see you already. First of all, good afternoon, everyone. And buenos tardes. First and foremost, the role of the vice chair is to stand up when you see this happen as it relates to what's going on. And what's going on today, because of the executive actions of President Trump, where people are being detained, is a reminder of why we need to speak up and be out there. The question is, will we be the face and the voice of our party to build our party and also be the resistance against Trump? When we think about as vice chair, how do we move from there? Very clearly, we have three specific things we would like to do. Number one, how do we build our bench? We have been losing seats across the country. As a sitting elected official, we want to be focused on how to make sure we recruit candidates to win up and down the ballot, school board, city council, state rep, because we have to make sure we're building our bench in that way. Number two, how do we strengthen our party? Making sure that we can be a vice chair that gets communication out to you as members making sure that we can push back and have media and messaging training and getting you surrogates into your states so you're not finding out about someone two weeks before but two months before. And then thirdly, how do we make sure we're amplifying and embracing our future? Uh, yes, we need an economic message, but you need a vice chair that's going to be out there communicating and saying, we will not give up on our base. Black, Latino, Native American, whites, making sure we're communicating what's happening in our communities. So the role that we are running for is asking to be one of your male Vice chair candidates, as you know, you have the opportunity because of gender equity rules within the DNC to determine who will be your vice chair. And so, given the record that we've had of success in winning in 11 states across this country, given our efforts of mobilizing and representing the most diverse county in America, we are here to stand as a vice chair for you to say we will be here to make sure we build our party, be a part of the resistance against Trump, and make sure we empower our communities across the country. Thank you. Thank you. Please pass the mic down, Ms. Jaff. To go to you next. I want to advise the audience. We have 10 candidates up on this stage. We can have 10 candidates answer every single question. So we're going to try to be as fair in dividing up the time and dividing up the opportunity to get in as possible. I know you'll bear with us, and they've agreed to bear with us as well. Ms. Um, I just want to thank all for asking that question. What's been the most interesting thing to me is as I call through members, some of the members don't know what the vice chair does. Some of the members haven't actually met a vice chair. And what that means is we have to completely rethink how this works. Now, one of the things I did, and I'm running for vice chair for one of the three slots to completely change the role, is we need to define this role. Some people have said ambassadors, some people have said working with the states, we don't know. So I looked up and I wrote it down and I started to share it with communities. Here's what the vice chairs do. I believe that this should be as a member of a board of directors for a Fortune 500 company. You deliver or you step down. You have to do this 
The other major thing we have to look at is the movements. The movements happening outside of the DNC, just as important as what's happening inside. One of the hardest things, one of the hardest things, one of the hardest things about running for this office is people give you advice. You give one message to the members and one message to the people. That's not okay. It should be the same message. So let's be very clear. As a vice chair candidate, I would work with the movements and connect them directly to the state parties. Georgia needs voter protection. We have groups outside that can fund that directly. Texas needs to get county commissioners elected and Harris and county clerks. That's one million dollars. We can raise that directly. We need to tap into these movements. And this doesn't mean trying to inviting them over to all of these meetings. They're not going to come. It means opening up an online platform and providing community activist tools so that everybody has an opportunity to fight for Democrats. So that's what I would do as vice chair. My name's Liz Jaff, and I'm running for one this law. All right, let's take one more. Mr. Raza from California. Please jump in here on the question of what the role of the vice chair is. Well, let me say, I'm a current vice chair. And I didn't wait for anybody to ask me to do anything because as a union organizer, I have already been out there my whole life as a labor activist and a labor union organizer mobilizing voters, mobilizing community to elect Democratic candidates. I've been doing that my whole life. So I didn't wait to be asked to do something. I jumped in to say we need to do a better job of labor and the Democratic Party on the ground electing the most progressive Democrats to office. And you know what? We did it in California. Labor was in California from being purple to being so blue, so blue, we just don't know what to do with all the opportunities that we have defending immigrants, defending unions, defending women. We're out front because labor was in the heart of that change. Labor is in the heart of Nevada. Nevada was the bright blue spot in this country. We and labor are in the heart of that with our sisters and brothers in the community and in the party. And you know what most recent was the new spot? Arizona, Texas, we are changing the South because labor is in the heart of it. I formed and found the Labor Caucus in the DNC. Imagine the history of this party and no Democrat, no Labor Caucus. Shame on us. So we did it. We just did it because we are going to have the most successful Democratic Party and progressive movement in this country when we all join together and labor is again in the heart of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Raza. Um, an audience, an audience question, and Mr. Caesar will go first because you had your hand up and you'll be patient. An audience question, Regina Lovell at, from Spring, Texas asks, what will each candidate do to channel the energy of the women's marches last weekend? Mr. Caesar, address what you do to take the momentum from last weekend and roll it forward. This is an opportunity. We don't have the White House anymore. We don't have control of the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate. It is up to us to seize this opportunity. This is a movement in which we have to join, not control, we have to join. You know, I started out as a young Democrat in college and worked, and worked my way through. Let's let him answer the question, please. Let's we, let him answer the question, please. We have a movement here that is genuine. We need to be part of it, not co-opt it, but be part of it. People are angry. People are unhappy we're in the place we're in. We are in the deepest hole that I can remember in all the years that I am active in the Democratic Party and in all the years I've served on issues, whether civil rights issues, voter issues, and so forth. We need to come up and bring everybody to the table. We have learned that if we don't do that, we can't succeed. So many people were so confident for so long that we couldn't lose this election. And we're all here today. We need to be united with everyone with a seat at the table, everyone with a voice, and that also includes everyone at the DNC itself having a voice of transparency within the DNC as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Meng. 
Ms. Meng, how do you take the energy of last weekend and translate that going forward? Last weekend, as I attended this Women's March in Washington, uh, which was the reason I went to Washington on a Thursday night to prepare for the march, not to attend the inauguration of this president, who because of him, many people, New Yorkers, Americans across the country, are at JFK Airport right now trying to make sure that these Americans, that these green card holders, that a man who served and helped the United States Army for 10 years is not separated from his family. We need to make sure as vice chairs it is all new, the momentum, and not just to make it a moment, but to make sure that it is momentum for the 2017 elections, the 2018 elections, and most importantly the 2020 elections. It is the role and job of our vice chairs and the DNC to provide the infrastructure to make sure that our state parties and candidates on the local level, from the top to the bottom, make sure that they have the infrastructure, uh, financial tools, and resources to be able to uh, run for office and to increase turnout in many states. I have been heartbroken by so many phone calls with many of you from red states to southern states across the country where you have told me that you felt like the party has abandoned you, where candidates running for a local office feel like they have no help from the DNC, where people feel like that they have no uh, sense that there is not enough transparency as to where our resources in the DNC are going towards, whether it's budget, programs, services. I do this on my team. I ask for weekly reports and monthly reports to make sure that we are living up to our standards, that we are that we are providing real results because it is our party's role to make sure that people locally, whether it's the Women's March, whether it's different coalitions, our diverse coalitions that are able to unite and have the tools to be able to resist and to fight this presidency. He, in one week, has created so much chaos, so much harm, and has torn apart our country. And I want to thank all of you for taking the time to host us, to be here today, because you care about our party, you care about our country. Thank you. Okay, and we'll go to Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones, what about the Women's March? First, I want to say thank you to Texas Southern, an amazing HBCU for um, having us today. Yes, HBCUs in the house. So we want to do, I to do three things. Recruit, engage, and train. There were so many women out there who had not heard about the DNC. They had not heard about the Democratic Party. They were just out there to be involved. The problem that we are having is that the Democratic Federation of Women in, uh, LA, in D.C. was not out there talking to them. We have a great organization to get young women involved, but where were they? We had organizations that was there, Planned Parenthood who was there, Emily's List was there, but we were not there. So the very we need to be there. We need to be on the ground talk to these young women and say, why, why are you out here? How can we have the community engagement, the community power, the community revolution to political engagement, political power? That's what we need to do. We need to talk, get these women involved, talk to them, ask them why they're there. And, and then once we ask them, connect them to somebody. Everybody who was there was not from D.C., not from Virginia. So a lot of them were there from Hawaii. They were there from Oklahoma. They were there from all across the state. Te Texas is in the house. You know, we had a bus come up from Georgia. Why don't we talk to them and ask them and connect them back to, back to their state parties, back to their local parties? Because the reality is that we need them more than they need us. Because they're going to be out there marching, fighting, and fighting regardless if we're out there behind them. So we got to, again, we have to recruit them, engage them, and train them. When we do that, we will win. And I actually have a history of doing that. I did that with the College of Democrats of America. I did that with College of Democrats of Georgia. As I said before, when I was at ED of College of Democrats, we went from 50,000 members to 80,000 members in two and a half years. We actually had more HBCU campuses. We had more campuses in the, uh, in the South. We had more campuses in the West. I have a history of doing this. I have a history of talking to young people and talking to women. We can do this, and I know how to do this. Ms. Jones, thank you. Let's have a question from a DNC member, please. Right there, hand in the... One, two, three, fourth row, fifth row. Yes. Thank you. For many years, uh, the Republican National Committee and Republican leaders in Congress were at the heart of every effort to block everything good President Obama tried to do for this nation. What can the DNC do to lead congressional Democrats to make sure that we lead the resistance to what President Trump is going to do to America? 
Mr. Parkamenko, let's go to you on that one first, please. Th thank you for that question. I think we need to start with recognizing that when someone steps up with a good idea or a movement or the first person to use the word resistance, that it's good to work with them. We can't just act like something doesn't exist online. People are stepping up. When I started Ready for Hillary, I founded it with a friend of mine. We laid the first brick, but one of the reasons it worked was because people felt invested. We signed up 4 million supporters, 250,000 contributions, and we did that because people wanted resources to organize with. They wanted lawn signs, which you're always told, to win elections, but it helps morale to get them out in your neighborhood. Stickers, buttons, things like that. It's really important. So I think step up and actually say that we are going to uh, give you in the states the resources you need and stop wasting them on TV. You know, all the money that's been on TV, if we're able to actually invest it locally and organize and actually compete everywhere, Michelle Obama went out there and was talking about five or six votes that we need every single or precinct. Well, naturally, we're going to get those at the top of the ticket if we actually compete everywhere. And if people have the resources they need, they can actually take actions, not only to, to fight the fight that you're talking about, but we're going to have almost 40 governors right up over the next two years, and if we're not out there winning at the bottom, up, it's never going to happen. And just one real quick example, proud to have the support of my home governor, Terry McCullough, He's done a lot of really great things as governor, but if we don't retain that seat this year, we're going to have a lot of problems. And he was able to restore voters' rights. He had one individual who his family said had not smiled in 70 years, and he was so excited to vote in this election. He died five days before the election. His family called Terry and said, Terry, we are so thankful for you because our father died a full citizen of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And we have to keep this going. It starts at the bottom, but we must get ready for this, and it has to happen now. I want to go to Ms. Byrne next. I want to commend the, uh, the candidates so far for keeping their answers reasonably in line with a panel with 10 people on it. Thank you very much. I hope we'll continue that. Ms. Byrne, what about the resistance as the questioner is asking? I'm Melissa Byrne, and I'm running to be vice chair of the resistance. Because the Democratic Party, we need to be the resistance. And we're here in Texas, where you have shown how to be a, re be a part of the resistance. I came here when Wendy Davis was leading the resistance when she put on those pink sneakers and stood in the state house to block attacks on abortion rights. And I got to be here. I got covered in some bruises from your Texas Rangers when they wanted us out of there. But every bruise was worth it because you showed the country that when Republicans show up to take away our rights, we said, well, no. And that is what we are going to do. The member from Maryland asked, what DNC can do, we can clear the way so that way our brave members of Congress, our brave senators, don't have to worry about any reprisals. When they know that we have their back, they can go out there and do the work they need to do. We need to make sure that every senator votes hell no on all the nominations. We need to make sure that every Democrat is introducing good legislation because even if it won't pass, we are showing a vision. We are showing a vision for free college. We are for showing a vision for expanding Social Security. We need to be mailing hammers to our senators and members of Congress so that way when they try to build that wall, we are right there and we are tearing down that wall. So we are the resistance. We are the leaders. And that's what I'm running. And I want all of you out going to airports, pulling our folks in, pulling our neighbors in. We are the resistance and we are going to win. Ms. Byrne, thank you. Mr. Palacio, would you please address the question of the resistance? Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Rick Palacio. I'm chair of the Colorado Democratic Party. I'm a candidate for vice chair of the DNC. Let me tell you what I think we need to do as Democrats and, and uh, the DNC needs to do. We need to afford Donald Trump and these Republicans the same benefits that they afforded President Obama when he was elected eight years ago. We need to be the resistance as Democrats. We need to make sure that we're standing up and opposing all of these nominees that are so bad for our country. We need to be 
make sure that we're standing with our Muslim brothers and sisters. If Donald Trump wants to institute a ban on, on uh, immigrants from Muslim countries, we need to make sure that we're standing with our LGBT brothers and sisters. We need to make sure that we're standing with our working families. We need to make sure that we're standing with our brothers and sisters in labor as well. Because for too long, the Democratic Party has started to grow away from working families and lose our message, our very core beliefs. We need to make sure that we are united. We are hand in glove, working together to make sure that we are uh, talking about the things that are our priorities, which is a success for every single man, woman, and child in this country, that they are able to grow into their God-given right and able to achieve the American dream, because that is who we are as Democrats, and we need to stand with and stand up and stand beside everyone who is out to achieve that dream, and that is the role of our party as Democrats. Mr. Palacio, thank you very much. So I've got another question from a, a, a member of the... A DNC member of the public from A.J. Singh of Houston, Texas. Young people have a key block within the Democratic Party. If elected vice chair, what would you do to organize young people and fund students? Uh, Lorna Johnson, we've not asked you a question yet. Let me ask you to take that question first. How do you motivate the participation of young people in the Democratic Party? Thank you for that question. Well, one of the first things we need to do is to have some funding because it is important that we educate our young people and to get them involved. The millennial clubs, the youth engagement programs, they need to be involved. And I, I will pledge that I will raise $5 million per year for the state party so that we can build from the bottom up because that is definitely needed. We need it to have more education program. We need to get our message straight. We need to be able to touch the young people. They are very talented and they need to feel included in the party. I think Bernie tapped to the young people quite nicely. Thank you. So we, we need to emulate what Bernie did and try to make sure that we can get the attention of the young people. We got to touch the heart and soul of the young people. We got to make them feel included. You got have to make them feel like they are a part of the process and they matter. I met a young man not too long ago, and he said to me, he was telling me how he was very much interested in politics. He was a very smart young man, happened to be white. And he said to me, Lorna, I really appreciate you. You listen to me. Many people I go to, they don't listen to me. They think I'm so young, I have nothing to say. This young man, he was really, really smart. So if we as a party must progress and move on, we must know how to deal with the young people, educate them, bring them in the fold so that they can be our future leaders. Ms. DeRazzo, can I ask you to talk about motivating young people, please, and them involved in the party? You know, for a couple of months leading up to the November election, I'd heard about something that was going on in Phoenix that was quite extraordinary. And I thought, there's no better way to learn about it than to be there myself on the ground. So I spent weeks, months, and then several weeks full time, and I met hundreds of high school students. That's about as young as you can get in the movement. High school students, 14, 15, 16 year olds. Latinos of Mexican descent, many of them undocumented, with African Muslim high school students. Together, they formed an extraordinary movement of youth in Phoenix. They registered tens of thousands of new voters. They walked during the summer in the heat of the day every day. When school started, we'd go pick them up. The or union organizers would go pick them up. They'd meet at the union hall, quickly do their homework, and then they'd walk for two hours every night. You know what moved them was the fact that we were out to create a more just, uh, equal society, and we gave them the freedom to talk about it in their terms. In their terms. We gave them the space to talk about it for themselves. I pretend to speak for them, and nobody else should. So we should not uh, try to speak for anybody, for working people, for women, for gay and lesbian. Let's create the space 
for people to speak for themselves and say it in their words, what we should be saying. And that will capture a lot more voters. And let me just say one more thing. I was very privileged today to meet a group of young people and older who just organized the Marriott Hotel downtown Houston. It now has union representation because there were young people with the olders who stood up to the boss. They organized at the Bush Airport and they won union representation. These voices are powerful because they say it themselves. And so when they want knock on the doors and they talk about why Trump is not good for this country, they speak from the heart. And having been in very tough struggles, they are our most convincing, convincing preaching walkers. Thank you very much. Let me take one more on the question of young people on the party, Ms. Jaff, down toward the other side of the panel. Thank you. So, as a young person in the party, I want to look at our panel. You have a lot of young people and we're all running for office. And the first thing needs to happen is the press needs to talk about that. I went to, and I went to a debate with all the chair candidates. The chair candidates are great. They need to talk to us. We are millennials running to be their vice chairs. We know what young people want. We are the new future of the party. We want to embrace it. So there is such amazing stuff that can happen. But to be honest, run for something, just start. I don't know if you've heard of it, but basically it was a group of Bernie, Hillary, and Obama people got together and put up a Google Doc. 1,500 people under 35 signed up to run for office across every single state. So what do we need to do to get young people involved? They're involved. You need to provide them with resources and training. We need to connect them directly with the states and give them what they need to run. We are involved right now. We need to connect with you right now. You don't need to do anything more to get us fired up. We have never been more fired up. So, so that means that means that in part of this, we need institutional knowledge. We need your passion and your power when you marched for civil rights, when you did the real women's march. We stood up again. Elect us as vice chairs. Let us represent the people and come into this. This is what we're doing, and we're all running for office, and I applaud everyone for that. Great. I want to stay with this question before we go to another DNC question. I want to stay with another question from the non-DNC public that is related to the question of young people in the party. I'm going to ask Mr. Blake first to address this. How do you leverage technology and social media tools to get in front of current Democrats and to get in front of new Democrats? Well, first you have to use technology to actually listen to the people. One, one thing that we're realizing that folks don't feel that we're actually listening to them right now and engaging with them right now. And you can't just organize just through a tweet. You make sure you're knocking on doors and making phone calls and also go from there. That you got to make sure you're staying engaged in that way. If we want to talk about how technology technology has been utilized. Look at what we did throughout 2008 and 2012. In 2012, the Facebook population that we had for President Obama in the first ring of the Facebook population had 95% of those that were on Facebook. What did we then do? Get people to register, get people to vote, get people to knock on doors in that way. But this is a part of an extended conversation going back to the previous conversation. People want to be involved. We have to start listening to what's going on right now and start engaging people in a very real way. So when we talk about the young people that want to be involved in the mobilization that's happening there. The young people believe in our vision. That's why Akila Ensley and John Miller from Young Democrats have endorsed our campaign for the work we've been doing through the new leadership. We want to talk about the mobilization of women. I was out there at the march and mobilizing that way. Sign up and go to the website of the 10 steps we need to do for the next 100 days. We have to make sure that we're staying engaged. Don't just sit and talk about Facebook and Instagram and what you can do in your casual conversations, get out there and demonstrate that you're going to be out there and mobilize and continue to grow from there. That is what we've been doing for the last 12 years and that's what we continue to do. Our friends are sit on the sideline where we have a dog in the White House that is trying to play and talk to folks. I want to make sure that we mobilize in a very real way. That's why close to 100 people have already joined with this candidacy. That's why we're going to start up as a vice chair to mobilize in this way. So technology is one part of this, but we have to listen.
listen to the people and mobilize them there. I want to close by saying this. This is not just an election that has to happen within the DNC. We have to understand that people need us to recognize that the Democratic Party needs a resurgence. We need to be revitalized. We have to mobilize in a very real way. When 80,000 people in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania didn't go out to vote, they didn't vote because we weren't engaging them in a real way. When the people of Florida the states are not engaged in Texas and North Carolina. It's because we're not engaging them and realizing that things are changing on the ground. You want to talk about organizing? We've done organizing all of our lives, but now we have to understand this is a new age and a new form, and that's why we're running this campaign called Leadership for Tomorrow. Ms. Ming, can I ask you to say a word about technology, please, and the new tools of communication? Thank you for that question. I think that technology is something that we have seen, especially in the 2012, uh, 2016 election, uh, become increasingly important. We need to make sure that we are working also with states and state legislations to make sure that our voter registration laws are current and that we are able to make sure that people, including young people, are able to register to vote and to participate in our elections. Uh, and I'm going to piggyback off the previous question a little bit. Uh, I'm a co-founder of a task force in Congress called the Future Forum. We have also recently written a letter to all the DNC chair candidates asking them if and when they are elected to provide a line item in the DNC budget uh, specifically to help target and invest in our youth, in our millennial generation, and also in technology. This is the best way and the most effective and we will need to obviously listen to the millennial generation, to the young people. Many people feel that the Democratic Party is not on their side. They did not feel during this year's election that we were at their kitchen table concerned about their personal economic growth. So however we make sure that we are listening to them, we need to invest in technological resources, especially in terms of field and getting out the vote. That is increasingly important uh, as we see that we did not do a good enough job in the 2016 elections. Thank you. Ms. Byrne, have you say the last word on the question of technology okay. tools before we take another question? As the only Bernie alum up here, um, had to get that in there, we got to do a lot of great work on the campaign connecting technology with young people, and that's because we're able to connect with them on key issues, free college, expanding social security, because yes, young people support social security benefits, don't listen to what those Republicans say, and then getting them to do work offline, because it's really the human contact in system, which is where you build power. So I want to reinvest in making sure that our technology is hitting people where they are, as we're being fueled by strong messages. Um, I would want to use my power as vice chair to really work with DCCC and the DSTC to get them to undo their email program. How many of you have gotten emails about the sky is falling? Give five bucks to Democrats? That's horrible. And it's an embarrassment to our party. So we need to, we need to fix that because we need to make sure all of our electronic communications coming from any part of our party builds us up and doesn't shame us down. And then, Finally, I want to make sure that we get technology to you on the ground. It's very hard. It's, it takes time to set up websites. It takes time to set up email programs. So if you're trying to build strong power in Harris County or build democratic pow power in Carn City, if you don't have the tools to do it, it's hard. So as, this, as the national party, we should be working with companies and working with our vendors to make sure you have that easily. And in closing, I will do whatever is possible to ensure that Democrats do not use tools that empower Republicans. So no more nation builder, no more empowering Trump through technology. Thank you. Let's take another question from a DNC member, please. Gentleman right there. Yes, sir. Clay Middleton from South Carolina. Could you talk about your Southern strategy and how would you and your capacity help with investing in the parts of the South that has been called unwinnable because it happens to be in a particular red state. Great. Ms. Lake, why don't you take that first? How would you get the Democratic Party in front of people in places in the South and elsewhere? I'm sorry, Mr. Caesar, forgive me. Mr. Caesar, how would you get the 
Democrat, I'm trying to be fair. When you get the Democratic Party in front of the people in the South and elsewhere who may not be receptive to the Democratic message at the moment. You know, we in the South have talked a long time. I've been very honored to represent the Southern states on the executive board of the DNC for a little bit. And I kind of came up from the ground up through the party while a simultaneous uh, track on issues. You know, there's a lot of the South that's winnable. You know, we're in Texas. Texas is trending. People are hoping it's going to trend a lot faster. It's doing great in a lot of the counties. We've talked about that today. But there are a lot of areas we need to win. But our strategy also has to be there are a lot of areas we need to lose not so badly. And specifically, and I will take my own Florida, I've been the county chair for a long time in South Florida. That's democratic. That's all about turnout. You know, they always talk about, is this a base vote election or a persuasion election? The answer is, it is always both. It doesn't matter where in the country you are. It is both. You can't win if it's not both. And I'll, I'll point to Florida. We win in South Florida. Central Florida is a swing area. But we lose in North Florida. If we did a little bit better, even though we would not succeed there, our chance of winning there increased. The same goes true for Georgia. The same goes true for North Carolina. The same goes true for all those states. Not only in the South, but the Southern strategy. We used to have one. It was progressive for a time. And then we were the subject of, of very difficult times. The DNC needs to invest in the South. The South is there. It is there to be picked up on. It is there to be gained from. And I hear these complaints every day from the grassroots on up. We have to use this as an opportunity. Listen, I don't like losing to Republicans, but I've done that before. But I don't like losing to this guy, not to this guy. And we have an opportunity. If we don't seize it now in the South, and everywhere in the country, it may be lost forever. This is our opportunity as a party. This is our opportunity from a grassroots perspective up. That's why I've talked about specifically in the South, but across the country, about districting. And a successful example in Florida with fair districts, or even in a bad cycle, we picked up congressional seats and legislative seats. We need to start at the bottom up, the South and everywhere. That's how the bench, that's how you win. We're behind the eight ball. We need to get moving. Thank you. Ms. Jones, let's uh, ask you to talk about your southern state. Win where you don't go. I started out as a college Democrat of Georgia. I got my, I was baptized by fire doing politics in Georgia. And what we did, we had students who were ready to get involved, but the state party didn't have any money, so we went and we knocked on the door of uh, the national party. It's like, you have to give us money to organize. So we organized and we trained. And it wasn't just in Georgia. It was in Mississippi, because I went to Georgia State. So we went to Mississippi. Oh, JSU. We went to Mississippi. We went to places where folks talk to us. We got blue state. We got blue counties in Mississippi and in Texas and Georgia. But you gotta talk to those people. In Boston, for John Kerry's election, we mobilized two buses from Florida and Georgia, and they, those kids drove to Boston to show that they were involved on their own dimes. So that shows commitment, because that's a long bus ride. But them kids are still involved in politics. Well, they're young adults now. But you have to go there. It goes to recruiting, engaging, and training. You have to tell them the South can be winnable. Georgia is just as winnable as North Carolina, but if North Carolina gets more money. Put that same money in Georgia, put that same money in South Carolina. We have to have equal funding. The same money you get in uh, New York that you get, in Cal and you get in California, put that in Georgia. I'm telling you, if you invest in Georgia and Texas and Mississippi, you will, you will win. You don't have to worry about Michigan going the wrong way. You don't have to worry about Philadelphia going the wrong way because the South will rise up. Just like the Falcons going to win the Super Bowl, but the South will rise up. To us. Bring your money down there. Bring your talents. Let me tell you one thing I always do. I always go back home. I'm always doing the training in the South. I go When they say Tory come, I go. Because last thing they're going to say to me is that a Southern girl will go back and take care of her own. When you, if you have me as your vice chair, the South will have representation. Because I'm going to go back and let them know. This girl right here rides for her own. What should you all do to help get uh, Democrats in front of people in the South? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I think the sad part here is that we have to keep asking this question over and over again. Uh, what's interesting to me in this election is that Howard Dean talked a lot about and was viewed, talked about what he was going to do, came in, won, which was the last one of these elections we had, 
and he did it. And then now we look at Howard Dean as the outsider, or the insider, except everybody wants to do what Howard Dean did again. And I think the key here is very simple. And we've got to stick to what the roles are and, and, and the charter is. If you look very closely, at the end of the day, and we saw this in the primary, a charter can do whatever they want. They can say there's going to be three debates. If they don't consult any of the winners that come out of this stage, there's going to be three debates, unless something changes on that front. But the point here, the point here is the DNC needs to be a resource to the states. I see the Georgia chair sitting here in the front row. I'm proud to have his support. I have his support because he saw that I did anything and everything I could for the two and a half months that I was at the DNC to be helpful to Georgia. When we talk about state party partnerships, we're all on board for that, not just for the 50 states, but for D.C., the territory, and abroad. But the key here is, how are we going to raise that money? The election is not until the end of February. We have, election, we have state parties that have no money right now. We have a state party like Kentucky that not only has no money, but went into debt because they decided to double down. And if you look at where some of the wins were, Kansas won more seats than they won in 30 years. They didn't have any of that messaging coming in their state. They didn't have any of those resources. Same thing with Alaska. Alaska took back the House. They had a joint fundraising agreement where over a million dollars came through, and they got to keep $10,000. So it's very simple. State party partnership funding, full-time surrogate program, not just six months out from an election where we provide real surrogates to you all to organize, fundraise, keep the, the checks in the state, and do that all across the board, and don't dictate how the state parties are going to spend out those funds. They know their states. You all know your states better than anyone else. You know your politics in your state. You know how to utilize those resources. You deserve the respect and funding from the DNC that you need in 17 and beyond. And every single officer that's play a role in making sure that we can raise those funds to support the state party partnership. To, uh, to an audience question, a non-DNC member audience question, for Ms. Johnson and then Mr. Palacio from Sherry Tuma of Houston. How many local and state positions over the last eight years? I believe, in fact, it's more than a thousand state legislative positions, governorships, House members, Senate members. And what are you going to do differently to reclaim some of those positions? And how do you make it so that that doesn't happen again over the next eight years? Ms. Johnson. Great question. Great question. One of the first things we must do. Our system is broken, basically. The democratic, the system is broken, and it needs to be refixed, rebuilt. Our infrastructure needs to be re rebuilt, and it must be done from the grassroots up. The problem is the state and local levels have been ignored during non-election years. So it is important, again, for funding. We must have funding so that we can have an all-year-round program, 24-7. It shouldn't only be during the election years, every two or four years, um, senatorial or the, or the presidential race. It should, it should be continuous education training, knocking on doors, educating people, giving them the, the tools that they need and the encouragement that they need to participate in the process. We need a great overhaul. And again, that's what I t why I talked about the importance of having the money. The, the, fifth, the five million dollars that I would try to raise would go directly to the state, um, the state party funding at the local level where people could get that money to, to do all the proper training that is needed. We also need to have transparency and accountability of the funds that we raised. It should not go to major corporation insurance and all that, but we need to educate people again that it's important for state and local legislation. We got to vote, get voted out early so people can vote during those early um, legislative sessions, um, educating people from the ground up, making sure they participate in the city council races, the Senate race, the assemblyman race, the gubernatorial race. It is important again for education and it should be 24 7, not only during the election years. That's how we're going to save. Save, get back the seats and make sure that people get educated, get out and vote for, the peop for those local races. Local is important, not just the national races. So in order for us to get legislative sessions,
and I mean, get all the proper legislators, then we must get out the vote and vote. Local voting is important. Mr. Palacio, same question to you. What do you do about the backslide over the last eight years? More than a thousand positions went from D to R. I, I think this is a, an important question. Um, as a state party chair from a state that's not a blue state, uh, we all know we know too well uh, that the DNC, I think, has lost its focus. Uh, the DNC has turned into a machine by which uh, large sums of money flow through state parties to elect a president every four years. And what we need to do is is uh, get back to a point where we are rebuilding and building up our state parties and focusing on our state legislative races, on our gubernatorial elections, on our county commissions, on our county sheriffs, all of the races that we have lost so much focus on as a national party because we're so focused on just electing a president every four years. In order to do that, once we strengthen our parties, then we can empower them to go out and recruit these local candidates. I think it's unacceptable for any state to have candidates, Republican candidates, that go unchallenged by Democrats at any level of government. We need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to recruit, even if it's a solid red county or solid red district, our Democrats need to have a voice. They need to have someone to vote for at, at election time that is a Democrat that is, is championing their voices. And once we, once we recruit them, we can't just leave them out uh, to, to dry. We need to make sure that as a DC, we're working with the State Association of Democratic Chairs to train these candidates as well. They need to know what it takes to run a campaign. Just basic campaign 101 is all these campaigns need in order to be successful in these local races across the country. So, again, make sure that we are refocusing on, on building our state parties. This party has got to be more than just a top-down approach. We have to, if we're going to grow, we're going to grow from the inside out, not from the top down. Ms. Meng, why don't you also tackle that one as the last one on this particular question about the thousand plus positions that have gone from D to R over the last eight years? Uh, I do want to echo the, uh, the what many of my colleagues up here have said already. It's incredibly important, and I, as I've talked to many people, uh, for so many seats where local candidates are running and they feel like they have virtually no support, whether it's campaign know how or whether it's financial uh, and fundraising help. I started an organization called At the Table, where I uh, provide financial help and help raise money, uh, but also help, uh, help to get organizations to help train these candidates. So candidates from underrepresented communities, Latino candidates, African American, Asian American, the Muslim community is very important now. We need to make sure that their voices are heard. LGBT candidates, and most importantly to me as a woman, uh, when I first ran for office, I ran as a surgeon, and I had I ran against an incumbent, and I felt like that I had no tools uh, from our party to be able to help me uh, run for office, and I had nowhere to turn. So we need to make sure that we're giving resources to our state parties to make sure that when a Democrat, maybe a millennial, maybe a woman who wants to run for a local office, understands uh, how to do it and how to succeed, but most importantly, when we have Democrats run at the local levels, we boost up turnout uh, from Democrats, uh, which in turn will help us up the ballot and statewide. And as we build towards uh, reform and our, one of our biggest challenges, which is redistricting, uh, 2017 and 2018 is very important, and we have to make uh, important strides if we even want to begin to tackle the a topic of the 2020 presidential election. Okay, let's go to a DNC member for question. I understand we have one. Okay, so, yes. So I'm, I'm not always good with 140 characters, so I hope I don't botch for someone. Primaries caucus confusing. How to make less confusing? Question mark. Uh, what can we do to help make uh, people understand the primaries and caucuses, I think is what they're asking. And let's just broaden it. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative here. What kind of reforms are necessary in the caucus and primary process? Caucuses versus primaries, closed primaries versus open primaries. Jeff, you first. Oh, this is close to my heart, and actually, 
uh, Grace just mentioned it. One of the things we do is we don't provide tools, resources, or data for Democrats challenging Democrats in a primary. This is a very interesting situation, right? Because obviously we want, we want strong Democrats, but we also want more people to run for office and follow that. And now what happens is we're closing off that information, that data, and so people get upset and they move away from the party. We cannot let that happen anymore. We need to provide to any Democrat all the resources and tools they need if they want to run for office. Because otherwise, we're going to lose them. So now, when you ask that question, what can we do to open up primaries? Well, first off, we need to make that information a lot clearer. Because you can go onto any state site, and I can tell you right now, I have no idea how they work sometimes. I don't know if I'm voting at a certain point. I don't know who's running. I don't know how to apply. Different states, you need different steps. You can crowdsource all that information. You can scrape it. It's called the basic API. We can do this, right? This is all about crowdsourcing information. Then we need to make those tools very specific. Then Flippable had a great idea. Facebook needs to let you know in your location, primary elections coming up, go vote. It shouldn't just be for presidentials. If these are great ideas that are coming up right now. So when we talk about opening up the process, and I think everybody here is amazing, but we need to be very specific with the details. You guys are asking us how, we need to explain how. So what I would do is I would create a full-blown website, scrape the APA, crowdsource the coding, and say, okay, let's get every single state, party, county, city. How can you apply to be a precinct captain or a committee member or a DNC member, right? They need to know this information so they can apply. We have the technology and can do this right now. And there are hundreds and thousands of people who want to do it. And to be very clear, and I want to just go through this, when it comes to primaries and it comes to providing tools, competition makes us better. Competition makes us stronger. And if we don't let more people challenge and get the best person on the ballot, we are going to lose. So that's how we need to open up. Mr. Blake, and this time I do mean to come to you. Mr. Blake, reform of the primary process, however you choose to answer that question. Well, well first, when we, we're talking about reforming the process, we have to make it easier for, for everyone to be able to vote. And uh, if we get serious about this, there are many communities of color, many women, many millennials that are finding it difficult to get, be, be, a, be a part of the process. We can't continue to sit silently by while we have restrictive policies that are on the books. But on top of that, we should be supporting open primaries. Anyone that wants to vote should be able to vote. It doesn't make sense to me that if someone is trying to be Democrat and be out there that we would ever be opposed to that. Many times we seem to be afraid of opposition because we're afraid of change. Well, you should welcome change. You should embrace change because it makes us a better party and it will lead to more people being excited and being engaged in that way. But when we talk about other reforms that we have to make sure that we're implementing and have to get serious about, and it goes back to the previous question as well, we have to be a party that's welcoming of more people to be a part of the process in the first place. So don't just talk to the black and Latino and the Native American community, LGBT community two weeks before an election. Engage all of the time. Don't just talk to labor when you want someone to stand on the picket line. Talk to labor all of the time. Don't just talk to women when it comes to a women's march. Stand up for women all of the time. Don't just talk to me about marriage equality occasionally. Fight for things all of the time. So when we talk about implementing the reforms, let's look at the track record of what we have done about those reforms. Number one, what have we done to make sure that we recruited more people to actually get involved in office? We talked about how to make sure more people were elected to office. I encourage that. That's why I'm a 34-year-old member who has been elected and re-elected to represent the most diverse county in the country, in the Bronx, New York, where we say often, over and over again, I can't just talk to you about being about it. You have to be a part of the process yourself. So let's train and show how you raise money and how you knock on doors and how you have messaging in that way. Number two, when we talk about reform, we have to make the process easier. The fact that DNC members may not know the rules or understand the rules has to make it easier for everyone. All of you should know how this election process is happening. We shouldn't just be operating in the sidelines and the shadows, but making sure we're transparent in the information. Lastly, but making sure about the reform and going back into how we tied us all together. We have to be a party that understands the consequences of this election. This is not the leadership for a presidential election. This is understanding that you have gubernatorial elections in New Jersey and Virginia this year. You have municipal races happening this year. You have midterms in 2018. And 20, when we talk about the census and redistricting, someone who is a current state legislator, 
I think about this every single day. You want to make it easier for the Democrats to be successful? Then let's make the lines fairer so we actually have a chance to fight in the first place. So those are the reforms we have to be working on on all the aspects. I have been that for my last 12 years, and I will do that the next four if you give me a chance to be your vice chair. Thank you. Mr. Caesar, please address the question of the primary versus caucus question, uh, th th that issue, uh, and anything else related gives people means to participate in those processes. You know, we as a party are at a crossroads. I think we all know that. I think that's why we're all here today. We as a party have to search ourselves to decide whether primaries are the way to go, caucuses are the way to go, a combination is the way to go. The DNC itself not the officers, the DNC itself, and Democrats across the country need to make a joint decision on that. There needs to be input, and we have to decide where we go from here. The last eight years, we had a Democrat in the White House. A lot made for us. There is no Democrat now, and that's why we're all up here. We're up here to talk about things we can do to try to make this a more viable party. I want to harken back just very slightly to, the, to a previous comment from the previous question. When I referred to districting, and that's the way we have to go. We have to go back. We're way behind the eight ball. We have to build a bench. I mentioned the Florida example of fair districts in which we went and won a referendum, forced the Republican legislature to come up with districts that were still terrible, just not as terrible. And we did pretty well in Florida in a bad year. These are all part of the same table, the, the, the kitchen table discussions, whether it's to use districting, which I am telling you now is a key plank in our success in the future. The Republicans are 10 years ahead of us on this. We need to catch up, and now we have an opportunity. The question is, do we blow that window of opportunity? But on the other question of districting, and how we are going to govern ourselves. That's for discussion now. That's from input to everybody and everyone on the DNC, not just the folks up here, need to search their hearts and souls and say, what is the best, most expansive, but the most intelligent way to go forward? So we as a party have, are inclusive and transparent, which sometimes, sometimes we've been accused of not being. Thank you. So, so that's actually a good point. And it raised, it's come up redistricting. Mr. Uh, Caesar is coming up in a couple of years, and so we have an audience question from Pamela Jenkins of Pearland on this very subject. How can we get involved? And by we, I'm going to interpret it to be the DNC institutionally and people out in the in the audience and not regular folk in the redistricting process in the early planning stages to ensure that the party has a leg up going into the next cycle. Let me start with Mr. Parkamenko on that, come back to Ms. Jones, and then uh, Ms. DeRazzo. Mr. Parkamenko, what, what should the party be doing, what should individuals be doing to prepare for the next round of redistricting? Well, thank you for that question. I think it's a question that probably most people in this room don't have the answer to, and most people online that reach out to us don't have the answer to, uh, because we need to make sure that the DNC provides that information. One thing that we had after this devastating presidential loss was a huge void and in many places it was not able to be filled because there weren't actions to take people didn't know where to go so when you see the women's march which was founded by a woman named bob in in new york city she did that on her own she started her facebook page and and she filled this void so if you want to get involved in redistricting this comes down to a lot of the things that we've already talked about which is we have to compete everywhere we have to help candidates have a process to get involved, to find their local committees, to have a, the resources they need to run, and it, it starts there. If we're going to actually be able to uh, be in a place to win back these governorships and take over these governorships that are held by Republicans, I think, you know, it, it's great that we're going to have a vote at the end of February for this, but the fact is we're going to end up being heading into almost third quarter, and there's no actions for people to take unless they're out there looking for them themselves or they're starting groups on their own. So I think the DNC needs to do a better job moving of aligning with organizations. You don't always have to recreate the wheel. There's a lot of things out there. And, there, and there's two things that I want to touch on this. 
Um, we talked about sort of how the party got to where it is. And I love President Obama. I think he was a great president. But we cannot have an outside party apparatus again. We need to build up the states. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about the work that OFA did and un unintended consequences. But moving forward, the DNC can step up and lead. And we can, the DNC is not dead. We won back seats in the House. We won back seats in the Senate. We won, won back more chambers. And there are a lot of wins. And that was without the resources that people needed. We can make it easier for people to figure out how to get involved. And the second thing is, just on this question about uh, primaries and caucuses, which is always a subject that comes up, and there's differing opinions depending on what state you're in, I think we have a really unique opportunity moving forward, coming out of Atlanta, with the Unity Commission. This is something that everybody should be involved in. It's something that we can talk about everything in. And, you know, I, I heard someone in the back shout in terms of the three debates. I would love to see Hillary debate 20 times. And she's a great debater. I'm proud of my work with her. And I don't think we should ever cede the airwaves to Republicans. And that's something where I think we've got a great group of candidates running for chair. And it sounds like they've all committed to working with whomever is elected officer. But this is on us. We've all got to come together. And I hope everyone in this room will participate in the Unity Commission and talk about things like primaries, caucuses, and how we can make sure that we are all part of not only the next presidential, but how we can make sure that people have tangible actions to take and they're easy to find. Because we can sit up here and we can say that we can make updates on the website and we can do this and we can do that. But the fact is, with the Women's March, there was a lot of information lost in that process. They collected some information, and I, I've made a couple recommendations moving forward. If you're running for president, all right, you're making a pledge and you're signing a pledge that you, win or lose, are going to provide all of your campaign data, not only to the DNC when your campaign is over, but if you sign up 60,000 people in Texas, the Texas party is getting a copy of that data. And the second thing is, we can never, we can never, the DNC has three or four simple things in its, in its uh, rules and charter. Conventions, presidentials, and supporting state parties and local parties. If you're coming to work at the DNC in the next administration, I think you should take a pledge that you're not bailing out of that building come 2018 or 2020 because we're going to run to win, but we need to be ready to go for whatever happens after any election day. Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Parker Menko was referring to the outside efforts on redistricting President Obama Attorney General Holder. This is the stuff you're talking about? I'm, I'm going back to him a little bit more. I think we look at where we're at. We won two great presidential elections for President Obama, but at the same time, the DNC fell apart, and there's very little left. Let, let, me go to, let me go to Ms. Jones on that. What does the DNC need to be doing proactively to get out ahead of redistricting and to, and to give members the motivation to participate in this process on the front end? What we need to do is go back and pull back the curtain and show that redistricting, when done wrong, is a, is a tool of voter suppression. It does. It packs people in one district and it minimizes their vote. If we put that apart as a vote suppression and make sure people understand what's happening, that's, that gives them information so they can get involved. When, when, I was, when I was in June, when I first started organizing, we were doing a voter um, redistricting campaign. And what we did is we went to the college campus, we went to the, uh, to the college campus, we went to the uh, elderly home, and we talked to people and tell them this is happening. So what's happening is that they're trying to pack you in all one district. So that means that you want to have a black congressman. There's only one black congressman out of 12 congressmen in this area. We can't do that any longer. We have to let the people know what's happening. And that means being transparent. That means letting them know. Under Governor Dean's 50-state strategy, there was a state PP, the state partnership program. They, they had to make sure that the state parties were all talking in one voice. This is happening with we this is how you talk to on a local level. This is, this is what you do. We got away from that. We have to go back and start telling people, this is how you talk to people about redistricting. It cannot be you no know, 50 million words in, in, in a small type. It has to be, this is, what, this is how it's going to work. Talk to people how, how they understand it. We just want simple. This is what's happening. This is how it's going to affect you. If you don't get out there and go to the hearings, then you, your voice will be minimized. You will not, it will not matter anymore. Our people are active when we talk to them. Tell them why redistricting matters. Tell them this is another way of them to steal your vote. So be before you can even worry about voter ID law, it doesn't matter because right now everybody in the same district, and you, you're going to have the same congressman, and your district is going to be half the state. 
we do that, it's on, it's on us to go into the state and talk to them early. Why are we not talking to them now about redistricting? Like, well, we know that's happening. We know the census is happening. Why are we not doing it now? This is voter suppression, and if it's done wrong, we will continue to lose. And we, when we lose our communities, and we can no longer do that. Mr. Razo, what should the DNC do about redistricting? Well, in California, we had a, an experience which I think that many of the electeds were worried about, and that was uh, a form of a citizen's commission. Um, and the non-electeds having a lot to say about what the districts were going to look like at the local, the county, and the state level. And frankly, it turned out to be a good process. I think that when we get the people involved in an organized way by communities, that we get a very rational way of cutting up our districts and electing people uh, and, and be very rational, very reasonable way of electing. But I do think that what the sister was saying is, what's at stake? Why should people care about what um, the redistricting is? And I think it goes back to, we can deal with these rules, we got to prepare people way in advance, but I keep going back to the issue of why do, why do voters think there's anything important about it? What are we as Democrats talking about? What are our elected talking about? And if we expect people to respond when there's a call for redistricting or any other issue, why should those voters care if those Democrat electeds have not stood up for our community? Too many Democrats have a D behind their name and they do not stand for democratic values and democratic principles. And I'll tell you, I get really, really tired of having to defend a candidate who has not for raising the minimum wage. I get tired of a candidate who did not stand with us when we said the trade deals and NAFTA and TPP were no good for working people in this country. I get real tired when they don't stand in front, in front and defend women, and defend immigrants, and defend undocumented communities in this country, Muslims. So you know what? If I get tired of it, what about the voters? What about the voters? And so you know what? If we can deal with these other rules and changes and how to split our districts and how to do it in a rational way, but I'll tell you one thing. We have got to stop protecting those candidates, those elected officials that do not live up to the principles and the values of the Democratic Party, get them out of office. We should be the first ones saying, get them out of office. Okay, so we're going to go to one, um, one last audience question before we go to closing. Seven of you have had three questions. The remaining three have had two, and you're going to get the opportunity now, and then we're going to go to one-minute closing uh, questions. And that question has to do with organizing and training at the local level. Now that the election is over, the questioner Robin Porter of Houston asks, what can we, regular people, do at the local level on organizing and training to get people into the process in advance of the next election? Ms. Byrne, you first. Well, it's great. I'm an organizer, so it's a perfect question for me. So right now, what you can do today at the local level is you can okay. knock a door. You can build a community, have 10 of your friends come over, talk ahead of time why you care about what are the issues that are important in your community, and go hit 20 doors apiece and talk to people. Start learning about what's happening in your community. You should be able to call somebody in your state party and say, we want a training in our county, and set up a training to happen, so that way you can plan out. One thing that we talk about in elections is you work backwards. So this is election day and you make your plan backwards. So you can do that now so you can have all the benchmarks of what you need to accomplish figured out today. You don't need to wait for the campaign to show up to get you to work. You can start working now and then when campaigns show up, you can build a relationship with those campaigners because the campaigners are in it for the right reasons and if they have local communities are already engaged and are already organizing, that means you can start making their work becomes magnitudes of order better. 
you can start fundraising on your own. You can start raising the money. We have a great tool called Act Blue. So set up a PAC in your community if you don't have one for, um, like for the Austin Democrats. Do you have Act Blue? Get that set up. Start raising the money so that way maybe you can even turn on an organizer part time, full time. We do need to make sure that all Democrats are paying their interns 15 an hour. No more unpaid internships. And you can also, with organizing, work with your communities. Because Black Lives Matter, and you should be working with the local groups in your community that are working on Black Lives Matter. And the same with groups that are working for undocumented immigrants, or working to protect abortion rights, or working on all of the issues that we don't mention, but we do know that are important. And so that's what you can start doing. And there's, you don't need to wait for somebody to tell you to get to work. Right. You just have to start doing the work. Because there's no such thing as, it's not about innovation. We can sit up here and say, we're going to innovate, we're going to build this great tool, we're going to do this or do that. None of that matters if you don't do the work. And we all need to do the work. Are you going to raise your hand right now and say you will start organizing right now in your community? So who's going to start organizing? Are we all going to start organizing and win for Democrats? Mr. Palacio. What can be done at the local level to uh, motivate organizing, training, and all that in advance sure. of the next so, so we're doing this in Colorado right now. Let me tell you what, what we saw and what my experience has been. Um, people in presidential years, they come in and they volunteer for the presidential campaign, uh, and then they go home and there's nothing else to do after that. And we are not tapping into that talent. So in Colorado, we instituted an organizer program. Some of our amazing organizers we kept on staff, and they're now our organizers for the entire State. We have 64 counties in the state. We only have three organizers. The three organizers are dividing the state into three, and they're right now having community engagement meetings. And at these community engagement meetings, they are, are making sure that uh, people know what they can do next. They're finding out what their, their interests are. Um, they're encouraging them to run for county uh, party office, for state party office, for things that they didn't even know existed because they've not necessarily been involved in the DNC or the state party or their county parties before. So they're, they're uh, making sure that they understand that there are options there. Then they're also encouraging them to run for office. So all of these great people that volunteered on the campaign are perfect candidates to run for public office. So they're presenting them with a, a list of all of the uh, open offices that are in their community, whether they a school board, whether they be city council, whether they be county commission, so that it's right there and they could see what the perfect fit is uh, for them. And then they're asking people that may not run for, want to run for something, do something simple. They make telephone calls and write letters to their local elected officials, their national uh, elected officials, uh, so that they could encourage them to vote no on these terrible nominees or to encourage them or give them words of thanks for standing up for their democratic values. And then uh, the, the last piece is encouraging people to do something simple like have a house party. Invite their friends and their neighborhood uh, uh, organizations uh, to, to come in, to join them, and then start to spread the word. So there are a lot of things uh, that we do uh, as, as everyday uh, people in our communities to get involved and to fight back. And community engagement meetings is what, how we're doing in Colorado. And I would encourage all of my state party chairs to do the same in their home states. Very good. Ms. Johnson. Well, I guess, uh, thank you. It's well, well said. Um, for myself, I have a facility where I have people coming in. Can you hear me? Yep. People coming into the facility where they have access and information about how they can get engaged. So the small party, small groups is a great, great way of um, educating people to be um, in the long-term sustainable engagement, not just when during the election years, but engage them early so that they will continue to, to, to work with you. You touch people, feel people, let them feel like you want them to be involved. They're going to be there for, for you during the long haul. So you want to make sure that you're giving them the right information that they need so that they can organize themselves, know when to speak out, um, Communicate well with their state leaders, um, get out the vote, make sure that they're voting for state legislators, for their, Cong for their local senators, and making sure they have a stake in the, in the party. In terms of um, 
promoting um, transparency also is a, is a good thing. You want to educate people to make sure they understand how the party works. A lot of times people don't know how the party works. So it is important for us to get them involved early so that you can teach them how it works and make sure that they can get involved. Mr. Johnson, thank you. So that concludes the questions from both the DNC members and from the non-DNC member audience members. We're now going to go to one minute closing statements. We are going to start with Ms. Jones, again by prearrangement, lots were drawn, and then with Mr. Parker Mank. I implore all of you, please, is be as respectful of the one minute guidance as you possibly can. Ms. Jones, you first. I'm on, I started by thanking TSU. I'm going to end by thanking TSU. This is an amazing campus. Thank you all for having us. I am running. Yeah. Um, we have a connection issue. We're not connecting with blue collar workers, young people, grassroots activists, and people in the South, and people of color. These constituencies were a reliable voting block for us, but we're losing them. And we will continue to lose them if we don't listen to their concerns and frustrations. A lot of people feel like we are taking them for granted. The people of color feel like they come around them. Most likely, two, two Sundays before the election. We can no longer do We won these groups in 2006, 2008, and 2012. And we moved the needle in the South. We can do it again. That takes us coming together. It takes us working together. It takes us getting our behinds and actually start talking to people and asking them what they need, what they want, and hear them. Not just, not just listening to them, but hear what they're saying. I know this because I've done this work. I start, I, I keep going back to Georgia because that's where I was born. And I understand I was born in this politics game in Georgia. And I keep going back to that because in Georgia we moved the needle. I have worked with young people, people of color, women, and, and rural communities across 42 states. I have done this work. I have managed campaigns. I have set up programs to actually talk to these people. I have a proven track record of doing this. If you want to know more about what I'm doing, please visit my platform. But understand, I have done this. And we can I can continue to do this. And we can win if we start talking to these people. We can bring them back to the table. We can bring them back to be Democrats again. We can train them. We can engage them. We we'll can have them running minute. for office. Oh, I'm about to go. I'm 22 sorry. seconds. So oh, well, actually, you're I, over 22 oh, I'm going seconds. To, okay, so go to my website. Please vote for me. Please come talk to me. Latoya Jones with DNC Vice Chair. Thank you. Very good. The, the DNC has helpfully put a clock up here in front of you. That's okay. So you all can look at it, and I'm going to try to be a good cop as opposed to a bad cop. But I may have to be a bad cop. Go ahead, Mr. Cease. I began my activity many years ago as a young Democrat in college. I worked my way up from the bottom, eventually becoming county chair in South Florida, state chair in my service on the DNC. I've done everything from raise money over the years, to organize, to run campaigns, to do media, which I still do quite a bit of now, to putting together different groups on issues, to being active in civil rights cases. I was one of the originators of the Florida presidential recount of 2000 to chasing voter suppression cases, which I'm very proud to say. I drew the ire of Rush Limbaugh several times by name. That's like a resume line. And I've devoted my whole life to issues and to the party and making those two things meld together so for the things that we all believe in can come, on, can come true. We're under attack now like never before. I have the time to devote, frankly, my kids are older and gone. I have the time to devote to these issues and devote to the party, speak out to different Democratic groups, speak out to Democratic-related groups to raise money, to try to inspire. I'm here because I care about the party and I care about a philosophy we all share. I'd like to be part of helping make those come together and work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seas. Ms. Durazo, one minute-ish. My parents came from Mexico to this country and raised 10 kids. A sibling of mine didn't make it past being an infant because when we were working in the field as migrant farm workers, we didn't have access to health, health care, nor a doctor. So my younger brother didn't make it. You know, I became a union organizer because of that. To believe that all men and women deserve the basics. And I think that's what every man and woman in this country fights for. No matter what positions I've had, and even with the endorsement of the National AFL-CIO, 
I'll tell you, my best moment is when I meet those housekeepers at the Trump Hotel in Las Vegas that only, not only voted for the union against Trump, but they voted against Trump as the president. That courage, that's what moves me, and that's why I want to be the vice chair of this party. Thank you. Mr. Rosso, thank you very much. Mr. Blake. King said that in the end, we will remember the silence of our friends. Well, this week should be an indication of why we cannot be silent as Democrats. This week should be a reminder of why we need to be very clear of why we are running. I am running to be one of your male vice chairs because this is my story. My daddy mopped hospital room floors for 28 years as a proud member of 1199 SEIU. My mama for four years worked at a manufacturing plant and beat breast cancer. But over those odds, we overcame the odds for e to be able to give back to our community. That's why I'm standing before you today to say very clearly, we have to build our bench of getting more Democrats elected to school board and city council and state rep. We have to make sure we strengthen our party so there's more messaging to fight back against the resistance. And we have to make sure that we are embracing our future to say that communities of color and rural whites and all those who are a part of this are a part of this movement together. So join us at Leadership for Tomorrow. Join us at Michael Blake for DNC. This is the moment. This is the time. I ask for your vote because the time for change is now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Byrne. So I missed my flight coming here because I was in the streets in Philadelphia protesting Trump because he had the audacity to come to a proud sanctuary city and spew his hate. And we showed up in the streets, 5,000 deep, telling him and the Republicans to go home. And that is why I am running to be vice chair, because we need to loudly and clearly say, hello to Trump. And as we say, hell no, you need to say yes to organizing. I grew up in a union family. My mom was asked me, I remember the day that she got health insurance for the first time and how much that changed our life. And I knew from the time I was very young that I had to fight for justice with and for other people. We don't need saviors. Nobody needs a savior. We need to all work together to make us all strong. So can we all say, we will win. We will win. Democrats will win. Otherwise, the whole country loses. So we are all going to stand up. We are going to fight. And we are going to bring back the Democratic Party. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, one minute. I'm a nurse. I'm an immigrant. It is an honor to sit here with these amazing people fighting for this one cause, the Democratic Party. I'm not a politician. But we, listening to us, we all are asking for the same thing for the Democratic Party. We all want transparency, we all want state party funding, and we all want to be included. The key, though, is about implementation. I have gone on record saying I will commit to raise $5 million for the SPP every year to address the broken grassroots infrastructure. I've gone and occurred before. I've done it before. I've raised millions of dollars for the Democratic Party up and down the ballot. Hosted record-breaking fundraising events for local and state candidates, as well as President Barack Obama and Secretary Clinton. If you elect me to be one of your next vice chair, I will utilize my position to work tirelessly with our na na national and local leaders to commit to strategy, Time. which allows us to be inclusive. I've listened to many, I've talked to many of you. I've listened to many of you, and I want Time, to be please. your voice. I want to work for you and address the key needs please. as we unify through purpose. Thank you. Thank you. Time, please. Ms. Meng. Thank you, everyone. It's been an honor to be up here with my colleagues and with so many people who came out because we all care about the improvement of our Democratic Party. Uh, I'm so privileged to be running for vice chair. I am the daughter of immigrants. Uh, my parents worked in a restaurant for most of our childhood, and I'm incredibly honored to be able to do what I can to offer my voice to make sure that our party is helping as many Americans as we can, because our country really needs us right now. We 
We all talk about similar issues. We want more transparency in the budget. We want accessibility to the budget to know where our money is going. We need to make sure that we work together to support our state parties and our local candidates so that we can increase accessibility to our Democratic parties and increase turnout throughout all of our states. We need to make sure that, and we saw this in the Bernie campaigns and the Hillary campaigns, where we had so many amazing surrogates travel the country in different geographical regions to make sure that they are talking to people. But we need to do this on a long-term basis, as we've all said, not just before an election. We need to work with grassroots organizations Time, to labor unions. And lastly, the inclusion, where we put our money in is where our priorities lie. So I appreciate your support. Thank you. Mr. Lassier, one minute. Thank you. Uh, I want to say thanks to everyone for being here today. Thanks to the moderator. Uh, and thank you especially to my good friend, uh, Chairman Hossa, Chair of the Democratic Party, for all of the work that you've put in all of this as well. Uh, you know, my great-grandfather spent his life as a coal miner. Uh, he fought for coal miners unionized. Uh, and so their voices could be heard for, for safety, uh, for, for pay, and for dignity. Um, both of my grandfathers were union coal miners. My dad was a union steel worker. Uh, they taught me that if working people don't stand up for one another, nobody else will. That when we do stand up for one another, nothing is going to stand in our way. Now is the time that our party needs to stand together to fight back against Donald Trump and his Republican allies in Washington. Now is not the time for us to be fighting amongst ourselves. Now is the time that we rebuild this party from the inside out, not from the top down. Now is the time for us to unite and to come together. This week has taught us that the next four years is going to be a long four years. And we're not going to win anything if we keep sniping at one another's heels. We need to come together to rebuild our Democratic Party. My name is Rick Palacio, and I would appreciate your support. Ms. Jaff, one minute. My name is Liz Jaff. I was born in Georgia, raised in South Africa, where my great-aunt Helen Sussman was the first woman to stand up against apartheid as a member of parliament and fight for Nelson Mandela's freedom. I bought a one-way ticket to work for Barack Obama because you've got to have a little bit of crazy to work in this world, and I have a little bit of crazy, but I also get things done. I work at the intersection of technology and political fundraising, and I'm a grassroots organizer. So I wrote a list. You need money in South Carolina. I'm going to connect you with Philadelphia, UPPN. They'll have your back. Uh, Rebecca needs a voter protection person in Georgia. Flippable is going to try and you. We're going to find some donors. Uh, Cliff in North Carolina, he wants people to run for office. We're going to connect him with Run Something, Amanda Littman. And uh, oh, that's right, Glenn, you need a million dollars in Harris County, right? We've got some lawyers back there that are going to help you. But let's be honest, we actually need to get that done. So, the DNC needs to become the toolkit for the people. Let the people fight. Because the Democrats have never been stronger, more sexy. We're out there, and Donald Trump, we're coming for you. Thank you, Mr. Parkamenko. One minute. Mr. Parkamenko, one minute. Last one. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to the chairman and all the Texas Democrats for hosting this today. Thank you for all those that have joined us in this room. Thank you for those that are on live feed with us. Great to have you here. I'm Adam Parkamanco. I'm running for DNC Vice Chair. I have spent my career investing and growing the grassroots of our party. I've founded and led organizations that have inspired thousands of individuals to be part of causes greater than themselves. And I'm running a grassroots campaign. I'm a workhorse. I've, uh, I've spoken with almost 400 of the DNC members now, the 447 which changes every day. And I've heard a lot. I've heard you want to see a lot more respect for state parties. I've heard you want real funding for state parties. I've heard that you want to see a vibrant party in every single state, D.C., the territories, and abroad. I've heard that you want to win a lot more down-ballot elections. And most importantly, I've heard that you want a partner at the DNC, someone who is going to get to yes, someone who is going to say yes if you get your call or email returned to begin with. I want to be that partner. I want to make sure that you have someone that is there for you, for DNC members, for non-DNC members, someone who's going to fight for you. I'm proud to be from Virginia. I'll be out 
all over the country and abroad as vice chair. Time, please. But I also live eight minutes from DNC. I will be in there all the time making sure I am fighting for every single thing time, that you feel that you have gotten. I hope to earn your support, and I appreciate you being here today. Please give all 10 candidates for vice chair a big hand. Thank you very much. We'll be back to reset for the next forum shortly.
uh, stage the distinguished congressman from the 9th Congressional District here in Houston, Texas, Congressman Al Green, a proud graduate of TSU Law School. Congressman Green, a week ago, attended the Women's March here in Houston, Texas. He has been a fighter for Texans, for all Americans, for justice and equality, for education, health care, and we love Al Green, too, at the DNC. So here, Congressman Al Green, please help us kick off the afternoon session featuring the, care, the candidates for chair of the Democratic National Committee. I am your Congressman Al Green. Thank you so much. I'm the Congressman Al Green who refused to go to the inauguration. I'm the Congressman Al Green who didn't go because I refused to celebrate the inauguration of a president who would be Muslims from this country that he's doing it right now. A president who would disrespect God's families. A president who disrespected President Barack Obama by denying his citizenship. A president who would call women dogs and refuse to go to the inauguration. And I want you to know this. We as Democrats have got to stand together. We've got to be strong together. And if Donald Trump, the president, was not fit to be president the day before the election, he's not fit to be president the day after the election. All that means is that we've elected somebody who is unfit to be president. And we, as Democrats, We've got a duty to stand up. We've got to fight. We've got to make sure that we don't allow a person to become Attorney General of the United States of America who's going to stand against the voting rights, who will do what he can to further erode the Voting Rights Act. We've got to stand up against Sessions. Anybody who wants to privatize the public school system in this country ought not be the Secretary of Education. Anyone who refuses to have more than a minimum wage, a minimum wage is passe. Anyone who refuses to have a living wage so that people can earn enough to take People who are living in poverty, making poverty wages. No one should work full time and live below the poverty line in the richest country in the world. We got to have a secretary who respects the minimum wage. I only have three minutes, so I need to close with this. There is a board member of the NAACP here. He has not been standing and applauding, but I think we ought to applaud him. Howard Jefferson. Let's see if the NAACP is in the house. His, his, his capable, competent, and qualified director of the Houston branches in the house, Ms. Smith, would you stand, please? Give her a hand, Yolanda Smith. Here are my final words, dear brothers and sisters, because we live in challenging times. These times are very, very much challenging. And we who call ourselves Democrats, have got to be willing to take our message not only to our friends and neighbors, we've got to take it to the world. I see our state party chair is here, a chairperson, Hina Hosa. Give him a hand, please. He just walked in. I didn't mean to interrupt my message, but I, I have to respect him. And I see my DNC representative, A.J. Durante, is here. Give him a hand, please. Thank you. I see John Patrick here, who is the AFL State Party President. Okay, I, 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 I've gone as far as I can go.
quick, but I've got to tell you this. This is important. This is important. We've got to stand and fight. We've got to fight every day and every night for that which is right. We cannot allow this president to go unchallenged. The things that he already has done and will continue to do, apparently, are things that are antithetical to the American way. We are patriotic Americans. We are patriotic Americans. And as patriotic Americans, we've got to be willing to do what other patriotic Americans have been willing to do, and that is take on anybody who would destroy the rights of other Americans and would in any way demean them. You can't call 11 million people bad names and expect us to let you stand and not be you can't say ugly things about women and expect us not to stand in your way. You cannot decide that you're going to disrespect the star family and we not stand against you. You've got to know that if you don't respect us, you can expect us to take you on. We're going to challenge you in the courts. We're going to challenge you in the streets. We're going to challenge you in public office. We're going to respect millennials. If you want millennials to participate, respect. Them. Respect them. Show them that you ain't cool. Do not expect them to do for you simply because you're a Democrat. We can no longer take party for granted. We've got to be a part of the party that's making a difference. God bless you. Thank you. If you stand for America, I stand with you. Will you stand up now and show that you care about those who can't take care of themselves, about the least among us, the least among us, the lost among us, so much, Congressman Al Green. It is now my great honor to introduce again the CEO of the Texas Tribune, Evan Smith, who will moderate our final session today, the candidates for chair of the Democratic National Committee. Thank you, Evan, uh, for your great leadership this afternoon and moderating the session. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Evan Smith of the Texas Tribune. It's my honor to be here to moderate this last forum of the day, candidates for chair of the Democratic National Committee. I will introduce them in a second, and we'll get right into the questioning, but let me tell you about the rules of engagement. We have agreed no opening statements. There will be introductions, and we're going to move right into a discussion of the issues that we believe will be of interest to people in the room and out. We will integrate some questions from non-DNC member audience members in the room and out in the first two-thirds of the two hours that we'll have to get. Balance of time, we're going to go to questions from DNC members and we'll augment those with questions from regular folks that have come in on cards or previously and we will wrap promptly at six o'clock. We will have one minute closing statements from the candidates before we wrap at the end. Fair enough? Please ask you to sit down. What I'll say to the questioners and what I'll say or to the candidates and to anybody asking a question, we're going to try to get in as much stuff as possible in the two hours. We will all leave disappointed. We're not going to get in as much as we want. So I ask, please, we ask you a question, give an answer, don't make a speech. And if you get an opportunity to ask a question today, ask a question, don't make a speech. Okay? It's now my pleasure to introduce the candidates beginning on my immediate left and all the way down Yes, first, Jamie Harrison, who chairs the South Carolina Democratic Party, the first African-American, an attorney he previously was for Congressman James Clyburn, was executive director of the House Democratic Caucus and floor director for the majority whip. Ray Buckley chairs the New Hampshire Democratic Party, previously served in New Hampshire's House of Representatives for 18 years. He also chairs the State Association of State Democratic Chairs. He represents Minnesota's 5th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives and serves as a co-chair of the Progressive Caucus and as a chief deputy whip. He is a member of the DCCC's leadership board and served on the DNC platform drafting committee. Jamu Green is a native 
as president of Rock the Vote at the Women's Media Center, co-founded Define America, and was a founding board member of Vote Run and Lead, and was director of Women's Outreach and Southern Political Director for DNC. Vincent Tolliver is a writer and substitute teacher who's run for Congress in his native Arkansas. He's chief regulatory officer for Angstrom SMO and is executive director of the Stringer Foundation. Pete Buttigieg is mayor of South Bend, Indiana. As such, has executive authority over an annual budget of $300 million and more than 1,000 employees. At 29, he is one of America's youngest mayors of a city with more than 100,000 residents. Tom Perez was the U.S. Secretary of Labor in Barack Obama's second term. Previously served as Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, as President of the Montgomery City Council in his home state of Maryland, and as a federal prosecutor. Sam Ronan is a veteran of the United States Air Force and serves today in the U.S. Army Reserves. Born in Germany, he grew up in Ohio, where he ran for a state house seat in 2016. Who is after Mr. Ronan? Here we go, Peter Bukarski. Peter Bukarski is an attorney born and raised in Milwaukee. In the 2008 Wisconsin primary, he helped organize and direct election protection efforts for Barack Obama. And in 2016, he aided in the recount effort for Green Party candidate Jill Stein. Finally, on the very far end, Sally Boynton Brown, executive director of the Democratic Party of Idaho, and serves as president of the DA's Association of State Democratic Executive Directors. She's run statewide and legislative campaigns, worked in the Idaho State Legislature, and was a field director for the state party. Please give the chair candidates all a big hand. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Here we are in Houston, which I, I, so I think about this as the Super Bowl of Democratic self-examination. That's what we're going to have tonight. Um, I listened carefully to Reverend Barber this morning at the beginning of the program say that in order to know where you're going, you have to understand where you've been. And I'm going to heed him at his words, and although I want this conversation to be primarily about the future, inevitably it has to be about what's just happened. Just as the presidential election is theoretically about the next four to eight years, it's really about the last four to eight, and so is the case with the DNC chair election, as much about the past as the future. I'd like to know to what you attribute the results of the 2016 election. What role, if any, did the Democratic Party institutionally play in the outcome, and what are your takeaways? Chairman Buckley, let me ask you to go first. Uh, thank you, and excuse me for my cold. Uh, I think first and foremost we have to address the nominating process. Uh, what occurred uh, last cycle uh, was not something that I think uh, impressed a lot of people to address the issue of superdelegates. We have to address the issue of the joint fundraising agreements. We have to address the issue of the caucuses. We have to address the issue of the debate schedule. But first and foremost, we have to make sure that our DNC is above reproach when it comes to neutrality. That's what I bring. <clears throat> I was the state party chair in 20, uh, 2008 campaigns and the 2016 campaign. Uh, there is no question that the New Hampshire Democratic Party in the First Nation primary was uh, to all. And that's what I believe that we need to make sure that our DNC represents. That's number one. Number two, we've got to reinstate the 50 strategy. Uh, that had a huge impact. You know, in 2008, uh, each state on average was getting about $250,000 a year uh, in support. Uh, it got down about 70 in the last eight years. Uh, I absolutely believe that if we had continued that field organizing, we would have be looking at a President Hillary Clinton. I think that we'd be looking at a Senate majority. I think we would have won more legislative seats and House seats all across the country because that's what we did in New Hampshire. Because even though the money got dropped off on the national level, we still doubled down. In New Hampshire, for the first time in New Hampshire's history, we won all four congressional seats. We've got two years senators and two members of Congress, and we cleared the state by 2,000 votes for Hillary Clinton, but we did it ourselves by being, having an organized operation. We need to make sure that every state party has that opportunity. So it's reforming the DNC self, reforming the nominating process, building out the 50-state strategy, because that's how we're going to deliver our message. If we have one neighbor talking to another neighbor, that is the most effective 
We've got to stop with the Den TV ads. We've got to make sure that we have the resources to build a ground organization. Let, let me go to Ms. Green and ask Ms. Green the same question. What ha I think the list is long, and that is why this process is so important. Certainly, our party processes and the systems that are mired in an old school approach contributed to our loss, and that includes superdelegates. That includes not connecting with voters through very complex and convoluted systems. But there are a lot of other reasons. We lost because we thought the media was our friend. And we lost because we didn't engage with millennials. We lost because we didn't connect with young people of color in the ways that we should have. We lost because we forgot how to just speak simply and clearly and in an in, in engaging way to not just white working class voters or looking at it from dividing along race and sexual um, identity lines. We lost because we didn't understand intersectionality and the fact that sexism, racism, classism, homophobia, all of these things are connected and we lost because we didn't communicate that as a party. There's no question our brand was damaged. It was damaged by Russia and WikiLeaks, but it was damaged from within and it was damaged by our allies. And that is why this process is so important because we have to start by rebuilding, rebranding, and re-engaging. Congressman Ellison, let me ask you to get in on some self-examination of the election and where you go going forward, and specifically, what did the DNC do or not do that it should have? Well, first of all, let me thank all of the folks up here for running. I admire all of them and appreciate all of them. We have a lot of democratic unity going on, and I want to thank all of you for participating. Thank everybody for being here. Now, look, the, the reason that we did not win is because we didn't have if you look at three states alone, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, we thought if we had got 70,000 more people to the poll, we would have won. And this is because the Democratic Party has ignored the red states, goes to the swing states, and then only talks to the people who are likely voters. We have got to expand the election. We've got to talk to everybody. We need 50 states. We need 3,143 counties. We got to talk to everybody all over this country, and that means sending resources from D.C. to Texas, to Houston, nice in Harris County. You killed, you crushed. You did a great job in Harris County, and not, and, and you actually Texas came closer to victory than Ohio did. It goes to show you when you say state is a red state and you're not going to invest there, you are making a very big mistake. There are blue spots in red states and red spots in blue states and we got to invest in all states so we've got to get out there and start knocking on doors we got to turn on during the off year i look forward to a summer canvas a canvas right here in harris county where we would knock on doors all over this county where we will go where we will talk to people about what they need and we will organize organize all over this county i just want to say that i'd like to see the state part, we got to move to the states. We want to put staff. If I'm the DNC chair, DNC staff will be all over this country not locked up in D.C. Money will flow to the states. Data will flow to the states. Technology will flow to the states. Communications will flow to the states. And we will engage every DNC member in the forward movement of this party. That includes the caucuses. That includes everybody. Labor will be at the front of the, uh, and we will be listening to labor, organized labor to listen about how to talk to working class people, but we will talk to the black, Latino, we will talk to the API, we will talk to the um, Native American caucus, all caucuses about how we reach into that community. The LGBTQ caucus will inform the DNC on how we really have a tell the democratic story at Pride, which is coming up in just a few months. We will be listening to and that's what we'll, I think we'll, we need we'll, to do. we'll come to a lot over the course, I think, of the next two hours, Congressman. I want to come at this question of what happened and what it tells you about where you need to go a little differently. And let me start with Ms. Brown at the end. You know, we've heard a lot today about how this race was winnable. And what Congressman Ellison just said about the small number of votes that had to turn in three states is undeniably a fact, a real fact, not an alternative fact, a real fact. Um, so, so, 
The question really is this. As you begin to think about what happened, did the Democrats lose or did the Republicans win? As you process what happened last fall, and what does that tell you about what you have to do next? Well, first of all, I want to make it clear that Trump won, not the Republicans. This was not a mandate on the Republican Party. This was Trump winning an election. He is not representative of their party in any way, shape, or form. And we need to get really clear on that. Because there's a distinction there. The reason that Democrats lost this election is we've lost touch with the American people. We have too many people sitting in rooms making decisions based on data, not based on conversations with people. We need to be talking to people, every single one of us. One of the things that we heard vice chair candidates focus on is the engagement that we can have online. And that's something that Trump's doing very, very well. He is on Twitter. He is talking to millions of Americans. Our leaders need to be on social media, having direct interaction with people. We need to give people back the power that they so desperately want so that we can get America back on track and we can get our party back on track. Secretary Perez, um, this morning Reverend Barber also talked about the need for a political Pentecost, he said. He painted a very dark picture of where the party is, although he was optimistic about what needed to be done, but he painted a dark picture of it. In, honest, in all honesty, you were so close to winning. Would we be talking about a political Pentecost if 7,000 voters had turned out? Are things as bad as people have said? Is there an overcorrection going on? Well, let's look at what's going on right now. You know, as we speak, there are people being detained in JFK and other airports around this country. There are immigrants who are living in fear. There are, there are voter suppression efforts that succeeded two or three years ago that are going on now. So we have to understand, and we don't need to, we don't need to burn the house down, but we right. need to take a sober look at where we are and what we, and what we didn't do. And what we didn't do is we didn't make house halls. It's not an engagement strategy to show up at a church every 4th October. And that's what we do all too frequently. We can't do that. We've got to think long term. The Republicans thought long term. In 2012, they went into Florida. They had a four-year engagement strategy of organize, organize, organize. And they brought out about 130,000 new voters that we hadn't th seen before. And that was the margin of victory. We can do this, too. You look at what's happening across America. Uh, Keith pointed out Michigan and, and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, and those are absolutely correct. But you look at places like Georgia, and you look at places like Arizona. Gwinnett County is now... You go out to Arizona, and Hillary only lost by about three points. And the thing that both of those things have in common is they did it without any help from the DNC. Imagine what we would do if we had a 50-state strategy in which we are engaging, in which we are investing and organizing right now here in the state of Texas, thinking long-term, understanding that you got to make house calls. And the organizers in Texas should be from Texas. The organizers in Georgia should be from Georgia. The organizers in Arizona tienen que hablar español cuando es necesario. That's what you have to do. And that's how we move forward. And that is why well, it, 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 it breaks my heart to see what's happening across America. Because Donald Trump did not win the popular vote. He entered office as the most unpopular president in American history. And he is not who we are as the United States. And last weekend, we saw two and a half million people come out to say, somos los Estados Unidos, no somos los Estados Divididos. And so what we have to do yeah. is we've got to translate this moment right. into a movement. And we need to right. take the message to Trump, build that grassroots strategy across every state, and transform this organization because we need a turnaround job and a turnaround special. So you've mentioned a couple of things. The march, you've mentioned the president. Both of those are right on tap and on deck, but I want to go to Mr. Harris. I like what Secretary Perez said. Do you need to burn the house down? Is that your takeaway from last fall? I said another way, do you need evolution or revolution for this party? Listen, perception is reality in politics. And right now, the perception is that the Democratic Party is broken. So the question is, how do we, how do we change that? How do we change that reality of the situation? Listen, the Secretary was right. Hillary Clinton 
uh, had three million more votes than Donald Trump. And what, uh, and what other competition have you ever engaged in that you can have three million more of anything and still lose? It is, it is here in this country, first and foremost, we need to deal with electoral college. That is an issue. When, when voters feel as if they go into the, into the booth and they, and they cast their vote, but yet the person on the other side still wins, that's a problem. I understand the historical context for why we had it. Well, you know, sometimes things have to change. The Constitution also talked about uh, the African American being only a percentage of a person. That had to change. It is now time to change the Electoral College and go towards the popular vote. If you're chair, that's something that you make as a priority for you as D.C. chair to message that to the, to the country. I, I do believe we have to message that to the country. Yeah. But, but I also think this. People have lost faith and they have lost trust. You know, one of the things that we talk about as a Democratic Party, and I hear this so often, particularly here in the South. I'm the chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party. And people say all the time, I just don't understand why voters, when they, voters go and they vote against their best interests. He said that all the time. The problem is that we talk too much. When voters go to vote, when they go into that booth, they are not going in there just making a decision here. And that's what Democrats like to talk to. Voters make their decisions on who they're going to vote for here and here. It is the heart and it's in the gut. And the core of that is trust. Do you trust that the part, do you trust that the person that you're voting for is going to fight for you? I used to teach my, my kids that the most powerful way to persuade anybody is to show and not tell. We tell people all the time that we're fighting for them. It's for the Democratic Party to show them that we're fighting for them. Mr. Mayor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward a little bit and ask you, uh, Pat, the election, what the reaction of you and your fellow Democrats should be to President Trump, and particularly to his first week in office. There's a continuum of responses we've seen. There's the now familiar line, give him a chance and hold him accountable. There's Figure out how you can get with Bannon and Priebus and Cooper and cut the best deal that you can under the circumstances, and then there's a full-on John Lewis-style resistance. Where, where along the continuum, Mr. Mayor, do you believe Democrats should be after the first seven days in advance of the next four years? Sign me up for resistance. What we have seen in the last seven days, I think we might be underreacting. He took office and immediately took a jackhammer to the foundations of American moral authority. And on the seventh day, he did not rest. He piled outrage upon outrage. He did not rest, and neither can we. And if he occasionally does something right in the way that a stopped clock is right two times a day, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in stopping the destruction of America's moral foundations. As we speak, as we speak, people who look to America as a beacon are trapped in a Tom Hanks movie at JFK Airport. It wasn't Tom Hanks' best movie. You know, when I was in Afghanistan, there were interpreters and other Afghan civilians I saw every day who put their lives on the line and their families in mortal danger because they were willing to work with U.S. troops like me and the U.S. government. And when I think about some of those people, there was one, I'm ashamed to admit, actually was beating me in our fantasy football league we set up, even though we had no idea how the game was played. And I think about how hard it would be for me to look him in the eye right now because of what our country is doing to people like the Iraqi individuals who were stopped at the border. We have them in South Bend, and they're making South Bend a better place, by the way. Just last week, I was in an event with refugees in South Bend, 
one of whom was just such a person. We have a university in South Carolina, several companies that are going to find it harder to do what they do. And that's just right. the refugee issue. So to get to your question, please. <laughs> Sorry, you got me fired up. I'm still on the part of the two hours. It'll get, it'll get worse. Go ahead. The, but, but the good news is the answers, and the answers aren't going to come from Washington. Yeah. The answers are going to come from the state. The best answer I have yeah. is what we saw at the so, Women's so, so very, very quickly, we have audience questions we're integrating with my questions. Uh, Gene Wallet wrote in before this forum, why are the Democrats voting yes for unqualified? cabinet nominees, show some spine, and stop caving in. And so, show, show on the Trump cabinet. Yes? They didn't let me vote, but that's But if you were right. there, you would be voting no. That's right. And America voted no. That's what the women showed us. But, there are Demo proud. but Mr. Mayor, there are Democrats in the Senate right now on certain nominees voting yes. You're saying you'd be a no vote across the board. If I was in the Senate, I bet I would. But Right. Uh, Mr. Pekarsky, let me ask you the same question. Would you be, if you were in the United States Senate right now as a Democrat, be voting against every one of the Trump nominees? I would be voting against any one of the Trump nominees who I felt was qualified for the office after an examination. And I think that... Um, also, uh, sir, sp speak up or we'll give you a different microphone. I just want to be sure people can hear you. I, I would be voting against every one of the, de the, of the Republican nominees... Again. Can, how about now? Can you hear me now? That's, that's better, okay, sir. Well, making progress. Yes. I think it is the obligation of our senators uh, to examine these companies closely. First, to examine their record, uh, to get the paper, and then conduct a searching examination of them under oath at their confirmation hearings. And... and and that should establish, as far as I'm concerned, from what I've seen, that these people are unqualified. And therefore, I would vote no again. So, you're pro you're, so you get to the same conclusion as the mayor, but you I, do I, it through I, maybe a different... You know, the problem is, I'm a lawyer, I take too many words. Yeah, yeah. The answer is, they're unqualified, it's a no vote. Right. There's not much to talk about. And that's, and, that's, and that's your version of the resistance. That's how you, you resist. Well, I think there are a whole... It, it depends what's happening. That's how... The senators can stand up for us. There are other ways we can stand up for ourselves, such as everybody, such as two and a half million people did last weekend. Right. And to, to put Trump and his colleagues on notice that we're not standing for it. There are two and a half million people in the street who are saying quite clearly they're not buying what he's selling. I mean, unfortunately, we're stuck with it unless the Republicans in the House and Senate come to their senses uh, for four years. But that doesn't mean we have to agree with it. That doesn't mean we have to go along with them. That, that, that means none of that. There are various ways uh, within our laws to resist what they're doing and to oppose it and to stop it. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, we should pursue all of them, particularly with respect to the clearly unqualified nominees for federal office, which require a confirmation by the U.S. Senate. Mr. Well, Tolliver, where do you land along the continuum of resistance? And what would you be telling people if you were chair of the DNC today? Thank you, Evan, for the question. But first, let me say that I'm thrilled to be on the campus of Texas Southern University in Tiger Land. Tiger Land, Tiger Land. Thank you for hosting us. Evan, before I get to the question of resistance, I'd like to pick up the question, if you don't mind, about why we lost. We lost simply for me, and it'll be very short. We lost because Hillary didn't pick the right running partner. I know my opponents might not want to see it, but it's the truth. Had she chosen Bernie Sanders, had she chosen Cory Booker, we wouldn't be having this discussion. So that's that. I'm not interested in pay, playing Monday morning quarterback, but the truth is the truth. In terms of... To the question. Yes, to the, the question. Ter the terms of the resistance, I would not vote for anyone that Trump... Uh, nominated to office because, number one, we already know that the White House is a zoo. We can scarcely expect anything to come from that White House that's worthwhile, so I would definitely not vote for anyone that Trump nominated, period. Straight answer. Now, and yes. there was another question on the board that was how to respond to his first seven days in office. And not quite simply, the response is organized. We 
we, we know that nothing good is coming out of the White House, so how do we handle it? We organize, we organize, we organize. The midterm elections are coming in 2018. We have 28 Senate seats up. We have about 84 House races in contention. We don't need to spend time worried about Trump. We need to spend time worried about organizing and sweeping midterm elections. Okay, let me, go to, let me go back to Secretary Perez and then to Mr. Ronan. Let me ask you, as a number of people have mentioned the Women's March last weekend, how do you make sure, as was said at an earlier moment this afternoon, that this is a movement and not a moment? How do you take the energy and the momentum, Mr. Secretary, and the magnitude of the march and translate it into something meaningful at election time and at all times for Democrats? I think we do what uh, Planned Parenthood did last weekend. In addition to the rally and marches, they were training hundreds of organizers, folks who are out there getting ready to work, getting ready to go everywhere across this country. There are so many people out there right now who are saying, give me some direction. I want to help. And that's what the Democratic Party has to do. We need to give people direction. We need to hold thousands of town meetings across this country to bring people together around a vision of inclusion and economic opportunity. That's what we need to do. We need to continue organizing, organizing, organizing. The, the existential threat for the 18 million Americans who are going to lose their health care if they get rid of the Affordable Care Act, we organize around that. We tell the truth about the Affordable Care Act, which is that it was a lifesaver, not a drug killer. It has saved lives all over this country. And we organize in all 50 states and the territories around the Affordable Care Act. We organize around the fact that we have refugees who contribute to our communities, who should be engaged and included. We've got refugees who are vetted more than the the Trump cabinet was vetted, my friends. That's for sure. And we've got to be out there defending them. We've got dreamers like Ellie Perez out in Arizona. We've got to be organizing around her and tell people that dreamers aren't simply a group of people seeking citizenship. It's a damn good value statement about who we are as a nation. We're a nation of dreamers and a nation of doers. And we need a Democratic Party that will take that fight to every corner of this country. So if I have the privilege of becoming your chair, we are going to do exactly that. Organize the House parties. Organize those town hall meetings. Save the Affordable Care Act. Organize candidates who are going to run from school board to Senate. And we will take, we will make progress in the House. And we will make this president a one-term president. We need to treat... This president, it's important to be fair. Mr. Ronan, yes. We should give this president the same courtesy that Mitch McConnell showed Barack Obama, okay. which wasn't a damn bit of courtesy. Let me go, let me go to Mr. Ronan, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Ronan, there, there's already talk of an April 15th march on tax day around the president's tax returns. Are March going to be the new way that the resistance manifests itself, is that what chair candidates, in your case, believe we should be doing, that the, the, the country should be doing? Well, first off, I'd like to say, viva la resistance, because we need to fight. And we don't need to do it tim tim timidly, we don't need to do it mildly, we need to do it aggressively. Because that's what they've done to us. What do you think ALEC is? That's a Republican organization that is shoving conservative beliefs and uh, policies down the throats of legislators all across the country, and now they have won. They have won in Ohio, they have won in the Rust Belt states, they have won all over the country, and we are being held by the throat by these people. So no, we will fight. And fortunately, to answer the question directly and succinctly, yes, protesting is the way forward. Why? Effective. We have to protest, we have to organize, because that's the only thing left to us. Right. If we could get people to get elected into office and maintain their integrity and actually do what they said they would do, we wouldn't have to protest because it would be getting done. But it's not. And who's the ones going out there fighting? The ones who are passionate, the ones who have been ignored, the Berniecrats, the Millennials, and the new Democrats and Independents who have never had a voice before. 
So as DNC chair, you bet, I will help organize those protests, and I'll make sure the doors are open to men and women like me and everybody else here who are finally at the table. Uh, con Congressman Ellis, this, this march emerged from the outside of the political establishment. You serve in Congress by being a member of Congress, whether you consider yourself part of the establishment or not. I guess you're by default part of the, at least the body of people who rules this, uh, this country. Um, how does the establishment connect up with the, the energy and the momentum outside of the building that, that made this happen, and how do you turn those people out? A lot of people asked fairly or unfairly, where were those people in November? Why were there millions of people out the day after the inauguration? Where were they on election, fairly or unfairly? How do you link I tell you, as chair of the Progressive Caucus, along with Raul Grijalva, we made it very clear that we have a strategy of partnership with people who might be elected and the progressive partners that are out there in the streets mobilizing, organizing, and getting people together every day. So we are in partnership. We understand that an elected person cannot educate, mobilize, and organize the same way that an organizer does in the streets of this country every single day. So what we do is we respect what they do, we partner with them, and what we do is bring the bills and the, and the legislation that they are m protesting for, and we fight for it to get enacted. And we do it whether it's by amendment or whether it's introducing a bill. But we use what they call an inside-outside strategy. And we need to recognize that it really is the street action that creates the social and economic conditions for legislation to ever get passed. It's, it's, and so the thing is, what we've got to do is we got elections coming up in 2017. There's a Virginia, there's New Jersey, there's a lot of municipal elections, and we can be pushing everything in the streets from uh, fighting for dreamers to fighting for increasing the minimum wage to fighting for uh, felon reenfranchisement, and we've got to have electeds and we've got to have people who are organizing out there working hand in hand in partnership to get these so things passed. Uh, Congressman of inside and outside. Absolutely. M Mr. Mayor, my understanding, if the, reporting, if the reporting is correct, you were the only one of the DNC chair candidates who marched. Is that right? As far Anybody as I know. on stage? I know what the reporting has said. Mr. Pekarsky, you marched. What's that? I can speak for anybody else. I'm proud that I was there. And Ms. Green, did you march too? One of the I want to tell you about the march is even in South Bend, I, I didn't go to the one in D.C., we, we had our own in South Bend. And even in a very red state, we had thousands of people out there, women of course, but not only women. It was people of every, uh, both genders and every race and every age and every creed. And it showed, I believe, not just the scope, but the character of the resistance, the character of happy warriors. I mean, it was fierce, it was calling out every falsehood was calling out every outrage. But you know what else? It was also fun. It felt good for the resistance to take the shape of us lifting each other up. That's what real organizing looks like. Just this afternoon, I'm very proud that, you know, we have a bunch of volunteers. We've got some folks come down from South Bend, some folks who uh, are supportive of our effort who, who came in from around the region. This afternoon, we had them out registering voters downtown Houston. And they had a blast. So I think we've got to remember that, that what we can do is not only politics, not only being in the trenches, not only fighting we've got to fight, but also building up the social capital, building up the spirit that is going to hold us all together through what I'm afraid are going to be some very dark days ahead. Uh, Ms. Brown and Ms. Green, um, a lot of comment from the people who were not happy to see the march or did not participate and sort of objected to the conduct or behavior that they saw in one city or another that it was very coarse and that it was somehow demeaning to the idea that this is a, a, a proper way to express uh, opposition with the president. Of course, the president has been quite himself. Um, and there are some Democrats who think that you have to fight fire with fire. We had a question from uh, Richard Adams, who sent in a question in advance of this event, saying, does the DNC plan on countering Trump's unorthodox style since high, going high doesn't work? by playing as dirty as he does and as dirty as the RNC does. Do you think that's one lesson of the last few months that you have to go low as opposed to go high? Listen, I think it's important that we respect everybody in the way that they want to do this, right? An organic movement is 
happening, and we at the DNC need to arm them with the support services and information to respond the way that works best for them. It's not my job to tell somebody that wants to go high and wants to focus on our values and be positive that they need to do something different. Conversely, it's not my job to tell somebody that wants to sock them in the eye that they need to be respectful and be kind. As somebody who thinks we need to meet people where they're at and give them the resources that they want, not tell them what they need to do, but give them what they want to be able to go do what they want to do. I think it's great to talk about embracing the movement it's something that we need to do, but the movement is chaotic and it's organic, and we can't try to structure that. We can't try to pin it in. We need to embrace it, and we need to recognize that there's a ton that we can do at the DNC to really be able to empower people and empower people to respond the way that they want to. If they want to show up to a march, awesome. They can show up to the march. And if they want to yell and put things on signs at that march, they can. If they want to write letters and they want to make phone calls, they should be able to do that too. It's going to take us responding at every single creative way that we can right. find to respond to this with every single person. Uh, Ms. Ms. Green, there was a lot of messages in the Clinton campaign last fall about how awful Mr. Trump was, how he used bad words, and how he said awful things that were hurtful and offensive, and yet he still won. And I think it, it probably makes sense that at least some people are asking, maybe we shouldn't be playing our game, maybe we should be outplaying him and his game. What do you think about that? And I think we rightfully, rightfully went high but when they went low, there was no bedrock to greet Donald Trump. And you know why? Because we did not call him out on his lies early enough. It wasn't until two weeks before the election that your colleagues actually started using the word lie. And that's on the media. But I also, I, I, I have to tell on this march because I think it is very important. There was a question you asked earlier about only one of the candidates up here marching. I know that Congressman Ellison was on the streets in spirit with those women. I know that every single one of my candidates up here were in spirit. Certainly we were doing a job of running this position and putting our ideas out there. And I think this is exactly what is wrong with this process, what is wrong with how we operate as a party. We fall into these traps, we divide when we don't need to, and we answer stupid questions when we should be talking about the business of the DNC and what is broken and how we fix it. And that is how we make sure that when they go low, that there is a bedrock to greet them. And it needs to start by building an army of messengers. We have 30,000, 30,000 Democratic municipal officials around this country. They're raising their hands. They are on the front lines. They are in these communities. They don't have messaging. They don't have media training. They don't know how to push back against the lies conservatives tell for a living. That is what the DNC needs to do. We need to build a media training academy and arm them with the tools to punch them in the face when they lie and to win with the truth. And we also need to arm a messengers, an army of messengers who are millennials, who are new faces. I'm sorry, we too often put politicians at the mic, in front of the camera, answering the questions. We need to put young people, a diversity of voices out there, representing our values and show them that this is what the party looks like. This is what democracy looks like. That is how we fight back against those lies. That is how we fight back against when they go low. All of the internal conversation and systems and processes that have been broken for decade after decade and that we talk about in these conversations, we need to stop now because this moment that we are in, this very unique unprecedented, unconventional moment if we keep doing the same things that we've always done and we expect the same results. That's the very definition of insanity. Well, let's and talk so about, it is, yeah. Let's when, talk. When, wait, let me finish. Please. When we talk about organizing, and I there's so there. many conversations about organizing, organizing, organizing. Well, then put an organizer ahead of the DNC and put someone who has delivered direct results. Don't put another politician up in here. To, I, I get it. I get it. It's really to give an inspirational speech, but you got to put campaign ideas that are going to inspire and deliver real results. And that is how we right, go I, high 
and we provide a bedrock for them when I, they go I'm low. I'm now going to go high, but I'm going to go to the chair on the end here. I'm going to go to Mr. Buckley and Mr. Harrison, and I'm going to take Ms. Green at her word that we have to be focusing on how to move forward and how to make things work and how we have to focus on building an army. So let's talk about the 50 states, and let's talk about what's happened over the last eight years in the 50 states. Since 2009, Mr. Harrison and then Mr. Buckley, the number of U.S. Senate, U.S. House, state legislative seats and partnerships that Democrats have lost to Republicans has been more than 1,000. In fact, in some respects, if you just look back over the last nine years, it's been Make America Red Again back in the States. How do you reverse this slide? How do you build the army Ms. Green is talking about? How do you harness the power of the DNC to reverse that slide back to red? And how do you make certain that this does not happen going forward? Listen, one of your previous questions was, why did, how do we get here in 2016? The roots of 2016 and 2008. Because that was the last year in which we had the 50-state strategy. And you know what? Listen, this is not going to be popular, and I know some of my friends on this. But OFA killed state parties. And, and, and let, me, let me tell you why. Because you can't have two organizations that are trying to do the same thing. There are state parties right now who have less than $35,000 cash on hand, and in two years they have to run governor's races or they have to protect one of the 25 U.S. Senate races, 10 of which Donald Trump won in, in, in this past election. And so if you want to win, we have to build and make sure that state parties have the capacity to win. This is a problem, guys. We can have a 500 or 1,000 of our activists who were participating in that march, and they could go to a state party today. And state parties don't have the capacity to handle all of those volunteers. And the worst thing to do for a volunteer is when they go there, you don't have any work for them to do, and they sit around, they won't come back. So if we want to fix the DNC, if we want to fix DNC, we have to invest in the state parties. And all of these outside organizations that are sucking money out of, the, uh, out of state parties and the DNC are killing us. Let me tell you, once President Obama is gone, once Senator Sanders is gone, once Howard Dean is gone, there will always be a Democratic Party. The question is, that is long-term sustainability that we need to make sure is there. There's too much duplication that is going on. Look at the Republican Party. You don't see all of these other organizations. Is they invest in their young people, in their college Republicans, they invest in the high school Republicans, and all that lives in the RNC. But if we continue this duplication because everybody wants to have control and everybody wants to be important, then as a party, we are going to lose. The people that we fight for each and every day, the least of these, which I grew up as one because I'm the son of a 15-year-old mom. I grew up in rural South Carolina. If we are about fighting for those people, then we need to get past our own egos and what we want in power and go back to showing the people that we are for them. M M Mr. Mr. Buckley, is the reason that all those seats I mentioned, legislative seats, governorships, and the like in the states went from blue to red because the state parties were not strong enough and is making the state party stronger supposed to solve that problem? Uh, it's not supposed to solve the problem. It will solve the problem. Um, the, the reality is <clears throat> that for too long, we've put the people at the helm of the DNC who've never really been in charge of a party on a state level. When the Republicans got in trouble, what did they do? They put a, a their DNC chair was a state party chair. Reince Priebus was the chair of the Wisconsin uh, Democratic Party. That's what we've got to do. But, and so much of uh, conversations at these forums, you know, it sounds like we're uh, in, in some sort of debate for the presidency or well, who's going to be in the drunk of, of the car. <clears throat> Listen, what we need is a mechanic that can get under the hood and fix the damn car. And that's what I've been able to do in New Hampshire. You know, in the last 10 years, the last 10 years where we lost all these seats, that we've, we've never won more state House and state Senate seats in New Hampshire's history in the last, than we have in the last 10 years. In the last 10 10 years, we've won 11 out of the last 13 statewide races. We've won all three presidential races. We've won five or six gubernatorial elections, three out of the four U.S. Senate races, and nine out of 12 congressional This is a 
purple state, folks. It is just as purple as the state of Texas is. But we went in there, made the investments, done, and we delivered. And that's what every single state party needs to have those sorts of tools, that sort of energy. And that's what I'm going to be able to do as the DNC chair. It's great that we can talk about all these issues that tug at our hearts. That's wonderful. But if we have a damn organization that can actually produce and win the election, it doesn't mean anything. All it means is that we're going, oh, isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? We've got to about stop being sad, roll up our sleeves, and get to work. Okay. Um, Mr. Secretary, let me ask you about one of those states in which a number of seats have gone red or redder in the last number of years, and that's Texas, where we are today. Obviously, this is a forum that is regionally focused on the South, but I want to talk about Texas because here we are in Texas. No Democrats been elected statewide in Texas since 1994, which is not to say that national Democrats don't come to Texas, but they come to Texas dragging a sack on the bottom of the ocean. They collect a bunch of money and then they take it out of state. Texas has been for the Democratic Party for at least 20 years an ATM. We heard this all day long. If you were a Democratic donor in Texas, knowing that the Democratic Party came here, raised money, and then took that money out of state, would you give the Democratic Party of Texas one dollar more? So what do you do to fix that? Well, the challenge here in Texas isn't unique to Texas. There's ATM machines in Atlanta. There's ATM machines in Arizona. There's ATM machines in so many other states, and we've got to change. This is about changing the culture of the DNC. Changing the culture means making sure that states are equal partners. Our orientation cannot be simply electing president. That's obviously important, but it cannot be the only orientation. Right. We must be helping from school board to the Senate, helping to elect people. And when we organize, 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 we're able to do that. Texas is a great example because Texas, in this most recent election cycle, they cut the margin at the presidential level in half. Hillary Clinton only lost by eight or nine points as opposed to 18 points before. They elected the first African-American female sheriff in the history of Texas. Harris County kicked butt. So many other counties kicked butt. And that was all without a, a load of help from the DNC. So when, and, and I can tell the same story in Georgia, I can tell the same story in Arizona. So when we invest... 12 months a year in organizing, when we are investing in the training of candidates, which should be a core function of the DNC, when we have an institute for best practices so that we can take the example of Nevada, which kicked butt in 2016 and flipped two House seats, elected the first Latina to the U.S. Senate, and now the State Senate and the State House are in Democratic hands. We need, an, we need a center for best practices to go to school on that this is how we turn things around when you come into a state like texas and you're having a fundraiser you should be sharing in the proceeds with the state party that's how you move forward and that is how you change the culture making sure that all the states are at the adults table and not at the kids table and all the territories as well Ms. Ms. brown you are from another red state if a Democratic donor in Idaho gives money to the National Party and that money goes away, goes to another state, help elect somewhere where the Democratic Party thinks they have a better chance of winning, is that Democratic donor going to give a dollar again? So I, you've been talking a lot about the what, and I want to talk a little bit about the how. You can find my blueprint at wethednc.org, and as an executive director, I go into how a lot. So around the, the idea of I think it's really important that, first of all, we acknowledge that when the DNC goes into our states, they don't contact us. And our state chairs and officers don't get tickets to go to those family dinners. That has to change. We have to, A, know when they're coming to our state, and B, we need a seat at that table. We don't have the money to afford $5,000 plates. And second of all, most of y'all don't have the money to afford $5,000 plates either. We need to make sure when the DNC is going into states, the yes, we're doing high dollar donor dinners and functions that we're communicating with state partners, but that we're also doing mid dollar donors and we're also doing free events. Because the way you get more donors, which is what we really need, 
is you go out and you attract more people to your party. So when we're creating vision for our party, we need to turn the whole conversation upside down and say, how can we get more people into the Democratic Party? Well, I've got a lot of hows in my blueprint. And so we can't limit ourselves by saying, right now we don't have enough money, or how are we going to get money? Right now we need to be having the conversation about how we get more people. We get more people by talking about what the Democratic Party does for people and by giving the power back to the people so that you all have a voice in this party and that you're helping make the decisions. Because we can put together work groups. I have 13 different work groups you can actually sign up for today to solve solve some of these problems and use all of the great thinkers that we have in our party. Not a bunch of people in D.C. that are locked away in a room, but actually the scientists and the philosophers and the academics and the working folks who have real solutions for our party. Bring them together so that we're pulling people in and then dollars will flow and we'll get more money for all of us, the state parties and the DNC. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, we heard earlier today, and we've heard for the last number of months, a tension between raising money through small dollar amounts and raising money from large dollar donors. Which way forward for the Democrats? Is it either or, or is it both and? It's all above, but we've got to remember that it does matter what your tactics for fundraising are. People give money based on values. If we're not talking about our values, nobody's going to care enough to fund our elections. And so I think what we've got to do is begin with the values that make us Democrats. Values that we are comfortable talking about, or ought to be, like fairness. Values that we've allowed conservatives to talk about for too long, when we are actually, I think, party more legitimately aligned with them. Like freedom. How can you not say, looking at this presidency, that anybody but the Democratic Party is the party of freedom? That we're the party of families. Because you cannot raise a family if you don't have a living wage. That we're the party of the future. When our strategy, our organizing, our tactics, our parties, all of that is built around our values instead of the other way around, the money will come. And, and, we'll if, do the and if those values motivate a very large gift from a donor or they motivate a super PAC gift, you're good with that. I want every resource I can get to run campaigns and win for Democrats. Yeah. C Congressman Ellison, you were a, a strong supporter of Senator Sanders. Senator Sanders talked all the time about the average size of his gift, and it was a small dollar amount. Are you good with more than just small dollar gifts supporting the value of the Democratic Party? You know, let me be real clear on this. There is a sense all over this country that the rank and file everyday Democrat does not own the Democratic Party. And that there are people who have outsized ability to donate who have more influence than they really should. Uh, and so if we ignore this conversation, we are making a big mistake. I love the idea of $27 at a time. We should put the bulk of our energy into raising money from, you know, the, the, the nurses, the firefighters, the teachers, the folks who go out there and work hard every single day. Because if we get our money from them, if we get our money from them, then the lines of accountability will run in the proper direction, and people will answer to the folks who we really are working for. It is true that the people, that the, whoever, you know, pays the piper calls the tune. And if the person pouring cement, and if the person over there building the buildings and riveting the, the, the churches together is the one who's funding the Democratic Party, then the Democratic Party's action and activity and behavior will follow their interests. And so I'm, and so look, I'm I'm going to tell you this, you know, I I I I do I do believe we need to have a very serious conversation about how how we relate to uh, you know people who have a financial interest in certain outcome of of, of legislation. I think we've got to discuss this issue, and and you know we may we may find that if that by not taking some money we can get a whole lot more money. The sources. If you're, but co Congressman, if you're, co Congressman, if you're chosen as DNC chair, and big money. Let me tell you, you know, I I got a friend of mine who was was born to to a serious fortune, and he's a great guy. And every time he talks to me, he's talking to me about when are me and him gonna go help the Rohingya who are being slaughtered in the nation of Burma. This guy. He's an awesome guy, and if he wants to help our party, and, 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 and it is clear that he is not trying to sell something or 
get a contract or make some money or get the DM, DF, uh, I almost said DFL, Democratic Party to, uh, to get something for him, then I'm not going to tell him he cannot help us. I'm certainly not going to tell our labor friends they cannot help us. We absolutely need their help. We absolutely need their help. But, but, but look, man, we got to have a party-wide discussion about what it means for a, you know, profit-seeking corporation and or their lobbyists to, 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 to be funding our party. Do y'all? Yeah, okay. Um, Mr. Tolliver, let me go to you and ask you a question that has come up repeatedly since the November election, and that is, has the Democratic Party stopped... Uh, successfully communicating with working class white voters and were working class white voters deserting the party the reason that the party is in the shape that it's in right now? Or is just being made of that? The answer to your question, Evan, is yes. Uh, I don't think too much is being made of it. The Democrats have also stopped talking to people in rural America. And I'll tell you, Evan, I am from rural America. I'm from Chico County, Arkansas, dirt roads, pickup trucks. And so anytime you alienate a people, you disenfranchise another. Vice President Biden said it uh, best. He said, you know, the Democrats have allowed elitism to creep into the party. And that's just the truth. And so everyone, we need to talk to everybody. I don't care if you are moderate. I don't care if you are progressive. I don't care if you are uh, conservative. We need to let everyone that we talk to know the, party, the Democratic Party's doors are wide open and we're ready for business. Otherwise, we lose at the ballot office, I mean, at the ballot box. And so the way we do that is we approach everyone. We uh, bring every voice table. I want to tell you, Evan, about a plan. I wrote a letter to the DNC voters called Democrats. That letter was published last week in the Huffington Post, and it lays out a plan. It is a snapshot of my ideas, my vision, my strategy, my plan for leading the DNC forward on day one, February 25th, when the election is held in Atlanta. I have a plan to hit the ground running. I think it's a mistake for the next chair to become the chair of the DNC and, and go back to Washington and develop a plan for six months, nine months, and then, you know, we're right there at midterm elections. We need to have a plan and we need to hit the ground running. So I would encourage you to read the letter that I wrote to you, the DNC voters and All Democrats, right. and you can read that letter by just Googling, because you know anything you can get, you can get anything on Google. So go to Vincent. Okay. No, Vincent Tolliver, T-O-L-L-I-V-E-R, and DNC chair, and the letter pops up. It is a precise plan. It spells out how we recruit, how we redefine, well, how we reimagine, and how we rebuild the Democratic Party. Mr. Tolliver, I want to stay on this question of working class white voters. Mr. Buckley, tell me, is the Democratic Party positioned now to win back the votes of working class whites who some believe deserted it and that that cost you all the election last time? Uh, I do not believe that we are uh, positioned um, at, at this very moment. Um, I believe that that's why we need to invest in the 50 state strategy. Uh, if you look at the demographics of New Hampshire, uh, you'll see uh, that uh, we don't have what we traditionally call a democratic base. Um, so what we have done is built a neighbor to neighbor program where we're talking to people. And that's, you know, if you read Hillbilly Elliot, J.D. Vance, uh, book, you know, uh, to me it reminded me so much of my cousins, so many people in my family uh, have the same uh, uh, challenges. And the moral of that book, and really the moral of our challenge of our party, is the hopelessness. It's really the fact that we are not talking to them and giving them any hope. Running a damn TV ad is not giving anybody hope. But having a neighbor coming and talking to them and saying, here the Democrats have done for you. You know what? You're actually on Obamacare. You might not know that because we call it a different thing. We're on Obamacare. You know what? You know the the the, um, the other programs that you're all benefiting from. That's from the Democrats. We have to have those sorts of con one, one, and that's how we're going to win back not just the white working class, but we're going to rise up the African American voters and the Latinos, the Asian uh, voters, all of the voters. Once we have a reconnection. Um, we spent over a billion dollars on 
see the edge, and we spend a teensy, teensy bit, less than 1% of that, on the ground organization. That is the wrong priorities for this party. We have got to turn that around. I'm not saying 50% or 25% or 10%. Just give us 2%. Give us 2% for the state parties to build this organization. Let's have an office in every congressional district. Let's have, let's have staff up there that's hired local communities. We have the money. You know, last week we were asked that question at another forum. What are you going to do? How are you going to pay all of that? And I said, you know, that's, a, that's, that's just a bullshit question. Because we have more than enough money. If we got enough money to send billions of dollars to corporate media, we've got enough money to organize every single community in this state. All right. In this, in this um, I want to go to Mr. Ronan and Mr. Uh, and, and Mr. Mayor uh, on a slightly different question. Uh, a lot of people believe that what the party needs is a generational choice. You're the two youngest people sitting up on this stage. Does the Democratic Party need to pass the baton to the next generation? And are you the ones? Are you the ones to take it? To make the case for why the party should hand off control to somebody of your generation, Mr. Ronan and then Mr. Mayor. Well, Pete, what do you think? You think we're the next generation? We next generation of leaders? Of course we are. That's not the question. The question is, are we finally going to get a place at the table? I ran for state representative. I served my country in the Air Force for seven years. I served overseas, and now I'm a reservist. I am still serving my country while doing this. Why? Because it matters. Because I care. Because we believe in service, and every single millennial out there has vested interest in our future. And if we don't give them the chance to step up, if we don't mentor them to step up, and if we don't give them the tools to succeed, we will fail. So it's a little self-serving to say that, yep, we absolutely need a millennial up here on the DNC chair, but in a sense, it's true. Because we grew up in a great economy that we watched get destroyed. We saw the technology boom. We saw everything that has changed in our country since the 90s. We are probably one of the most diverse and versatile people because of that. We've dealt with the landlines and dial-up internet, and now we have uh, cell phones and fiber optic cable. So not only are we generationally moving forward, and as a, as a generation do we see more and want to participate in more, we have the drive, we have the passion. And we've seen that in the Bernie Kratz, we've seen that with the progressives, and we've seen that with all of these local candidacies that have been going on. No tools at my disposal. I asked my party for help, and they couldn't deliver. I asked them for just contact information for local news media. <laughs> couldn't give me anything. How can I win? How can you win? How can we as millennials win if we don't have the tools to succeed? So I'm sorry I'm digressing a little no, bit. That's all right. I just wanted to finish up with this. We're talking about money. We're talking about structure. Well, guess what? The military loves to do things with redundancy, but they also do it with efficiency. We need to centralize the DNC. We don't need a DNC that gives money to the states, then that gives money to the, to the local party. What we need is an up-down communication that's centralized. We need packs set up so that the big money is going to the top, and then going into the middle, and going to the bottom. And we need to consolidate. We need to consolidate our resources. Right, now I'm going to interrupt you because you're off the question I asked you. I'm sorry. Let's finish up and we'll go to Mr. Uh, okay. By consolidating our resources, we give these new people, those millennials who do not know the path, do not know the game, a chance to win. Right. Mayor. <laughs> Mayor, the three presidential campaigns that had wind at their backs in the last cycle were just below 70, 70, and just over 70. Maybe the country says we don't want a millennial in charge. Let's please look, so, please address the degree to which this is the, the message of this campaign. Yeah, look, so, so we have always been the party of the future. Yeah. There are a lot of young people who don't love being patted on the head and told that they're the future because a lot of young people represent the present. The issues that are at stake right now in our country are happening to us right now. We're the generation that's fighting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're the generation that's getting life-saving health care through ACA. We're the generation that's going to have to pick up the pieces if there's nothing left of our climate. It's our lives right now. And we're the generation that can do so much of the organ. Every good and every bad major social change in the world, from the civil rights movement to the Iranian revolution, was driven by young people. And our life experience is a little bit different. Now, I am not saying that put me in as a young person, I'm going to run a party by for 
uh, and of young people. My base, in many ways, when I ran for mayor was senior. But I do think that having a different life experience gave me something different to offer because it's a different life experience. I don't always watch television on a television. I haven't had a landline in my entire adult life. I spent Thanksgiving morning in a deer blind with my boyfriend's father. My generation's just got a different life experience than, than the generations before us. And so I do think if we expect, just like any other constituency in the party, if we expect millennials to show up and vote for us, we can't just reach out to them at the last minute and say, hey, we need you again. You, you ready? Election is coming. We've got to be there day in and day out. And by the way, we also have to be empowering the next generation of organizers in our party. Not everybody can afford an unpaid internship over the summer to cultivate themselves. Let me... Uh and we're a party that does not fund our college Democrats, our young Democrats, or our kind of organizers the way the other party does, and we pay the price every single election. Let me do one more question, Mr. Pekarsky, and then back to Congressman, uh, Ms. Secretary, Secretary Perez, and then we're going to go to D.C. members for the balance of our time. Um, I want to ask about voter suppression, voter election protection, and the bucket of issues. Uh, again, Mr. Pekarsky, this is your area of specialty. Mr. Perez, you're in the Civil Rights Division and Labor uh, Justice Department. You understand this issue as well as anybody. What does the party need to be doing that it is not currently doing? Not just platitudes, but strategies and tactics, if you're the next DNC chair, to deal with voter suppression and voter protection. There's a lot this party can do. I'm going to get back to voter suppression. You asked a good question earlier. You deserve an answer. Well, can you hear me? Really can you, you can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. You asked a good question earlier. You deserve an answer. You're going to get a voter suppression answer in a second. You asked, should we be voting no in the Senate? The issue is not whether we're voting no in the Senate. The issue is whether our senators are conducting withering cross-examinations that put these people in fear of a perjury indictment and doing five years. That's what I mean. Okay. And what do I mean by it? Just a minute. What do I mean by a withering? What do I mean by a withering question? What I mean is a question like the one that cracked Henry Kissinger at the State Department. The day after this question was asked, the Washington Post reported he was in his office 30 minutes later crying. And to understand the question, you've got to understand one thing. There was a guy named David Biden who worked for Richard Nixon. He ran an outfit called the Plumbers. And the question was something like this. Mr. Secretary, you told the Foreign Relations Committee at your confirmation hearings under oath that you didn't know what David you and the Plumbers were doing. Four months later, you told the Senate... Services Committee, under oath, that you listened to a tape of David Young interrogating a Navy admiral. So I wonder, Mr. Secretary, if you could tell us, A, how can you reconcile those statements, B, whether the special prosecutor or any other agency of the government has questioned you about these statements, and C, whether you have retained and consulted counsel in preparation for a perjury indictment. Thirty minutes later, he was crying, and the answer was that he had not retain counsel, he had consulted counsel. And the only reason he didn't retain counsel was because the lawyer he, he consulted was his private lawyer who he had put on the payroll as the State Department's legal counsel. Mr. Pekarsky. Anyway, the please, answer to voter, voter suppression. The, the answer please. to voter suppression. Yes. You can look for the question later on my Great. website. Great. Peter Ford, DNC. In, in terms of voter suppression, we've got to step up to the plate every time this happens. I, I do not think that the, the party has forcefully gone after every person who's tried to institute a voter suppression plan. There was a cross-check plan last year that was run by, started by Chris Kobach, who's the Secretary of State in Kansas. It was implemented, depending on who's doing the counting, uh, 27 states, and they took these lists. They got Michael Smith registered to vote in Kansas, and Michael Smith registered to vote in Illinois. And they said, okay, this has got to be the same person, so we'll knock them off the rolls. But this party was out, not out there in court stopping it. There were some people who went into court and tried to stop it and got some of it, and some didn't. But we've got to be out there seeing what happens and stopping it. There, there, and in terms of election protection, there's a lot more that can be done. There are machines out there now. Okay. We, do you want to know? I'll tell you. We've had... Fine. We've, we've had... We'll Secretary Perez. Well, let me just wrap up with sure, the machines. Sure, please, please. We have reports from the Democratic Secretary of State of California, Deborah Rowan, nine years ago, 
and from the, from the Democratic Secretary of State of the State of Ohio nine years ago, Jennifer Bruner. And both of those reports were generated by experts in computer science, and they, unanimously, they conclusively reported that the machines we're using now are susceptible to being tampered with, either in person or electronically. This part has done approximately nothing to stop the use of those machines. All right. If I am DNC chair, we are going to be doing a lot to stop the use of those machines. Very well. Now, now Secretary Perez, please sure. jump in on this. Sure. Voter suppression, plainly and simply, is one of the greatest threats to our democracy on the way today. And we need to understand, folks, that voter suppression is a staple in the Republican playbook, a staple in the ALEC playbook. It's a staple that was here yesterday, today, and it will be here for years to come unless we put a stop to it. And here's what I've seen. The voter ID, Texas is a full employment act for civil rights lawyers. I know that because we sued them. And when you hear Donald Trump talking about three million people voted, that is bullshit. Plain and simple. Bullshit. And here's the record, folks. We sued Texas because they had a voter ID law designed to make it hard or impossible for African Americans and Latinos to vote. Over a 10-year period, folks, 46 million and change voters voted in Texas. Zero, count them, zero cases of, uh, of non-citizen voting. Zero cases. Two cases of in-person voter fraud. That was the extent of it, folks. It's a non-existent problem. But you know what the challenge is? And your question was about what the DNC is going to do. We have to recognize that we've got to dramatically ramp up our game. We've got very well-meaning and good people doing it. But we've got a few people doing it. We can't go to a knife fight with a spoon, folks. We've got to come with a bazooka. And that's why, if you look at my platform, I've called for the creation of a voter protection unit. Both words matter, folks. Both words matter. Protection. We got to play defense. There are voters who are illegally purged from the rolls. We file those lawsuits too late. We won the battle in North Carolina six days before the election. We lost the war. We get the vote out. We've got to play offense as well. We should be voting by mail in every state. We should take a lead off of Oregon, where they've done that. We should take a page out of the playbook of Arizona, which put in place a redistricting commission, nonpartisan, that helped level the playing field. There's about a dozen states who are red states that can do the same thing through ballot initiative and level the playing field. That's part of the offense that we could play. Right. We should have universal voter registration. When you turn 18 years old, that's what you should be doing. Uh, In Maryland, when you're 17, you can get registered as long as you vote by the time you're 18. We've got to play defense and we've got to play offense. The DNC needs to be part of it in partnership with folks at the state level, in partnership with secretaries of state, in partnership with Democratic attorneys general. See my plan because this is the biggest threat so to our democracy. Speaking of leveling the playing field, I want to let Chair Chairman Harrison in for one last comment on this, and then we're going right to the DNC members, and we'll divide up our time among the remainder of the folks on stage. Mr. Mr. Harrison. Hello. Yeah, this is it. Thank you. Listen, I, I agree with everything that, that Tom just said. I'm just sick and tired of this because we are always doing this hand-wringing when it comes to voter suppression. If anybody knows about voter suppression, live in South Carolina. The voter ID bill wasn't just last year or two years ago. Go to 1950. My grandfather could not vote and always told me, he said, Jamie, never have anyone let you know that you don't matter that your voice does not matter, that your vote does not matter. Democrats have to stop being reactive and start being proactive when it comes to voting rights. 
Why in the world, when we had the White House, we had the majority in the House, and we had 60 votes in the United States Senate, we did not enact any pro-voter legislation. We don't talk about attorney generals, and we don't talk about secretary of state until two months before the vote takes place. Oh, we got to do something different. We got states in which we control the, the legislature and the, governor's, and the governor's mansion. Why don't we use those states as laboratories so we, when we do get power back, then we got something that we can put up on the floor the first day. That's not, we have to prioritize this. People need to feel like their vote is something that, that, that will always be there for them. And they don't feel that right now. As I always said, you guys have heard me say this a number of times. We talk a lot in this party, but we don't show people that we're fighting for them and we're fighting for their rights. If we want to show people, if, if we want people to believe in the system, let's put up some legislation right now in the states that we do control to show that we can move forward and be progressive in terms of protecting voting rights. We have to do that, my friends. Okay, we're going to go to DNC members for the balance of our time. Representative Maxey has been very patient. Your question, sir. Uh, to, to follow up on the voter suppression conversation that just happened, uh, we're sitting in Texas now with a rejection case in the federal court waiting for decision. Voter, uh, yeah, the voter ID uh, waiting for final decisions. Uh, I'm the legislative president on condition of the Voting Rights Act bills. Filed in our legislature today, uh, uh, you know, half a dozen of them possibly could pass within the next five months. Uh, we depend on allied groups, you know, MALDEF or Texas Civil Rights Project or just do good or attorneys to take they pass. Is there a role for our party to have an in house litigation team to do this systematically, especially in these smaller red states where there's not the kinds of uh, support to do that. Let me ask litigation. Congressman Allison to take that one and then Ms. Green, please. Absolutely, there's a critical role for the DNC to have in-house litigation team. But let me just tell you what we, how I think we should approach this. The DNC should organize democratic and legal workers all over the country so that we are able to fight on all fronts. There's so much voter suppression going on. Uh, you know, as South Dakota, Native American tribe, you know, the, the voting uh, polls are, are miles away from the reservation. And, you know, uh, Red Lake, Minnesota, uh, people harassing voters uh, at the polls. These things are happening all over, the, all over the country. And so we need to get literally thousands and thousands of people. And it cannot just be when voting violations come up. We need armies of uh, Democrats organized to be engaging election officials a year before the election to say, show us the ballots, how many machines, where are going to be, and we need to be having those fights way beforehand. And then, of course, as Jamie said, we've got to be pushing pro-voter legislation all the time, and we need people who can organize that. And, of course, we need to be able uh, to understand that it is, in fact, a strategic goal of the Republicans to suppress the vote. Have you ever heard of a guy named Paul Weyrich? He's a movement Republican. He said in 1980, you conservatives better stop talking about getting people to vote. In fact, our chances for electoral success go up as the size of the electorate goes down. They know voter suppression helps them. We have yet to put a systematic voter expansion program in place for us, which is what we absolutely have to do. Litigation's a part. But we need to, this is an organizing challenge to people, and we need to be engaged in these election systems 24 uh, hours a day, 365 days a year. And last point I want to make, we are down to eight secretaries of state Democrat. We have eight. We have got to get serious about electing secretaries of state and attorneys general. This is a down ballot challenge, and it's why we have got to have a DNC that elects people up and down the Thank you. M Ms. Green, is this a problem that's best served in the states, or is it a problem that is served, best served in the states at the direction and with the help of the DNC? This is a problem that has to be addressed on all fronts. 
And I want to pull back a little bit from the specific question and look at how we innovate our voter opportunities to participate in this party. And when I was at Rock the Vote, we decided we were going to embrace online voter registration. And this is one of the things that I think the Democratic Party, the DNC, and state parties really need to understand. When we, as an outside organization, said we needed help, we wanted to bring forth online voter registration, Democrats actually rolled their eyes and said, no, we don't want to look at this opportunity. And guess what? That year, we registered 1.4 million people to vote. 75% of them turned out to vote. And those young people, they were progressive, and they voted for John Kerry. So when there are opportunities for these ideas to come into our party at the national level, at the state party level, I certainly agree that there is a culture problem at the DNC, but the, the main problem is not about culture. It is about our systems. It is about how we as a party allow new ideas to grow, how we allow new ideas to be experimented. And so that's why everyone up here will say, it's all about a 50-state strategy. Well, you know what? Okay, you get $50,000, you get $50,000, you get $25,000. Everyone gets money. But what exactly is that money going towards? As DNC chair, I want to invest in state parties and give each state $100,000 as a state party innovation fund where the best and the brightest entrepreneurial minds across this country can come into a state party, their ideas can be welcomed, they can learn the concept of how you disrupt our usual tactics and systems, they learn the concepts of experimentation, they can learn to fail up. But if we as a party sit here and pretend that that energy and that passion that we saw in all of those marches, that when they come knocking on our door, and whether that door is at a state party or it's the Democratic National Committee, and we do not reimagine and restructure our systems, our transparency, our processes, our meetings, that they aren't going to want to give their expertise. They're going to get a door slammed in the face. And this is the type of conversation we need to be having about the DNC chair. How do we restructure our party to be more welcoming? So yes, there are many lawyers who want to be working with us on this issue of voter suppression. Yes, we need to have an opportunity for them at the state party, and we need to be making sure that at the national level this is happening. But as Democrats, if we start to ask ourselves some really tough questions about when young people or people with expertise that we so greatly need come into our party, are we welcoming them about our transparency? And I know I hear this from DNC members. We need a budget that is transparent, not just to DNC members, but to the public and to the press to show that it reflects our values. This moment that we have right now that is unprecedented, we are going about this as business as usual. We are having conversations about values that every single person up on this stage we all have the same values, but what are you going to do to change this party and be welcoming? That is what we should be talking about. And it's a hard conversation, y'all, but we have to rise to this occasion. So whether it is at the state party level or the national party level, yes, those resources are important. The, the head of the Democratic Party should not be at the mercy of any wealthy donors. So what we should be asked is the candidates up here, what are you going to do yes. specifically? So right now, 60% of the resources that come into the DNC are from wealthy donors. I want to know what my fellow candidates, how we're going to address that. As a candidate and as chair, I would say I would make it a goal and a mission that 70% of the resources into the DNC come from low-dollar donors. But we can't close our door. And so it's fine if those 30% go there. And it's fine if they say, I want money to go to turning Texas blue. Let's get Texas it. donors, this is the last thing I will say, Texas yes. donors, you should be able to direct your funds to Texas. So we need to be able to have restricted grants going to our states. The donors can say, I'm going to give you a million dollars and you're going to spend that in Texas, in Arizona, in Georgia. The okay. only way we get there is if we change our system, we reimagine our processes, we ask ourselves tough questions, and as DNC members, 
Democrats and as big D Democrats, as little D Democrats, Let's we start to reimagine how we operate as a party. Another question in quickly from the D members. Sir, yes. Yes, as the incoming uh, Democratic National Committee chair, uh, how would you make the um, Democratic National Committee more accessible to rank and file Democrats? Mayor, why don't you take that one? Uh, did you get a welcome packet when you were named to the DNC? Uh, you're brand new on the D. Did you get a welcome packet? Did you get assigned to a mentor who would uh, kind of be, be responsible for guiding you through the DNC process? Uh, have you attended an orientation for new members of the DNC? Oh, yeah. we got some work to do. There, <laughs> there is a sense among a lot of the DNC members that I've reached out to that, um, that the engagement could be more, that, that the message from the mothership is, wh when we need your opinion, we'll give it to you. And one of the things that's so important uh, about this moment uh, is that there's a chance for DNC members to exercise the governance uh, that, that is in your hands. 447 people who represent the board of directors uh, of this organization that we're part of. And so we've got to make sure that we have the right structures, the right practices, and the right culture. The word culture keeps coming up, right? To make sure that, that you were included. Uh, I'm very comfortable with transparency and accountability because when you're a public official, especially uh, a, a mayor, uh, you, this is your bread and butter. You, my, my email can be uh, requested uh, through a freedom of information process. And so uh, we're, we're used to people being able to see what we have to say. My, uh, uh, our budget, a $300 million budget, down to the penny, is available online. It's it's public record. And also we're the first city in Indiana to put not just the budget but our tech checkbook online so people could see how we're spending the funds. Uh, we've got to make sure, as, as has been said before, that uh, these kinds of decisions are, are something that members can participate in because you are, and this is in my military hand, one of the best forward deployed resources we have, right? Every single one of our 57 states and territories. We've got motivated, energized, capable Democrats in our DNC members. I believe if we included you more in the process, we could also turn around and ask more of you on behalf of the party. Well, let me ask, let me ask Ms. Brown on that point. Is there more that the party should be asking of members? And from your perspective as a state chair, is there more that the national party should be doing for folks like you? Absolutely. When I talk about giving the power back to the people, I'm seriously talking about reimagining every single process that we have in our party. For instance, how many people went to national convention? Do we have delegates in the room? Some delegates? So national convention is like a dog and pony show where they try out all of these really great inspirational speakers. And there's time for that. That's important. But there's some real work that we can actually do at convention. Not just training people, but actually having tough conversations. In my blueprint, I outline about 10 critical conversations that we need to be having. Suppression is one of those. Imagining what a political party looks like in the 20th century is one of those. Campaign finance reform is one of those. We need to put the people of our party to work solving the problems of our country. The economic issues that we're facing right now is another one of those. And we have genius, brilliant people in our party that are living life experience that we're totally not uh, impacting uh, or bringing up into our conversation in any way, shape, or form. And so we really need to create a new way of doing business meetings. One of the questions that I wish members would ask, uh, and so I'll answer it because I've been waiting, is as a DNC chair, can you explain what an actual DNC meeting is going to look like? Yeah. Because what we know is that DNC members come to meetings and they want to work, and we give them no work to do. Again, it's a dog and pony show. We need to have DNC meetings where we actually are putting groups together with critical conversations and getting your ideas on how we solve the problems of the party, and then the leaders can go to work figuring out how to implement your ideas. Okay, thank you. So very quickly, one more DNC question. We're going to get a very quick answer, and then I'm told we have to go to closing. We have some people who have to catch planes, and we've got to respect the end time of this event. Sir. Yes, Mr. Durrani, Texas. Uh, notwithstanding that we are going to have a Super Bowl here next weekend, I don't expect anyone is that the next chair will be a superman or a superwoman. But we expect them to put their heart and soul into this job. However, what we want them to do really is put their time. So my question is, are those folks here who have got other gigs, like mayor and uh, state party chairs, if you get elected as chair, are you going to give up what you were doing before and solely focus your time on being the chair of the Democratic National Committee? Uh, I guess, Congressman Ellison, this came up with you. 
did not, were you willing to step down as member of Congress and serve full time as party chair? Well, well, let me just say, I, I do love being in Congress, but I will give it up to be the chair of the Democratic National Committee. And the reason is, in my opinion, we are in an emergency situation. We've lost over 954 seats. We've lost thousands, um, you know, thousands of Democrats elected. And when Democrats are not in office, bad things happen to good people. So, yeah, I will leave the Congress to do this job because it's just that important to me. It's a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Let me go quickly because it's your plane I'm actually most focused on. Mr. Mr. Mayor, are you out if you become party chair? Yeah, yes yeah. or no? Yes. Yes? The party chairs sure. in the state. Are you all out? Is anybody not out? Uh, I, will, gets it? Uh, I will step down as secretary. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, Tal. That's a pretty funny answer. All right. So we're going to go now to closing statements. Again, in the interest of time, we could spend a lot more time doing this. We're going to start with Mr. Harrison, who drew the lot to go further. We're going to put up the one-minute clock here up on the, on the podium. And we're going to ask that you please, as best you can, I cannot literally make you stop but I'm going to hope that you will try to respect the one minute. Mr. Harrison, one minute close. I want to thank all of you for being here. I also want to say a shout out to the, the 48 Auburn Fellows that are in South Carolina right now. It's a fellowship that I started to train the next generation of leaders in the state. And they're joining the 32 that graduated in September of last year. Because a lot of people talk about building the bench. Well, we've been building the bench in South Carolina. So I want to uh, shout out to them. I'm going to leave you guys with a poem. Given that today was Holocaust Memorial Day, let me leave you with a poem. It's called First They Came. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And finally, they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Dr. Martin Luther King said in his letter from Birmingham jail that we're going to have to repent in this generation not merely for the actions and words of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. It is time for us to stand up in this party. It is time for us to have a chair who understands what it is to live in working class America. I can be that chair. I will be the fighter, the builder, and the visionary that we need. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Mr. Buckley, one minute. Listen, our party is in an unprecedented crisis. We need to have the very best at the top of our party. Uh, the DNC meeting on February 25th is not going to be my first meeting, and nor should I believe, I don't believe it should be the first meeting of the next chair. You know, a lot, we've talked a lot, but two and a half months ago I released an action plan that you can read at rayfordnc.com, R-A-Y-F-O-R-D-N-C.com. It goes into great detail about a lot of stuff that we talked about here. You know, <clears throat> this is about getting things done. You know, the very first thing I would do is ask all of these people to go backstage with me with the new officers and say, guess what? You're all deputized. We're all part of our team. We are all going to work together. So I've even agreed, if the DNC agrees to uh, bifurcate the chairs so there's two show chairs, I'll do that. I will do whatever it takes to rebuild this party because I think that's what it's going to take. It is a huge, huge job. Now look, at, I've got the record. You know, I've taken a, a state where Republicans won as of a course. You know, 11 out of 13 statewide races, folks. That's because we built a grassroots where it was neighbor to neighbor talking to people. Okay. And it was about ideals and messages. We did it in a swing state. I'll do it with the DNC. I ask for your support. RayfordDNC.com. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. Congressman, one minute, sir. You know, friends, yesterday I was at Miami Day talking to folks, and I went to a rally where young people were assembled to demand that the mayor there protect people uh, from the ICE uh, agents who uh, would, would come and really try to turn their municipal police into agents of ICE. as because uh, President Trump has said that he wanted to punish cities because they were sanctuary cities and given aid and comfort to the people. And it was very clear to me at that moment and many moments before that unless Democrats get elected, we are going to see real pain and suffering for our friends, our neighbors, and people we care about. 
I have gotten Democrats elected. There are no statewide Democrats in Minnesota. I have had, I've taken my congressional district from the lowest turnout district to the highest. We can scale this all over the country. We've got to turn out the vote, and I can turn out that vote, and I hope to be your DNC chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. <laughs> Ms. Green, one minute. There was a question about how to engage rank-and-file DNC, rank-and-file Democrats. So I'm going to address my answer to rank-and-file Democrats, sure. to the DNC. For two we have been mired in an old school system. We have a unique opportunity to assess our strengths and weaknesses as a democratic family and innovate how we organize, how we communicate, and how we connect with voters. We have a unique opportunity to experiment with strategies and technology. We have a unique opportunity to actually listen to the chorus of Americans who have been disenfranchised and given up on politics and an even larger chorus who is looking and yearning and marching for this party, this party to be their home of resistance against Donald Trump. We have this unique opportunity now. So enough with the Hillary versus Bernie rehashing and second guessing. Enough with the platitudes and promises about voter contact and grassroots organizations. Enough with the fact that the DNC is a national organization when it should be a local and state and community organization. Time, enough with all of that. What we need to do is to think bigger. Act bolder and ask some very tough questions. Time, please. Ask some very tough questions so we can live up to this moment. Mr. Tolliver, one minute, sir. You know, DNC voters have a very tough job when they get to Atlanta uh, next month. Democracy tests ideas, vision, strategies, and plans. So I would encourage each DNC voter to look at my ideas, look at my strategy, look at my plan for moving the DNC forward on day one, compare my plan to my opponent's plan, and give the best and the brightest ideas. You have to feel in your gut when you're voting for the DNC chair. You have to feel that this is the right person, this is the person who is going to do the work. Now, a number of my candidates have been endorsed, heavily endorsed by some of the top Democratic leaders in the country, but one thing we know about endorsement, endorsements do not do the work. The individual does the work. So you have to, you have to vote for the person who you believe will do the work. And I hope you will vote for Vincent Tolliver. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, a minute. You. Somewhere along the line, it became fashionable to complain that we don't have a very good bench, a fantastic bench. Ephraim Fowler, who's our city clerk in South Bend, first African American to have that job. Ask Miguel Solis, my friend who's the Dallas School Board president. He's younger than I am. We have a great bench, but we've got to call the people off the bench and onto the court. <laughs> Look, every one of us has said substantially the same thing about the direction of the party. And I know some, some people in the media are complaining that that's boring for them. I think it shows unity for us. It shows that our heart is taking us. 95% the same place. The only distinction among us competitors, not opponents, competitors, is who's best positioned to do it. And my pitch is if we want to engage the next generation, pick the millennium. If we want to engage red and purple states in a 50 state strategy, pick the guy who's been running and winning in Mike Pence's Indiana. If we want to go at every level, put in the map. If we want to have a state come up strategy, go with somebody who doesn't go to work in D.C. If we want to engage in the grassroots, Go with somebody who's out there marching in spirit and time body. Please, we want to turn our party around to somebody to turn the city around. I would be proud for this opportunity. It's never been more important to be a Democrat. Time. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, one minute, sir. I have found myself thinking about this five-year-old boy, Omar Daknish. You may have seen the picture of him in Aleppo in the aftermath of a, a bombing. There should always be room in this country for the Omar Daknishes of the world. And the assault on our values has begun. The Democratic Party has to be part of the resistance. We have a crisis of confidence right now in the Democratic Party, a crisis of relevance. And we need a leader at the DNC who can execute a turnaround strategy at scale. And the best indicator of future performance is past performance. I've led a $45 billion agency that was not firing on all cylinders, and we turned it around. Before that, the Civil Rights Division. 
before that working in local government, before that working in state government, before that organizing, organizing, organizing. That's what we need, a turnaround artist at scale, someone who understands culture change, someone who understands how to take the fight to Donald Trump, how to bring our big tent together, how to make sure that we are Time all firing on all cylinders. That is why I'm running for the DNC, so that we can take that fight. Thank, Thank you. you, Secretary. Mr. Ronan, one minute, please. I'll do my best. So we have a lot of talent up here. And the one thing we haven't been discussing is how do you in the room get to affect us here at the table? Many of you may or may not know that it's only DNC members that get to vote. So why has that not been discussed yet? If we're going to change this party and make it for the people, should we or should we not make it for the people? I know I might be shooting my foot, and I'm not trying to. I'm trying to reach out to you and encourage you to think about that future. We are the future. He's the future. All of us here in this room need a voice, and we need the ability to succeed. And I want to point out one more thing. We talked about protesting as being the one thing left for us to fight with. That's not true. We have an army of lawyers. We have people like him who knows exactly what needs to be done. But we're not utilizing those resources. We could be shoving lawyers down the throats of the DNC and Republican states day in and day out, but we choose not to. As DNC chair, I would fight tooth and nail at every single level that we can do, and I'd be encouraging people to step up and, please and take the places of the people here. Thank you, Mr. Rona. Mr. Pekarski, one minute for your close. My name is Peter Pekarski. I'm running for chair of the DNC. Uh, my website is PEC4DNC. PEC, the number for DNC. I'm running because I believe I can raise the money, allocate the resources to help this party uh, successfully do what it has always been trying to do, and that is to create a good and better opportunity for all Americans to live with full rights under our Constitution. Uh, when I'm head of the DNC, there's going to be a full-time election protection program, which will help out uh, the states. Um, take a look at the website, please. There's a plan there. Um, in terms of the millennials, I guess I can't elect me. I'm a, a millennial, but I can. I, but I can tell you that I got a letter from 26 uh, members of Congress who set up the Future Forum, which we're at today. I thank them and. Congresswoman Pelosi for setting it up. Um, you sent me a uh, letter three days ago. The answer is on my website. You're going to get it normally next week. I think we have to Time, please. Uh, move this party forward. Please call your senators and put the heat on them to put the heat on Donald Trump's nominees. Time, please. Thank you. Finally, Ms. Brown. Y'all, we've talked about a lot of uh, work that we have to get done. We are at a place where we have never been before party with the amount of work that we need to get done. And this race is not about any one of us. This race is really not about the leader of our party and who should be the leader. What this race is about is you all. And that you, as the people of our party, you need a leader who has a proven track record of putting people to work and making sure that everybody has a voice and putting processes and procedures in place that actually allow us to pull from your expertise and your passion and your wisdom. And that's what I have a track record of doing. I am a servant leader. I do not believe it's about my ideas and me. I believe it's about you. And so everything that I've put into my blueprint is reimagining how, as a party, we reshape our power structure. The entrenched powers that be in our party are really strong. And it is going to take all of the people being empowered to say, enough is enough. It's about us. It's not about what DC wants. It's not about what the Detroit wants. It's about what you want. And so I encourage you to look at my blueprint, look at the ideas that I'm throwing out, and Time vote for me. Well, let's give all 10 candidates for chair a big hand. Thank them very much for being here. Thank you for being here. I'm being told to wish you all well, and thank you so much for spending time with us today. And the DNC member bus is in lot C. Thank you very much.